Hey guys, good morning and welcome back again to your Unacademy Nate English channel. I hope all of you are doing amazing, all of you are doing great. So my dear students, quickly let me know in the chats if all of you can hear me, if I am perfectly audible and visible to every one of you. Let me know in the chats quickly. <coughs> Let me know in the chats quickly. Quickly, people, quickly, quickly, quickly. Give me some green signal in the chat so that I'll get to know I'm perfectly audible and visible to every one of you. Perfect, 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 perfect. All right, people. So, as you all must be knowing, today it's going to be a mega marathon. It is going to be the mega marathon of your class 12th physical chemistry. A lot of students must be thinking whether I'll be starting from the basics or it is just going to be a quick revision. Let me tell you, my dear students, I'll be touching each and every concept from the basics itself. So if you have not studied, if you have not studied these chapters, if you have not studied your class 12 physical chemistry yet, there is no need to worry. I'll be exactly starting from the basics. Okay. And I'm pretty much sure that you guys are ready with your pen and paper because I want you guys to take a note of every single thing. Whatever I'll be writing on the screen, whatever questions I'll be doing today, I want you guys to take a note of every single thing. Point number one. Point number two, let me quickly show you the schedule, my dear students, like what exactly we are going to do in the coming week. Okay, let's have a look on the schedule first of all. <coughs> Just give me a second. Let's have a look on the schedule. Like what all sessions are planned for this particular week. As I've told you already, your whole syllabus I'll be covering in 14 sessions. Okay, of your physics, chemistry as well as biology, right? So today we have got complete class 12 physical chemistry. Tomorrow, tomorrow's session is equally important, my dear students. Tomorrow's session is equally important. Tomorrow we are going to do some extra 500 questions, some extra 500 questions of class 12 chemistry. I mean, 12, class 12 physical chemistry. Then on 23rd, it's going to be complete physics part one of class 12 which includes your electrostatics, it includes your capacitors, it includes your current EMI AC, magnetism, etc, etc, right? So, class 12th part 1 is scheduled on 23rd. On 24th, it's going to be top 500 questions of physics, right? Of your class 12th physics, I must say. And similarly, the zoology, uh, the organic chemistry, etc, etc. This is the schedule of the upcoming week. This is the schedule till 30th of March. What about the week 2? Week 2 schedule will be shared once we will be done with these particular sessions over here. And all these sessions, these are mega marathons, my dear students. All these sessions will be there for like 10 to 12 hours for sure. Because every single thing is going to be discussed in detail. So all your friends who are preparing for NEET 2024, this session is for everyone. So you can share this particular video with everyone so that everyone gets benefited out of these sessions. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> So should we start the session already? All ready people? Just give me a second and we shall be started. Just give me a second and we shall be starting. Okay, you must be thinking about the notes. Handwritten PDFs, right? I'll be providing the handwritten PDFs as well. You need not to worry about that. I'll be sharing the handwritten PDFs with you guys as well. Okay? Well, uh, let me give you some Telegram IDs on which you will be getting the handwritten PDFs. So, my dear students, uh, let me quickly give you the telegrams. Uh, there are two telegrams on which I'll be sharing the PDFs. One is going to be t.me 
slash an academy need english this is the official telegram of this particular channel you guys can join in you guys can join in afterwards on this particular telegram channel i'll be sharing all the handwritten pdfs like all the educators will be sharing their handwritten pdfs and notes in this particular telegram right it is an academy neat english perfect you can join in my telegram to t.me slash w a s s i n s i r c h e m that is one more telegram on which i shall be sharing the handwritten pdfs okay i believe everyone has joined so let's get going so let me know in the chats first of all which chapter do you want to start with first of all which chapter do you want to start with i'm asking this to you which chapter do you want to start with <clears throat> and majority wins here <clears throat> first of all we shall be covering the whole physical chemistry of class 12 right so every chapter will be discussed but i'm just asking you which chapter do you want to start with Quick, 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 everyone. <clears throat> Solid state is not in there in the syllabus now. Solid state is not in the syllabus anymore. You should know it by now. it is deleted from the need syllabus solid state so do not write the solid state in the chats do not write solid state in the chats <clears throat> well i'm just kidding i'm just asking you this question just to make you happy otherwise i've already decided which chapter i'll be starting with yeah i've already decided which chapter i'll be starting with i'll be starting with the chapter chemical kinetics okay i will be starting with the chapter chemical kinetics and before starting this particular session please and please the ones who have not liked this particular session i would want all of you to like this session share this particular video with everyone and at the same time if you are not subscribed to this particular channel do subscribe right now do subscribe right now right now means right now because amazing sessions are planned for all of you for the upcoming 40 to 45 days okay someone is writing moi moi yes it's it's moi moi for you and one more question are you ready to be with me till the end just ask this question to yourself first of all are you guys ready to be with me till the end i will be definitely giving you the breaks as well right after every 3 hours i'll be giving you 15 to 20 minutes breaks so that you can refresh yourselves are you ready to be with me till the end i just want that one word in the chats <clears throat> perfect guys perfect 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 let's get going then let's get started with the chapter chemical kinetics as i told you i will be exactly starting from the basics i will be exactly starting from the basics <clears throat> chemical kinetics my dear students first of all let me give you the brief idea of what all things are there in the chapter what all things are there in the chemical kinetics chapter from which questions will be asked first of all in chemical kinetics we have to deal with three things particularly three things we have to deal with the rates of the reactions we have to deal with the rates of the reactions number 1 we shall be discussing about the factors which affect the rate of the reaction number 2 and number 3 we shall be discussing the mechanisms involved mechanisms involved in the chemical reaction so chemical kinetics chapter is classified basically into these three types if you want to define chemical kinetics i would say it is that branch of chemistry which deals with the study of rates of the reactions factors affecting the rates of the reactions and at the same time mechanisms involved in the chemical reaction okay perfect so let's get directly into the business and let's start 
द फर्स्ट टॉपिक अब लुक पीपल बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द एक्चुअल टॉपिक देर आर फ्यू बेसिक थिंग्स विच आई वुड वॉन्ट टू क्लियर विद यू माइडियर स्टूडेंट्स इमेजिन दैट यू हैव गॉट अ रिएक्शन इन विच रिएक्टेंट्स आर गेटिंग कन्वर्टेड इन टू प्रोडक्ट्स लेट्स अज्यूम आई हैव गॉट अ रिएक्शन इन विच रिएक्टेंट्स आर गेटिंग कन्वर्टेड इन टू प्रोडक्ट्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम अज्यूमिंग दैट आई एम अज्यूमिंग दैट दिस पर्टिकुलर रिएक्शन इट इज कैरीड आउट इन अ कंटेनर दिस पर्टिकुलर रिएक्शन इज कैरीड आउट इन अ वेसल उस वॉल्यूम इज फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी लीटर्स उस वॉल्यूम इज फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी लीटर्स सो वॉट इज वी ओवर हेयर इट इज नथिंग बट इट इज द वॉल्यूम ऑफ द रिएक्शन वेसल इट इज द वॉल्यूम ऑफ द रिएक्शन वेसल नंबर वन नंबर टू वाइट यू स्टूडेंट एज यू ऑल मस्ट बी नोइंग एज यू ऑल मस्ट बी नोइंग when the reaction starts when reactants start getting converted into products what happens to the number of moles of reactants when the reaction starts i would say number of moles of reactants they keep on decreasing with time similarly number of moles of products they keep on increasing with time as the reaction proceeds as the reaction starts as the reactants start getting converted into products i would say moles of reactants they keep on decreasing with time and moles of products they keep on increasing with time number 1 number 2 if i define a term concentration how do you define the term concentration which is represented by square brackets concentration is nothing but number of moles divided by volume in liters for example if you are defining the concentration of a reactant it means number of moles of reactant divided by volume of the system in liters for example if i you are defining the concentration of product it means number of moles of product divided by volume of system in liters perfect now my dear students you already know when the reaction proceeds when the reaction starts number of moles of reactants they keep on decreasing with time and if number of moles of reactant keeps on decreasing with time can i say concentration of reactant also keeps on decreasing with time as simple as that similarly as you can see number of moles of products they keep so they keep on increasing with time if moles of product increase with time that means your concentration of product also increases with time so this is one more statement as the reaction proceeds as the reaction proceeds concentration of reactant decreases and concentration of product it increases one more important statement number 3 imagine that your reactant and product they are in gaseous phase imagine that your reactant as well as product they are in gaseous phase as the reaction proceeds number of moles of reactants decrease with time and number of moles of products increase with time now you tell me if moles of reactants are decreasing with time pressure due to reactant what will happen to that if moles of reactant are decreasing with time that means pressure due to reactant pressure due to reactant it also decreases with time similarly if moles of products are increasing with time i will say pressure due to product it increases with time these are the three important things which you must know before starting this particular chapter and let me quickly summarize these three things let me quickly summarize these three things i'll say as the reaction proceeds <clears throat> as the reaction proceeds number of moles concentration pressure of reactants of reactants what happens to it it decreases with time and number of moles concentration pressure of products of products it increases with time this is something very important without this particular statement you cannot understand the chapter chemical kinetics and i believe this particular statement is clear to everyone if yes let me know once in the chats quick let me know once in the chats quickly if this is clear to everyone let me know once in the chats quickly if this is clear to everyone I want every one of you to say it quickly, people. 
quickly. Everyone in the chats. My eyes are at the chats. Perfect. Perfect, guys. Now, my dear students, if I plot the same thing graphically, if I show you the same thing graphically, how exactly you guys are going to represent these things graphically. Over here, I'm plotting moles versus time, or I'm plotting concentration versus time, or I'm plotting pressure versus time. So these are three, three curves basically. These are three curves, these are three graphs which I'm representing on the, on the same one. It is either moles versus time, concentration versus time, pressure versus time. If I want to draw the graph for reactance, how the graph will look like? Just tell me that. If you want to plot the graph for reactance, how the graph will look like? You know, moles of reactant, concentration of reactant, pressure of reactant, it decreases with time. So all the three graphs will be like this. All the three graphs will be like this. With time, moles of reactant decreases, concentration of reactant decreases, as well as pressure of reactant decreases. I believe this is clear. Similarly, if you want to plot the graph, for the products, if you want to plot a graph for the products, if you want to plot the graph for the products, which is either going to be moles versus time, or concentration versus time, or pressure versus time. You know it already, as the reaction proceeds, moles concentration as well as pressure of products, it increases with time. So this is how the graph will look like. I believe these two graphs are absolutely clear to every one of you. This is valid for the reactant. This is valid for the product. Whenever you see this sort of a graph in which concentration decreases with time, understand that graph is for reactant. When you see this sort of a graph in which concentration increases with time, understand that graph is valid for the product. I believe this is clear to every one of you. Okay. Now, my dear students, <coughs> We are fit enough. We are fit enough to start our first topic that is average rate of reaction. We are fit enough to start the first topic that is what you call as average rate of reaction. First of all, how do you exactly define? How do you exactly define the average rate of reaction? Average rate of reaction. Let's first of all read the definition, then I'll make you understand what it means. Average rate of reaction is nothing but change in the concentration, change in the concentration of either reactant or product, change in the concentration of either reactant or product in a given interval of time, in a given interval of time, what it means, what it means. Before showing you the meaning, I would want you guys to take a note of this particular statement as well. Average rate of reaction, this particular statement, I would want you guys to take a note of, right? Now let's try to understand what this average rate of reaction is all about. <laughs> See guys, for example, I've got the reaction in which, let's say I've got the reaction in which your reactant has to get converted into product. This is a general reaction which I'm taking. For example, at time T1, at time T1, let's assume Concentration of reactant over here is C1. Concentration of product over here is T2. For example, at time T1, the concentration of reactant, let's say, is C1. Concentration of product is C2. Now, you know, as the reaction proceeds, concentration of reactant will keep on decreasing. Concentration of product will keep on increasing. Let's assume, my dear students, at time T2, the concentration of reactant is C3. Concentration of product is C4. Right? Now, I want you guys to use your brain a bit. Tell me one thing. <laughs> Tell me one thing. If I want to compare C1 and C3, if I want to compare C1 and C3, can I say C3 will be less than C1? Absolutely. Because concentration of reactant decreases with time. Similarly, if I need to compare C2 and C4, I'll say C4 will be greater than C2. Right? C4 will be greater than C2. Because you know, because you know, because you know concentration of product increases with time. Perfect. Concentration of product increases with time. Now my dear students, look at this particular time interval. From T1 to T2. If you talk about this time interval, it is basically, 
this time interval I'm representing with delta t. Perfect. This time interval I'm representing with delta t. So in this particular time interval, is the concentration of reactant changing? Absolutely, concentration of reactant is changing from C1 to C3. Concentration of product also is changing from C2 to C4. My dear students, if I need to define average rate of reaction in this time interval, how exactly I'm going to define it? Have a look. If I want to define the average rate of reaction, if I want to define the average rate of reaction, in which time interval? In this time interval, delta T. It is defined either, it is defined either in terms of reactants or in terms of products. Average rate of reaction in time interval delta T can be expressed either in terms of reactants or in terms of products. How exactly? How exactly? My dear students, if I'm defining average rate of reaction in terms of reactants, I will say it's going to be change in the concentration of a reactant, change in the concentration of reactant divided by time interval, divided by time interval. Similarly, if I want to define the average rate of reaction in terms of products, it is going to be change in the concentration of product divided by time interval, absolutely divided by time interval. Now people, if you give it a thought, if you give it a thought, Change in the concentration of reactants in time interval delta T. The concentration of reactant is changing from C1 to C3. So, change in the concentration of reactant will be final concentration of reactant minus initial concentration of reactant divided by time interval. That is T2 minus T1. Change in the concentration of product. Well, the concentration of product is changing from C2 to C4. So, it is final minus initial divided by time interval. Right? Well, my dear students, you already know, you already know, C3 is less than C1. If C3 is less than C1, if C3 is less than C1, the sign over here will come as negative, right? And you know, C4 is greater than C2. If C4 is greater than C2, C4 minus C2 will come out to be positive. But if I ask you, can a rate ever be negative? What is rate? Speed. Have you ever seen speed negative? Have you ever seen speed negative? Have you ever seen rate negative? Rate cannot be negative. But when you are calculating rate with respect to reactant, it is coming out to be negative, which is not possible. Which is not possible. Rate cannot be negative. So can I say, can I say, I will have to start with minus sign. Why with the minus sign? Then only this minus and this minus will become positive at the end. Right? Then only it comes positive. Then only it comes positive. So whenever you calculate average rate of reaction with respect to reactants, you'll be always starting with a minus sign. Minus change in the concentration of reactant divided by time interval. Similarly, similarly, whenever you want to calculate the average rate of reaction with respect to products, you'll be starting with the positive sign always. You'll be starting with the positive sign always because already it's positive. Right? Now, if you are asking me, sir, what is the significance of this negative and this positive? Let me tell you, my dear students, this negative sign signifies, this negative sign signifies that the concentration of reactant, it decreases with the time. And this positive sign signifies that the concentration of products, it increases with time. I believe this is clear to everyone. So in short, average rate of reaction is nothing. It is change in the concentration of either reactant or product divided by time interval. Whenever you are calculating the average rate of reaction with respect to reactant, you'll be starting with a minus sign. Whenever you'll be calculating average rate of reaction with respect to product, you'll be starting with a positive sign. Right? I believe this is clear to everyone. I believe this is clear to everyone. I believe this is clear to everyone. Okay, perfect. And over here, I'm defining rate only right now in terms of concentration. Afterwards, you will see rate can be expressed in terms of pressure as well, right? All the other things. I hope this is clear to everyone. Now, my dear students, <coughs> there is something which you call as the instantaneous rate of reaction. There is something which you call as instantaneous rate of reaction. And your instantaneous rate of reaction, we represent with RINS. Simple. Okay. Now, it's very simple. Try to understand. I believe in physics, you would have 
studied average velocity and instantaneous velocity. You can take the same approach here. My dear students in physics, what do you call this term as? Delta x divided by delta t. Delta x divided by delta t. What do you call this as? You call this as average velocity. You call this as average velocity. And when you will have to convert average velocity into instantaneous, what do we do? We use limit. Limit delta t approach towards zero. That means we are reducing the time interval. We are reducing the time interval to zero. We are making the time interval very, very, very small. And this particular term, now you represent in physics with dx by dt. And this is something which you call as instantaneous velocity. This is something which you call as instantaneous velocity. And my dear students, in the similar way, you can convert average rate of reaction into instantaneous. You can do that. How exactly? Have a look. How do you represent the average rate of reaction? Change in the concentration of either reactant or product divided by time interval. This is your average rate of reaction. Use the limit. Limit delta t approaching towards zero. Limit your time interval is approaching towards zero. Time interval approaching towards zero. That means, that means you are calculating the rate of reaction in a very, very, very small time interval. Right? Perfect. And this is something, this is something which you represent like this. DC upon, DC upon DT. DC upon DT. And this DC upon DT, if you look at this particular term, what it represents, dy by dx, what does that represent? That represents slope of the tangent. Similarly, dc upon dt, what does it represent? I would say it represents slope of tangent, slope of tangent at a point, slope of tangent at a point on concentration versus time curve. This is one more statement which I want every one of you to remember. This is one more statement which I want every one of you to remember. I believe this again clear to you. Perfect. I believe this again clear to you. Now my dear students try to understand one thing. Imagine I am plotting a graph. Let's say the graph is between concentration versus time. For example, the graph is like this. If the graph is like this, that means this graph is for product. This graph is for product. Perfect. So, I am asking you, take a very small time interval, take a very small time interval from here to here, take a very small time interval and at this particular time interval, in this very small time interval, calculate the rate of reaction. So, indirectly what I am asking you, I am asking you to calculate instantaneous rate of reaction. How do you calculate instantaneous rate of reaction? My dear students, what exactly you will be doing, at this particular point, you will draw a tangent, this is the tangent, right? After drawing this particular tangent, you will calculate the angle with which this tangent is making with the positive x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. Let's say this is theta. Let's say this angle is theta. Take the value of tan of theta. Take the value of tan of theta. Tan of theta gives us what? Tan of theta gives us slope of tangent. Tan of theta gives us slope of tangent. Slope of tangent at a point on concentration versus time curve. Right? Perfect. And this slope of tangent is something which you call as dc by dt. That will give you the instantaneous rate of the reaction. Perfect. So you can calculate. From the graph, you can calculate instantaneous rate of reaction. Like this as well. Well, this was the graph for products. The graph can be for reactants as well. For example, I am giving you a graph like this. Understand carefully. Let's say this is concentration and this is time. Concentration versus time curve. For example, this is the graph which you have. Right? Concentration is decreasing with time. So it is basically valid for what? It is basically valid for reactants. Perfect. Now my dear students, again I am taking a small time interval, very small time interval. In this very small time interval, I want you guys to calculate the rate. That means I am asking you to calculate instantaneous rate. What you will be drawing? What you will be doing? You will mark this point. After marking this point, you will draw the tangent. After marking this point, you will draw what? You will draw the tangent. So what you need to do over here, draw the tangent over here. After drawing the tangent, get the angle, get the angle which this tangent is making with the positive x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. I'm asking about this angle. It is theta. If you calculate this theta, take the tan value of it. Take the tan value of it. Take the tan value of it. That means you are calculating slope. You are calculating slope. But understand one thing. Theta over here, is it acute or obtuse? Theta is obtuse. If theta is obtuse, 
tan of theta will come out to be negative. That means your instantaneous rate is coming out to be negative. But can rate be negative? No. That means I'll be starting with a minus sign. Then only at the end, the value comes out to be positive. Is it clear to everyone? Is it clear to everyone, people? I believe this is clear to everyone. <laughs> Say it in the charts quickly. Say it in the charts quickly. Say it in the charts quickly. Someone is saying, sir, please fast. I know what do I have to do, okay? I know that. You just understand what I'm saying. You don't teach me what should be the speed. I'll complete your whole physical chemistry in 10 to 12 hours. You don't worry about that. Just focus on one thing, whether you are getting the concepts or not. That's important. Rest of the things I'll take care of. <clears throat> okay. Theta has to be measured. Theta is the angle which the tangent makes with the positive x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. Don't take it as clockwise. Okay. Remember it. I hope this particular point is clear. Now, my dear students, after, after doing this, let's have a look on one more important thing. That is the rate of reaction, rate of reaction as per stoichiometry. This is something important. My dear students, let me just do one thing. <clears throat> let me take a general balanced chemical equation. N1A plus N2B. It gives N3C plus N4D. Imagine this is a balanced chemical equation in which N1, N2, N3, N4, these are the stoichiometric coefficients of your reactants and products. N1, N2, N3, N4, these are the stoichiometric coefficients of your reactants and products. Right? Now, my dear students, try to understand one thing. Since I told you already, as the reaction proceeds, as the reaction proceeds, moles of reactant, concentration of reactant, pressure of reactant, that decreases with time. And similarly, Moles of product, concentration of product, pressure of product, that increase with time. You know it. Can I say, can I say, as the reaction proceeds, reactants disappear with time? Absolutely. As the reaction proceeds, reactants disappear with time. And as the reaction proceeds, products, they appear with time. They appear with time. So from now onwards, whenever I'll be talking in terms of disappearance, whenever I'll be using the term disappearance, Disappearance is the term which is used for reactance and appearance. Appearance is the term which is used for products. I hope you got to know why. Because reactants, they disappear with time and your products, they appear with time. Right? Now, my dear students, one thing which I'm going to define over here. What is that? That is the rate of disappearance rate of disappearance for example i'm defining rate of disappearance disappearance is a term for reactance let's say i'm defining a rate of disappearance of a rate of disappearance of a right rate of disappearance of a how exactly you are going to write the rate of disappearance of a since you are using the term disappearance so you'll be starting with a minus sign minus sign then you'll write change change in the concentration of a Divide by time interval. This particular term is what you call as rate of disappearance of A. This is what you call as rate of disappearance of A. For example, I need to define rate of disappearance of B. How exactly you are going to define it? How exactly you are going to write it? Again, you are using the term disappearance. So minus change in the concentration of B. Divide by time interval. Right? Divide by time interval. For example, for example, I'm writing the rate of appearance. Rate of appearance. Appearance is the term which is used for products. So, rate of appearance of C. Since I'm writing appearance, I'll be starting with, I'll be starting with the positive sign. Then I'll be writing change in the concentration of C divided by time interval. And my dear students, in the similar way, if you want to calculate rate of appearance of D, how you are going to do it? Since again you are using appearance, so again you'll be starting with plus sign. Change in the concentration of D. Divide by time interval. So, in short, in short, what I'm trying to convey, whenever you have to write the rate of disappearance of a reactant, you'll be starting with a minus sign. 
whenever you will have to calculate rate of appearance of a product, you'll be starting with plus sign. Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this? Say it in the charts quick. Say it in the charts quick. Say it in the charts quick. For example, my dear students, let's say you've got the reaction like this. N2 gas plus 3 times H2 gas. It gives 2 times NH3 gas. This is one balanced chemical equation. I want you guys to write the rate of disappearance. The rate of disappearance of N2. How you are going to write it? How you are going to write it? It is disappearance. Start with minus sign. Change in the concentration of N2 divided by time interval delta T. Perfect. Let's say I want you guys to write the rate of appearance. The rate of appearance of NH3. You'll be starting with the plus sign. Change in the concentration of NH3 divided by time interval delta T. Perfect. Perfect. So my dear students, right now I'm defining rate of appearance and disappearance. Right now, what am I doing? I'm defining rate of appearance and dis disappearance. I did not define the rate of reaction yet. I just defined rate of disappearance of reactant, rate of appearance of product. Okay. Now there is one more thing. There is one more thing. There is one more thing. Understand. There is one more thing. If you have got the balanced reaction, N1A plus N2B, it gives N3C plus N4B. This is a balanced chemical equation. Perfect. You already know how to write the rate of disappearance appearance, right? Now, how do you define the rate of reaction? How do you define rate of reaction? Understand the terms. The first one which we saw, that was rate of disappearance appearance of, of reactance products. Now, we are changing the system basically. Now, we are talking about the reaction. Earlier, we were talking about reactants and products. Now, we are talking about the reaction. We are changing the system. We are changing the system. So, my dear students, rate of reaction, how do we calculate it? It is simply calculated as rate of disappearance or appearance of a reactant or product. Rate of disappearance or appearance of a reactant or product divided by toisometric coefficient of a reactant or product. Okay. Now, try to understand. For example, I want to calculate rate of reaction in terms of A. I want to calculate rate of reaction in terms of A. I can do that. How exactly? A is a reactant. A is a reactant. So I'll write rate of disappearance of A divided by stoichiometric coefficient of A. How do you write rate of disappearance of A? Start with minus sign. Change in the concentration of A divided by time interval. Whole divided by stoichiometric coefficient of A that is N1. How you can write it exactly? You can summarize it like this. Minus 1 by N1. It is going to be change in the concentration of A. Divided by time interval delta t. Right? This particular term is going to give you the rate of the reaction. Well, can we only calculate rate of reaction with respect to A? No, you can calculate rate of reaction with respect to B as well. How exactly you are going to write it with respect to B? With respect to B. B is again the reactant. So you'll be starting with minus sign. Minus 1 divided by. Toisometric option of B is N2. Is N2. Then you'll write change in the concentration of B divided by time interval. Similarly, similarly, first of all, this is something which will give you rate of reaction with respect to B. Can't you calculate it with respect to C? Absolutely, you can do that. C is the product. C is the product. So, will you be starting with minus or plus? Absolutely, you'll be starting with plus. Plus 1 divided by toisometric coefficient is N3. Now, it's going to be change in the concentration of C divided by time interval delta T. Perfect. Similarly, you can calculate rate of reaction with respect to D as well. Plus 1 divided by N4. Change in the concentration of D divided by time interval delta T. All these terms are giving you what? All these terms will give you the rate of the reaction. Whether you want to use this term to calculate rate of reaction. Or you want to use this term to calculate rate of reaction. Or this term or this term. From all these terms, from all these terms, you are getting the same rate of reaction. Why is that? Because you are using the time interval, same delta T. I believe this is clear to everyone. I believe this is clear to everyone. I believe this is clear to everyone. Quick in the charts. Say it in the charts. One more thing, one more thing, which I want to share with you. What is that? Whatever term you use to calculate rate of reaction among all these four terms, 
do remember the unit of rate by taking any of these terms is going to be moles liter inverse second inverse right moles liter inverse second inverse basically if time is in seconds and then second inverse if minutes minute inverse r r inverse etc etc okay now my dear students i am going to write one important statement i am going to write one important statement statement is like this for a homogeneous gaseous phase reaction imagine you have got a homogeneous gaseous phase reaction imagine you have got a homogeneous gaseous phase reaction which is carried out at constant temperature which is carried out at constant temperature homogeneous gaseous phase reaction which is carried out at constant temperature for example let's say i've got the reaction like this n1a gas n1a gas plus n2b gas it gives n3c gas <clears throat> plus n4d gas first of all tell me all the reactants products all the reactants products they are in gaseous state if all the reactants products are in gaseous state I will be calling this particular reaction as the homogeneous gaseous phase reaction. I'll be calling this particular reaction as the homogeneous gaseous phase reaction. Uh, do not someone is spamming in the chats. Please and please avoid that. Okay, just focus on what I'm teaching. Just avoid. You are telling something to North Indians and etc. etc. There is nothing like North India, South India. Okay, just, just focus on the topic. You guys all are going to write the same exam, right? There is no need to create this confusion. Perfect. Cut off is uniform everywhere. So understand. Perfect. Let's say this particular reaction in which all the reactants products they are in gaseous phase. I'll be calling this reaction as the homogeneous gaseous phase reaction. Now, my dear students, for the homogeneous gaseous phase reaction, rate can be expressed. Rate can be expressed rate can be expressed in terms of in terms of concentration as well as pressure as well as pressure rate can be expressed in terms of concentration as well as pressure for what for a homogeneous gaseous phase reaction what it means exactly try to analyze and understand what i'm going to talk about see guys if you want to write the rate of reaction if you want to write the rate of reaction right in terms of a minus 1 divided by n1 change in the concentration of a divided by time interval similarly it's going to be minus 1 divided by n2 change in the concentration of b divided by time interval in terms of c it's plus 1 divided by n3 change in the concentration of c divided by time interval which is going to be plus 1 divided by n4 change in the concentration of d divided by time interval correct and if you take any of these terms if you solve any of these terms you'll be getting the rate in terms of moles per liter per second right by taking any of these terms you'll get it, you'll be getting the rate in moles liter inverse second inverse correct now my dear students since ideal gas equation you all must be knowing pv is equal to nrt this is your ideal gas equation can i write it like this p is equal to n divided by vrt yes p is equal to n divided by vrt what is this n by v moles per unit volume n by v this is concentration so can I say P is equal to concentration multiplied by R multiplied by T, where T is a temperature. Okay. So people, if I write P A, P A, that will be concentration of A, R T. P B, concentration of B, R T. P C, concentration of C, R T. P D, concentration of D, R T. Right. Now, in this particular equation, can I say something like this? R is equal to minus 1 divided by N1, change in instead of concentration of a instead of concentration of a instead of concentration of a can i say concentration of a is p a divided by rt absolutely so it is change in p a divided by rt and already there was delta t is equal to minus one upon n2 minus one upon n2 change in concentration of b means pressure of b divided by rt multiplied by delta t which is equal to plus one divided by n3 it's going to be change in the pressure of C divided by RT multiplied by delta T, which is also equal to plus 1 divided by N4, plus 1 divided by N4, change in the pressure of D divided by RT multiplied by delta T. Do you see RT, RT, RT everywhere gets cancelled out? So I'll got one very important equation, minus 1 divided by N1, 
चेंज इन द प्रेशर ऑफ ए डिवाइडेड बाय डेल्टा टी माइनस वन अपॉन एन टू चेंज इन द प्रेशर ऑफ बी डिवाइडेड बाय टाइम इंटरवल व्हिच इज इक्वल प्लस वन डिवाइडेड बाय एन थ्री चेंज इन द प्रेशर ऑफ सी डिवाइड बाय टाइम इंटरवल व्हिच इज आल्सो इक्वल प्लस वन डिवाइड बाय एन फोर चेंज इन द प्रेशर ऑफ डी divided by time interval delta t and my dear students if you look at this particular equation now if you look at this particular equation look at this particular equation in the first equation you were calculating rate in terms of concentrations and here you are calculating rate in terms of pressures change in the pressure of a divided by time interval change in the pressure of b change in the pressure of c because you know when the reaction proceeds concentration as well as pressure of reactance products it keeps on changing right perfect so you are expressing rate in terms of moles per liter per second but over here over here since you are using the term pressure you are using the term pressure for example pressure was in atm let's say pressure was in atm and let's say time was in seconds so it's going to be atm second inverse let's say pressure was in bar pressure was in bar time was in seconds bar second inverse let's say pressure was in atm time was in minutes so atm minute inverse accordingly you can make the units over here so whenever you are supposed to calculate rate of reaction first you need to understand whether you have to calculate rate in terms of moles per liter per second or you have to calculate rate in terms of in terms of atm second inverse or whatever am i clear with all these things am i clear with all these things let's try to do some questions let's try to do some questions if i'm clear with all these things Say it once in the chats. Say it once in the chats. <coughs> all the students who have not subscribed to the channel yet, do subscribe to the channel right now because all the amazing sessions are going to happen on this channel from now on. All the amazing sessions, right? Your complete syllabus will be done and dusted of PCB in just fourteen sessions, out of which first session is today. Perfect. Look at this particular question, guys. As per the question is concerned, if you read the question carefully, we are given with a reaction two times N two O five. It gives two times N two O four plus O two. This is the reaction. If the rate of appearance of O two, rate of appearance of O two is given, now you tell me, how do we write the rate of appearance? How do we write the rate of appearance of O two? I'll say rate of appearance. of o2 how do we write it mathematically since we are talking about appearance so use the sign plus use the sign plus then then change in the concentration of o2 divide by time interval delta t right this is something which you will be calling as rate of appearance of o2 this is something which you will be calling as rate of appearance of o2 and this rate of appearance of o2 is given to us as 0.5 moles liter inverse second inverse What are we supposed to calculate? What are we supposed to calculate? Rate of disappearance of N2O5. How do we write the disappearance of N2O5? Rate of disappearance of N2O5 is equal. I'll be starting with minus sign. Change in the concentration of N2O5 divided by delta T. This is something which you call as rate of disappearance of N2O5, right? Okay, I have to calculate this value. Guys, be careful with one thing. be careful with one thing be careful with one thing whenever you want to calculate rate of reaction at that time you have to divide with stoichiometric coefficient whenever you are writing rate of appearance or disappearance you are not supposed to divide with stoichiometric coefficient am i am i live and clear yes can you all hear me properly can you all hear me properly I think so. <clears throat> yeah. perfect 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 okay so this term is given this is what we are supposed to calculate okay now how you are going to solve this type of the question just try to do one thing write the differential form of rate write the differential form of rate how do you write the differential form of rate 
I'll write rate in terms of N2O5, which is minus 1 divided by this 2. Change in the concentration of N2O5 divided by time interval delta T. Okay. Now, at the same time, write the rate of reaction in terms of O2. Start with plus sign. 1 by stoichiometric coefficient. Change in the concentration of O2 divided by time interval delta T. Perfect. Now, my dear students, in this particular equation, can I write like this? Minus change in the concentration of N2O5 divided by delta T is equal. I'll take 2 here. It will be 2 times. 2 times. Plus change in the concentration of O2 divided by delta T. I can do this definitely. What do I call this particular term? This particular term is called as rate of disappearance. Rate of disappearance of N2O5. It is nothing but 2 times. 2 times. Plus, plus this value. This is rate of appearance of O2. Rate of appearance of O2 is nothing but 0 0.5. So multiplying it with 0 0.5, the value comes out to be 1 mole liter inverse second inverse. I believe everybody would have solved this question. Absolutely, you're right. It's 1 mole per liter per second. Done and dusted. Let's say I'm giving you a second question like this. Look at this question carefully. Look at this particular question carefully. Look at this particular carefully. We are given with the reaction, my dear students. The reaction is nothing but it is 2 times NH3. 2 times NH3 gives N2 plus 3 times H2. This is your balanced chemical equation. This is your balanced chemical equation. This is your balanced chemical equation. My dear students, as per the question, calculate the rate of the reaction in the interval 5 to 15 seconds. So this is 5 second here. This is 15 second here. So this interval, this interval will be how much? 15 minus 5, 10 seconds. So your time interval is basically 10 seconds. Your time interval is basically 10 seconds, right? In this time interval, we are calculating rate. First of all, try to analyze things. What do you see? This concentration versus time. And concentration is decreasing with time. Whose concentration decreases with time? Reactant or product? Whose concentration decreases with time? The concentration of reactant decreases with time. So basically, basically, this particular, basically, this particular curve, it's valid for reactant. It is valid for reactant. It is valid for reactant. What is the reactant in this reaction? It's NH3. So this is the graph for NH3 here. This is the curve for NH3 here. Do you understand this? It is the curve for NH3 here. Perfect. So at 5 seconds, the concentration of NH3 was 0 0.6 molar. At time 15 seconds, the concentration of NH3 was 0 0.2 seconds. So this was the initial concentration of NH3. This is the final concentration of NH3. As simple as that. Now, my dear students, calculate the rate of reaction, rate of reaction in the time interval 5 to 15 seconds. So, I'll be calculating rate of reaction with respect to NH3. So, I'll say rate of reaction is equal to minus 1 divided by 2, change in the concentration of NH3 divided by time interval. So, it's minus 1 divided by 2, change in the concentration of NH3 will be final concentration of NH3 minus initial. Final concentration is 0 0.2 molar, initial is 0 0.6, time interval is 10 seconds. Right? So, rate of reaction will be minus 1 divided by 2. This will be minus 0 0.4 minus minus plus. Right? So, 0 0.4 divided by 10, which will be 0 0.02 moles liter inverse, second inverse. Is everyone done with this? Is everyone done with this? <clears throat> yes. I believe all the students are done with this. Right? Now, my dear students, one more type of question you can get here. Look at this particular question carefully. Look at this particular question carefully. As per the question, we are given with a reaction. This is the reaction. Some data is given to us. Some data is given to us. We are supposed to get the relation between K1, K2, K3. How do we get this particular relation between K1, K2, K3? Try to understand how exactly you guys will be solving this particular question. My dear students, rate of reaction. Rate of reaction. With respect to N2O5, you will start with minus. 1 divided by, stoichiometric coefficient is 1, change in the concentration, change in the concentration of what? Change in the concentration of N2O5 divided by time interval, whether you want to write delta or D. Similarly, in terms of NO2, plus 1 divided by 2, change in the concentration of NO2 divided by time interval. Similarly, the coefficient here is 1 by 2, plus 1 divided by 1 by 2, 1 divided by 1 by 2 makes it 2. Change in the concentration of O2 divided by time interval. Divide by time interval. Now, my dear students, look at the data. 
This particular term is given to you. Minus d n two o five divided by d t. This term is given you as k one multiplied by n two o five concentration plus one by two. D of n o two by d t. D of n o two by d t is nothing but k two multiplied by concentration of n two o five. Similarly, two times d of o two divided by d t. It is given as k three multiplied by concentration of n two o five. Can I say this term? This term? This term cancelled out, right? So I'll be getting k one is equal to k two divided by two, which is equal to two times k three. If I multiply through out by two, it becomes two times k one is equal to k two is equal to four times k three. So this is going to be the relation between k one, k two, and k three. I believe this is clear. I believe this is clear. Is it clear, people? Quick in the chats. Quickly, let me know in the chats. <laughs> Quickly, let me know in the chats, everyone. Everyone, everyone, quickly. Is it clear? Simply, I wrote the differential rate. Simply, I wrote the differential form of rate, and then I substituted the data over here, and we are done. We are done. Perfect. My dear students, one question I'm giving you, and this has been frequently asked in JE mains from past two three years. And I believe you can easily solve that question now. Try to understand why you are multiplying with two, because I did not want something to be in fraction, right? I did not want something to be in fraction. Okay, I'm giving you a question. Try to understand this. Let's say the reaction is x times a gives y times b. X and y these are the stoichiometric coefficients of a and b respectively. A and b, x and y these are the stoichiometric coefficients of a and b respectively. Now, my dear students, if you look carefully, I'm giving you the data. I'm giving you some data. The data is something like this: log of log of minus log of minus delta a divided by delta t is equal to is equal to log of plus delta b divided by delta t plus. I'm giving, for example, zero point three. And let's say I'm asking you calculate the value of x and y. Calculate the value of x and y. Can you give it a try? Can you give this question a try quickly in the chat, my dear students? Everyone, 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 people. <clears throat> can you give it a try quickly? You can do it. It's very much simple, people. Try to understand how exactly you are going to solve this sort of a question. This has been frequently asked from past two, three years in your mains, and it's a proper need standard question. Nothing to think. Try to understand. First thing, if you look at this particular equation, if you look at this particular equation, can you write the difference of form of rate? Yes, you can do that. I'll say rate of reaction, rate of reaction in terms of A will be minus one divided by x. Change in the concentration of A divided by time interval, right? Rate of reaction in terms of B is going to be plus one divided by Y. Change in the concentration of B divided by time interval. Divided by time interval. Perfect. Divided by time interval. I believe everybody knows how to write this expression. Done. Now, my dear students, look at this particular data. Look at this particular data. This data is given in terms of log. This term is in terms of log. This term is not given in terms of log. Don't you think we should convert this term into log? Absolutely, absolutely. So instead of zero point three, instead of zero point three, I'll write log of two to the base ten. Right? Log two to the base ten is nothing but that is zero point three only. You should know it. Now use some basic maths. Use some basic maths. Log of this is minus delta a divided by delta t. Is equal to log of m plus log of n, log of m plus log of n. What is that? That is log of m multiplied by n, log of m multiplied by n. Right? Log of log of m plus log of n is nothing but log of m into n. Simple. Now, people, if you take n t log on both the sides, if you take n t log on both the sides, log will 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 get cancelled. I'll say minus delta a. Divided by delta t is equal. It will be two times, two times delta b divided by what? Divided by delta t. If you take two here in the denominator, it will be minus one by two. Delta a 
डिवाइडेड बाय डेल्टा टी इज इक्वल दिस गोइंग बी डेल्टा बी डिवाइडेड बाय डेल्टा टी माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड आई मेड वन मोर इक्वेशन इफ यू जस्ट कंपेयर दीज टू इक्वेशंस आंट दे हैविंग द सेम फॉर्मेट आंट दीज टू इक्वेशंस हैविंग द सेम फॉर्मेट पीपल राइट सो व्हेन यू कंपेयर इट x value is nothing but x value is coming out be 2 x value is coming out be 2 and y value y value is coming out be what y value is coming out to be 1 these were the two things which i was supposed to calculate i believe it's perfectly clear i believe it's perfectly clear quick yes is it clear to everyone what did i do my dear students what did i do the data which was given to me i converted all the data into logarithmic form used a bit of mathematics got one equation compared it with the differential form i when i compared i got the value of x and y that is something which i was supposed to do that is something which i was supposed to do is this clear to everyone say it in the chats everybody say it in the chats everybody quick quick people say it in the chats quickly if it is clear <coughs> yeah yes log 1 to 10 you will have to remember log 1 to 10 values will be used many a times basically particularly in equilibrium chapter when you talk about ionic equilibrium when you do the ph calculation etc etc log 1 to log 10 you should remember what is there to remember first of all you should know it yeah perfect <clears throat> perfect guys let's move on let's move on to one more topic what is that that is the law of mass action law of mass action first of all this law of mass action which we are going to discuss now it is a complete theoretical concept it does not have any experimental background complete theoretical concept right it was given by two scientists goldberg and p wage these were the two scientists who gave this particular concept that is law of mass action with the help of law of mass action what do we do with the help of law of mass action we also calculate rate of the reaction we also calculate rate of the reaction but the rate of the reaction which we calculate with the help of law of mass action that is called as theoretical rate that is the theoretical rate so from law of mass action what do we get we get the theoretical rate of reaction first of all it is a complete theoretical concept number 1 number 2 goldberg and p wage were the two scientists who formulated this particular law of mass action number 3 with the help of law of mass action we again calculate rate of the reaction right whatever rate of reaction we calculate with the help of law of mass action that is something which you call as theoretical rate of the reaction theoretical rate of the reaction i hope this is clear right now what this law of mass action states my dear students the law of mass action states that as per law of mass action rate of the reaction rate of the reaction is directly proportional to the product of is directly proportional to the product of active masses of reactants active masses of reactants raised to the powers of their respective stoichiometric coefficients raised to the powers of their respective stoichiometric coefficients before making you understand this particular statement remember two things directly remember i'm not going into the details that is not needed at this point of time remember whenever you see any reactant or product in aqueous state in aqueous state that means in the bracket it will be mentioned as aqueous for that particular reactant or product which will be in aqueous state do remember its active mass is taken as its concentration its active mass is its concentration whenever you see any reactant or product in gaseous state its active mass is concentration as well as pressure whenever you see any reactant or product in pure solid or pure liquid form whenever you see any reactant or product in pure solid or pure liquid form its active mass is constant and to reduce the calculations for our simplicity to reduce the calculation we are taking the constant value as unity 1 right perfect my dear students whenever you see any reactant or product in aqueous state 
its active mass its concentration in gaseous state it can be concentration as well as pressure because for gases concentration as well as pressure both the terms are defined both the terms are defined similarly any reactant or product in solid or pure liquid form its active mass is constant and we take that constant value as unity just to reduce the calculations etc right now my dear students try to understand what this law of mass section is all about you have got a balanced chemical equation n1a plus n2b gives n3c it's a balanced chemical equation as per law of mass section rate of reaction is directly proportional to the product of active masses of reactants active masses of reactants active mass of a multiplied by active mass of b raised to the powers of their stoichiometric coefficients stoichiometric coefficient here is n1 so raised per n1 stoichiometric coefficient here is n2 so raised per n2 so raised per n2 perfect now people your reactants are right now in aqueous phase they are in aqueous phase so in terms of instead of active mass what i'll be using i'll be using the term concentration i'll be using the term concentration because both of them are in what both of them are in aqueous states right so from this particular equation from this particular statement what did we get rate of reaction is directly proportional to concentration of a raised per n1 multiplied by concentration of b raised per n2 clear clear people clear people whatever rate you calculate from here that's what you call as theoretical rate of reaction that is theoretical rate of reaction that is theoretical rate of reaction now one thing i want you guys to understand here what is that particular thing that is something which is very important i told you to calculate rate with the help of differential form number one i told you to calculate rate with the help of what with the help of law of mass section right that's one more thing my dear students if i write a term rate over here tell me how many ways do we have to calculate the rate of reaction how many ways do we have either i'll be using law of mass section either i'll be using the law of mass section and will try to calculate rate of reaction and whenever i calculate rate of reaction with the help of law of mass section that is something which gives you theoretical rate or i can do one more thing i can do certain experiments in the lab and i can calculate rate of reaction experimentally so rate of reaction can be determined experimentally as well right experimentally as well and experimental rate of reaction i am representing with re one is going to be you will be calculating rate of reaction with the help of law of mass section and you will be getting the theoretical rate one more way of doing it you can do certain experiments in the lab and calculate the rate of reaction and that rate of reaction will be calling as experimentally determined rate right that's what you'll be calling as experimentally determined rate now my dear students what you will observe you'll observe in some reactions theoretical rate and experimental rate it always comes out to be equal in some reactions or some reactions theoretical rate and experimental rate it comes out to be equal but for some reactions but for some reactions theoretical rate and experimental rate they do not come out to be same they do not come out to be same whether you call this re as the experimentally determined rate or you call this as actual rate you call this as actual rate of reaction and what is this this is the theoretical rate so in some reactions in some reactions actual rate and theoretical rate they do not come out to be equal they do not come out to be equal what can you understand from that that tells me your law of mass section always does not give you the correct result that tells me your law of mass section always does not give you the correct result don't you think we need to modify that law of mass section so that so that we always get the correct result yes we have got two ways theoretical rate with the help of law of mass section experimental rate for some reactions theoretical experimental theoretical actual comes out to be equal for some reactions it does not come out to be equal that means your law of mass section always does not give you the correct value right don't you think we need to modify that law of mass section and let me tell you let me tell you now we are going to modify the law of mass section we are going to modify the law of mass section so that the equation which we get from that equation we always get the correct value right right people right and that modified law of mass section is what you call as a rate law that modified law of mass section
is something which you will be calling as rate law. I hope you got the idea of what was the need to jump into rate law. Now, where the corrections are made, where the corrections are made, first of all, if I talk about your rate law now, rate law, rate law, it is based on, it is based on law of mass action, because we are going to do some change in the law of mass action, so as to get the rate law. So your rate law is nothing but, it is based on law of mass action, number one. Number two, imagine you have got the equation N1A aqueous plus N2B aqueous, it gives your products. Let's assume this is a general balanced chemical equation. This is a general balanced chemical equation. Now, now, now. Now, I'm going to use the rate law. Rate law says that rate of reaction, rate of reaction is directly proportional to the, is directly proportional to the product of active masses of reactants, product of active masses of reactants raised to the powers numbers, raised to power the numbers which are calculated experimentally. So till now I used to keep the power as N1, N2. But in the rate law, you do not keep the power as N1, N2. You keep the power as X and Y. Where this X and Y, they are calculated experimentally. And after some time, I'll show you how this X and Y is calculated. After some time, I'll let you know how this X and Y is calculated. I believe it's clear till here. Now, can you do it like this? Rate of reaction is directly proportional to I'll write concentration of A raised by N, sorry, concentration of A raised by X, concentration of B raised by Y, perfect. If I remove the proportionality sign, it's going to be constant. Concentration of A raised by X, concentration of B raised by Y. This particular equation, my dear students, this is what you call as a rate law. This is what you call as rate law. This is what you call as rate law. And at the same time, this particular X over here, X is something which you call as order of the reaction with respect to A. Y is what you call as order of the reaction with respect to B. And if you take the sum of these two, X plus Y, this is something which you will be calling as overall order of the reaction. Overall order of the reaction, right? In some time, you'll understand the order in more detailed way. But right now, just understand these things. Right now, just understand these things. X is what you call as order with respect to A, order with respect to B. X plus Y is what you call as overall order of the reaction. Well, this R over here, since in this expression, this X and Y are calculated experimentally. So this R over here, I'll be calling this as actual rate or experimentally determined rate. Experimentally determined rate, or you'll be calling this as actual rate of the reaction. What is this K over here? This K is something which you call as a rate constant of the reaction. This is something which you call as a rate constant of the reaction. Rate constant of the reaction. Now, if I ask you, if I ask you, as I told you earlier, as I told you earlier, if I am writing rate over here, if I want to calculate rate, can I say I have got two ways to calculate rate? Either I'll be using law of mass action to calculate rate, or I'll be using the rate law to calculate rate. Right? If I use law of mass action and calculate the rate of reaction, that is something which I call as theoretical rate, which will be K, concentration of A raised by N1, concentration of B raised by N2. If I use the rate law, if I use the rate law, I'll be getting the actual rate, which is going to be K, concentration of A raised by X, concentration of B raised by Y. And my dear students, I told you a few minutes back, I told you a few minutes back, there are some reactions, there are some reactions in which theoretical rate, and experimentally determined rate comes out to be equal. Can I say in those reactions, if this term and this term are equal, can I say for those reactions, X value is basically N1 and your Y value is basically N2. So for those reactions, when you calculate X and Y experimentally, X and Y value will come out to be same as where the stoichiometric coefficients of A and B. Right? And similarly, I told you those reactions, for which theoretical and experimental rate does not come out to be equal. For them, when you calculate X and Y experimentally, it won't come out to be same as that of N1 and N2. Right? I believe this particular point is clear. This is very important, guys. This is very important. So, quickly tell me if I'm clear. Quickly tell me if I'm clear. And afterwards, in, in some time, in some time, you will see, you will see, there is a particular set of reactions, 
which you call as elementary reaction. For those elementary reactions, this particular statement is always valid. This particular statement is basically valid for which reactions? Elementary reactions, which you call as simple reactions as well. I'll let you know about that in some time. Just take a note of it. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear to everyone. If yes, let me know quickly in the chats. If yes, let me know quickly in the chats, people. Perfect. Now, now what is this K over here called as? This is called as a rate constant. My dear students, if I want you guys to define the rate constant, how you are going to define it? If you are going to define this rate constant, how you are going to define it? I'll do one simple thing. If concentration of A is equal to concentration of B and both are equal to one molar. If concentration of A as well as concentration of B, I keep as one molar. At that particular point of time, can I say R is equal to K? R is equal to K, right? So how do I define this rate constant? How do I define this rate constant? I will say rate constant is nothing. It is the rate of reaction. Rate constant, what is it? It is the rate of reaction. Which is calculated when the concentration of reactants are, keep, are kept as one molar. Right? What is rate constant? Rate constant. Rate constant is basically the rate of the reaction. It is basically the rate of reaction which is measured. Which is measured when concentration of all the reactants is taken as unity. Is taken as unity. I believe this is clear. Okay. Okay. Now people, if you ask me, if you ask me what kind of idea this rate constant gives you, let me tell you this rate constant, it gives me the idea about the speed of the reaction. It gives me the idea about the speed of the reaction. It gives me the idea how fastly the reaction is proceeding. Do remember, more the value of rate constant, faster is going to be the reaction. More the value of rate constant of the reaction, faster is going to be the reaction. Lesser the value of rate constant of the reaction, slower is going to be the reaction. Slower is going to be the reaction. Number one, K gives me the idea about the rate of reaction. More the value of K, faster the reaction. Lesser the value of K, slower the reaction. Number one. Number two. Number two. Every reaction has got, every reaction has got a particular value of rate constant at a particular temperature. Every reaction has got a particular value of rate constant at a particular temperature. Right? Particular value of rate constant. Every reaction has got a particular value of rate constant at a particular temperature. Number three. Number three. Rate constant depends on temperature. Rate constant of the reaction, it depends on temperature. How it depends on temperature? You will see that in Arena's equation when I will teach you. But right now, just remember one thing. When you increase the temperature, when you increase the temperature, rate constant of forward as well as backward reaction, that increases. Rate con when you increase the temperature, just remember it. Why it happens? This explanation I will be giving you in this exp explanation I'll be giving you in, uh, in this Arrhenius equation, yeah? So, when you increase the temperature, do remember, rate constant in general increases, or I can say, rate constant of forward and backward reaction, both increase. Both increase. And since I told you, since I told you, rate constant is the rate of the reaction which is measured when concentration of all the reactants is taken as one molar. What does that mean? That means your rate constant, it will be independent of the initial concentration of the reactants. I've got nothing to do with the initial concentrations. I've got nothing to do with the initial concentrations. Why? Why? Because I'll be always calculating rate of reaction. I'll, I'll be always calculating rate constant when the concentration of reactants will be one molar. So whatever initial concentration you keep, keep it. But measure the rate of reaction when the concentration of reactants reaches as one molar. Okay? So do you remember this particular point? The value of rate constant. The value of rate constant. Perfect? Is it clear? Is it clear people? Quick, quick, quick in the chats. <clears throat> quick in the chats, everyone. Now we have got two types of reactions. We have got two types of reactions on the base of kinetics point of view. We have got two types of reactions. One is called as elementary reaction. One is called as complex reaction. Now what is an elementary reaction? 
Elementary reactions are the ones which are completed in a single step. Elementary reactions are the ones which are completed in a single step. So those reactions which get completed in a single step, those are what you call as elementary reaction. Now this point is very, very important. Law of mass action is truly valid for elementary reactions. Law of mass action is truly valid for elementary reactions, which I told you already, which I told you already. Law of mass action is truly valid for elementary reactions. That means for elementary reactions, for those reactions which are carried out in a single step, for those reactions, if you want to calculate rate with the help of law of mass action, or you want to calculate rate with the help of rate law from both the expressions, you'll get the same value. That means, that means, that means, that means, that means, if I talk about this particular reaction, if I talk about this particular reaction, I can calculate rate of reaction with the help of law of mass section, like this, theoretical rate, or I can use the rate law. I can use the rate law. This is K here. I can use the rate law. Over here, I've used the law of mass section. Over here, I've used the rate law. What you will observe in elementary reactions, you'll observe one thing that in case of elementary reactions, your theoretical and experimentally determined rates, they will come out to be equal. That indicates clearly the value of X will be always N1, the value of Y will be always N2. So whether you want to use this expression or this expression, you'll be getting the same value. You'll be getting the same result. If I'm clear, let me know in the chats. This is something important. That's it. For the elementary reactions, law of mass section is truly valid. Now, what are complex reactions? Complex reactions are the ones, complex reactions are the ones which are not com complete in a single step. They are multi-step reactions. They get completed in more than one step. They get completed in more than one step. For example, for example, for example, look at these two. Look at these two steps. Look at these two steps. When you add these two steps, when you add these two steps, this one and this one, this NOBR2, NOBR2 cancels out. NO, NO makes it 2 times NO plus BR2 gives 2 times NOBR. Now, if I want you guys to look at this reaction carefully, is this reaction getting complete in one step? No, this reaction did not get complete in one step. It got complete in two steps. Those reactions which get completed in more than one step, what do you call those reactions as? You call those reactions as complex reactions. You call those reactions as complex reactions, number one. Number two, number two, how many steps are involved in this complex reaction? This is step number one, this is step number two. Let me tell you, all the steps, okay, leave it. That's something I'll tell you afterwards when I teach you molecularity. Is it clear? This is the complex reaction. How many steps are involved? Two steps. The steps involved in the complex reaction, they'll be always elementary. Right? So this step is elementary in nature. This step is also elementary in nature. The steps involved in the complex reactions, they're elementary. That is something which you would have seen over here. Number one, these reactions which are completed in more than one step, those are called as complex reactions. The steps which are involved in the complex reaction, they are elementary. They are elementary. Perfect. Now coming on to something very important, that is what you call as molecularity. What is molecularity? Break, I'll be giving you at one. PM exactly. Okay. We have to complete this chapter, then I'll give you a break. Otherwise, no break. Okay. After completion of every chapter, I'll be giving you the break. I've thought of giving four hours to one chapter. Then only in 12 hours we can complete. Excluding the breaks. Excluding the breaks. Okay. So you have to be with me till the end. If you are ready to do that, if you are ready to do that, then there is nobody going to stop you, my dear students, in order to get 100% in chemistry. Trust me on that. All right. Molecularity. Again, one important question on which, again, a, one important concept from which you are surely going to get one question. What is molecularity? First of all, molecularity, it is again a theoretical concept. No experimental background. No experimental background. Number one. Number two. What is molecularity? What is molecularity? Before telling you what is molecularity, let me tell you, this molecularity, it is only defined for elementary reaction. Molecularity term, it is defined only for what? For elementary reactions. You define molecularity only for elementary reactions. Okay, the concept is valid for elementary reactions. Molecularity for complex reaction does not have any physical significance. 
for complex reaction for complex reaction molecularity does not have any significance so molecularity term it is basically defined for what it is defined for your for your elementary reactions now what is molecularity my dear students somewhere you would have studied about collision theory right somewhere in your earlier classes you would have studied about collision theory which i'll be teaching you in some time collision theory says that for the reaction to happen for the reaction to happen the reacting species the reacting species the reactants the reacting species which can be your atoms ions or molecules they must collide first that is the assumption in in your collision theory for the reaction to happen for the reaction to proceed your reacting species which can be atoms ions or molecules they must collide first okay they must collide first now the number of reacting species the number of reacting species the number of reacting species which can be atoms ions or molecules which collide simultaneously which collide simultaneously to form the products that defines the molecularity of the reaction that defines the molecularity of the reaction so basically how many reacting species are simultaneously colliding to form the products that is something which you will be calling as molecularity that is something which you need to remember also nothing more than that no need to go for the deep explanations etc etc okay but there are few points here now have a look if you look at this particular reaction the last reaction can i say over here two molecules are simultaneously colliding and forming the products so i'll say this particular reaction its molecularity is 2 over here 2 plus 1 three molecules are simultaneously colliding and forming the product the molecularity of this reaction is 3 over here 1 1 two molecules are simultaneously colliding to form the product right molecularity 2 look at the first reaction over here it's 1 now this calcium carbonate it's going to react with what it's going to collide with what first of all its molecularity i'll be considering as 1 now its collision you are going to take with what its collision you are either going to take with the wall of the container or the shake off right this calcium carbonate it breaks it shakes off and gets converted into what calcium oxide and carbon dioxide its shake off is considered to be as the collision perfect its collision is either considered to be the to be with the wall of the container or its shake off is considered to be the collision right perfect any reaction whose molecularity is one you call that as the unimolecular reaction Tri molecular reaction, right? Tri molecular reaction. This is your bi molecular reaction. Bi molecular reaction. Now, if I ask you one question, one simple question I'm asking you here, tell me the molecularity of this reaction. Half of H2 plus half of I2 gives HI. What do you think is the molecularity of this particular reaction? Can you let me know quickly in the chats? What do you think is the molecularity of this particular reaction? Quickly in the chats, everyone. Is it half, half, one? A lot of people must be thinking it's one. A lot of people must be thinking it's one. It's not one. It's not one. You cannot define the molecularity until, until, until the stoichiometric coefficients, until the stoichiometric coefficients of the reactants are in, are in fact. I mean, you cannot define the molecularity. You cannot define the molecularity if the stoichiometric coefficients they are in fractions. Over here, the stoichiometric coefficients are in fractions. So convert them into the nearest natural numbers first. Convert them into the nearest natural numbers first. How you are going to do that? I'll be multiplying this reaction throughout by two. When you multiply it by two, this is H2. This is I2. It is two times H. Now, if I ask you what is the molecularity of this reaction, it is one plus one, which makes it two. So two is the molecularity of this reaction as well. Be careful with all these things. Be careful with all these things, my dear students. Am I clear? Am I clear quickly in the chats? Am I clear? Am I clear? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Just a second, guys.
perfect wonderful moving ahead let's talk about few more things about molecularity <clears throat> if i talk about few more important things about molecularity which can be asked the molecularity of the reaction it can never be zero molecularity of the reaction zero what does that mean that means zero molecules are colliding does it make any sense no molecularity it cannot be zero molecularity cannot be fractional you cannot say that 1.3 molecules have collided 1.5 molecules have collided right you cannot say that so molecularity cannot be fractional molecularity of the reaction cannot be negative as well you cannot say minus 2 molecules have collided no you cannot say minus 5 molecules have collided no right so molecularity of the reaction it can never be zero molecularity of the reaction it can never be fractional or negative okay now those reactions which have got molecularity greater than 3 they are rarely observed they are rarely found those reactions which have got molecularity greater than 3 they are rarely found what is molecularity the number of reacting species colliding simultaneously the number of reacting species colliding simultaneously now the probability the probability for the simultaneous collision of more than three molecules of more than react three reacting species that is very less that is very less the probability of simultaneous collision of more than three reacting species that probability is very less that is the reason why those reactions whose molecularity is greater than three why they are rarely observed why they are rarely found okay perfect and molecularity is the concept which is basically basically given for elementary reaction yeah perfect now people if you talk about the complex reaction first of all first of all i'm given with the steps these are the two steps which i'm given with out of which one is fast one is slow if i add these two steps what gets cancelled out nobr2 nobr2 gets cancelled out no no makes it two times no so two times no plus br2 makes it two times nobr tell me one thing will you be calling this particular reaction as elementary or complex is this reaction getting complete in one step or more than one step more than one step so this particular reaction is your complex reaction right it's your complex reaction is molecularity defined for the complex reaction it is not defined for the complex reaction but if you look at the steps what are steps this is elementary in nature this is elementary and molecularity is defined for elementary reactions so can i say molecularity of these steps is defined molecularity of these steps is defined what is the molecularity of this reaction 1 plus 1 makes it 2. So molecularity of this step is 2. What is the molecularity of this step? 1 plus 1 makes it 2. So molecularity of this step is also 2. Perfect. Molecularity is not defined for your complex reactions. Perfect. <clears throat> Let's move ahead. Let's now try to discuss about something called as order. What is order? What is order? How do you define the term order? My dear students, first of all, there are a few points which you need to remember. Order is basically, order is basically the sum of, the sum of powers. The sum of powers. The sum of powers of the concentration terms which are involved in the rate law which are involved in the rate law expression sum of powers of all the concentration terms which are involved in the rate law for example this is the reaction this is the reaction if i want you guys to write rate law for this particular reaction you should be able to do that Rate of reaction is equal to rate constant. For example, concentration of A raised for X, concentration of B raised for Y. This is how you write rate law. This is how you write rate law. 
This x is called as order with respect to a, y is called as order with respect to b, and x plus y is what you will be calling as the overall order of the reaction. That's what I told you over here. The sum of the powers, the sum of the powers which are there, the sum of the powers of all these concentration terms which are there in the rate law, that's something which you call as the overall order of the reaction. Okay? That's something which you call as overall order of the reaction. Now, can I say order of the reaction we can calculate only? Order of the reaction we can calculate only when we write the rate law? Absolutely. For in order to calculate the in order to calculate the order, what do we need to do? We need to write the rate law. In the rate law, this x and y, they are calculated experimentally. If x and y is calculated experimentally, can't I say that order is an experimentally determined quantity? Order is experimentally determined. Order is experimentally determined, right? Perfect. What is order? X, y. X and y we get from where? From x and y we calculate experimentally basically. So order is nothing but experimentally determined, right? Now, unlike molecularity, order can be zero. Order can be zero. Order can be positive. Order can be fractional. Unlike your molecularity, molecularity cannot be zero. It cannot be fractional. It cannot be negative. Order can be zero as well. Order can be positive as well. Order can be fractional as well. Let me tell you, order with respect to any reactant, order with respect to any reactant can be negative, but overall order of the reaction can never be negative. What does that mean? What does that mean? This X and Y. X is order with respect to A. Y is order with respect to B. So X individually can be negative. Y individually can be negative, but X plus Y, you can never find negative. X plus Y can never be negative. X plus Y can never be negative. X plus Y can never be negative. Perfect. Remember, this is very important. Order can be zero, order can be positive, order can be fractional. Order with respect to any reactant can be negative, but the overall order of the reaction can never be negative. And this is again one more important point. For an elementary reaction, order is equal to molecularity. Now, how can you justify this statement? This is important. For an elementary reaction, order is equal to molecularity. Let's say I've got the reaction like this. 2A plus B, it gives C. I'm assuming that the reaction is elementary. I'm assuming that the reaction is elementary. If the reaction is elementary, that means this molecularity is defined. So what is going to be the molecularity? 2 plus 1 makes it 3. So molecularity is 3, right? Now I want to calculate order of this reaction as well. I want to calculate order of this reaction as well. In order to calculate order, what do I need to write? I need to write rate law. R is equal to K. Concentration of A raised power X. Concentration of B raised power Y. This is your rate law. But you already know, I have told you, for elementary reactions, law of mass section is truly valid. That means, when you calculate X and Y experimentally, the value of X will come out to be 2 over here. The value of Y will come out to be 1 over here. So your rate law becomes K. Concentration of A raised power 2 and concentration of B raised power 1. Now, look at this particular expression. This is your rate law. This is your rate law. Tell me one thing. Order with respect to A is 2. Order with respect to B is 1. If I ask you what is the overall order of this particular reaction, it is 2 plus 1, which makes it 3. My dear students, if you look, we took an elementary reaction whose molecularity is 3, whose order is 3 as well. So do remember from now onwards, whenever you see an elementary reaction, do remember its order will be its molecularity. Right? Am I clear? Say it in the chats once. Am I clear? Say it in the chats once. The statement which I mentioned over here, what do you think? Is the statement right or wrong? A zero order reaction must be complex. It can never be elementary. Is it right? Is it right? What do you think? Say yes or no in the chats. I just want to know. Is it right statement? A zero order reaction must be complex. Is it right statement? What do you think? Is it right statement? Say it in the chats. I want you guys to be involved in the chats. I want you guys to be involved in the chats. Quickly, everyone, say it. A zero order reaction. Don't say maybe. What kind of answer this is? It's either yes or no. It is either yes or no. I want to say a lot on this maybe, but not here. Right? I want to say a lot 
on this maybe otherwise yeah maybe i'll give you some hint maybe right <clears throat> Yes or no? Quick. It's absolutely correct. Order of the reaction can, or I mean, sorry, a zero order reaction must be complex. It is never going to be elementary. It is never going to be elementary. Why is that? Have a look. If I say, if I say I've got a zero order reaction, let's say, let's say I've got a zero order reaction. That means order of this reaction, for example, is zero. Order of this reaction, for example, is zero. Order of this reaction is zero. Okay, it's a zero order reaction. If it is elementary, if 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 it is elementary, if it is elementary, then its molecularity also has to be zero. Because for elementary reactions, order and molecularity are same. But molecularity is equal to zero. Does it make any significance? No way. No way. It's not going to make any significance. Right? Because molecularity, molecularity cannot be zero. So a zero order reaction. Cannot be elementary because if it is elementary, its molecularity has to be zero, which is not possible. So it has to be complex always. Zero order reaction has to be complex always. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Now, guys, there is one more thing which I want to discuss with you first. A relation between different rate constants. A relation. This is important again. A relation between different rate constants. Till now, I only talked about the rate constant of the reaction. I only talked about the rate constant of the reaction. But there are some other rate constants as well. I'm writing a term Ka over here. Ka. This is what you call as a rate constant of the reaction. This Ka is something which I call as rate constant for disappearance of A. If I write Kb, Kb is what I call as a rate constant for disappearance of B. If I write as Kc, rate constant for appearance of C. If I write Kd, rate constant for appearance of D. Rate constant for appearance of D. These are other rate constants as well. From where they come, I'm not going to go there. I'll just you the, give you the results and we'll try to use them in the questions. Do remember one thing. Rate constant, rate constant of disappearance or appearance. Rate constant of disappearance or appearance of a reactant or a product is always equaled. Is always equaled. Rate constant of the reaction. Rate constant of the reaction. Rate constant of the reaction. Multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of that reactant or product. Multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of that reactant or product. Am I clear? Am I clear? So, if I write rate constant of disappearance of A, it will be rate constant of the reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of A, that is N1. If I write Kb, that is going to be rate constant of the reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of B. If I write Kc, it's going to be rate constant of the reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of 3, right? Do remember these particular points, they are important. Why they are important? Because of this question. Try to solve this quick, be quick, be very quick. You are given with the reaction, 2 times A plus 3 times B. It gives what? It gives C. The rate constant of the reaction is K reaction. I want to get the relation between K1, K2, K3. Now, if I want to write K1, K1 is the rate constant of disappearance of A. That is the rate constant of reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of A. K2 is nothing but rate constant of reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of B. K3 is nothing but rate constant of reaction multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of C. That's one. From this particular equation, I can say K reaction is nothing but K1 divided by 2. From this particular equation, I can say K reaction is nothing but K2 divided by 3. From this particular equation, K reaction is equal to K3. And rate constant of the reaction is always fixed. Rate constant of the reaction is always fixed. Right? At a particular temperature. So, from this particular expression, this particular expression and this particular expression. I can say K1 by K2 has to be K2 by K3 which has to be K3. K3. If you take the LCM of denominators, it's going to be 6. 
तो मल्टीप्लाई थ्रू आउट बाई सिक्स दिस बिकम्स थ्री टाइम्स के वन दिस बिकम्स टू टाइम्स के टू एंड दिस बिकम्स सिक्स टाइम्स के थ्री एम आई क्लियर एम आई क्लियर विद दिस एम आई क्लियर विद दिस सेट आई होप यू गॉर इट आई होप यू गॉर इट Yeah, perfecto, perfect, perfect, perfect. Now one more simple thing. Then we'll move on to the order in detail. One more simple thing: units of rate constant, rate constant units. Remember it directly. Let's say you got the reaction A gives B, whose order is n, whose order is n. It is the nth order reaction. Whose order is n? It can be zero, one, two, whatever. Right? My dear students, if you talk about the units of rate constant, rate constant units can be written as moles liter inverse raised to the power of 1 minus n and here i am writing the units of time let's say time is in seconds in inverse time can be minutes minute inverse r r inverse general unit of rate constant number 1 or 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 you can write the rate constant units like this as well let's say pressure is in atm it is atm raised to the power of 1 minus n let's say time is in seconds second inverse For example, you have got a zero order reaction. Let's say you have got a zero order reaction. If n is zero, one minus zero is one. So rate constant units will be. It's going to be moles liter inverse second inverse. Or if n is zero, it's going to be here atm second inverse. Perfect. Let's say you have got a first order reaction. If n is equal to one, if n is one, one minus one zero. Anything raised to the power zero is one. So k is nothing but. Second inverse or minute inverse, R inverse, whatever. From here also, you'll get second inverse only, right? If n is equal to two for the second order reaction, if n is equal to two, one minus two is minus one. One minus two is minus one. So it's going to be, it's going to be mole raised to the power minus one. It's L raised to the power minus one whole raised to the power minus one. So it's liter, and this is going to be second raised to the power minus one. Okay, perfect, right? Or from here. One minus two is minus one. One minus two is minus one. If pressure is in atm, so atm minus one, and second minus one. So accordingly, whatever is the order of the reaction, you can formulate the units of the rate constant. You can formulate the units of the rate constant. You can formulate the units of the rate constant. Perfect. Now, people, let's say I'm giving you one simple question. Can you give it a try? Can you give it a try? I am given with the reaction A gives B, whose rate constant is K. I am assuming the order of the reaction is n. Assuming that order of reaction is n. As per the question, it is found that rate doubles when the concentration is increased four times. Rate doubles when the concentration is increased four times. Calculate the order of the reaction. Now, rate doubles. What does that mean? See, first thing, first thing, write the rate law. Rate law says that R is equal to K concentration of A raised per order n. I'm calling this as equation number one. Now, as per the equation, rate is doubling. So initially it was R, now it is two R. Rate is doubling when when the concentration of A is now four times. Now it's four times A. Earlier it was A, now it's four times A. Calling this as equation number two. Calling this as equation number two. Calling this as equation number two. If I divide two with one, if I divide second by one. So R R gets cancelled. It is two on the left side. K K cancel, right? A raised power n, A raised power n cancel. So it becomes four raised power n, right? What will be the power of four such that L H S R H becomes equal? What is the power of four such that L H S R H becomes equal? So n has to be here one by two. Then only L H S R H is equal. What is n? N was nothing but order of the reaction. Done and dusted. Done and dusted. If you try to solve one more question from this, look at this again. A basic question. This is again a basic question. This is people. Again, the basic question. This is as per the question, we are given with the we are given with the reaction. I'm assuming that order of this reaction again is n. I'm assuming that order of this reaction again is n, right? First of all, if I write the rate law, it is k concentration of a raised per n raised per order, right? Now the question is saying. The rate of reaction becomes half. The rate of reaction becomes half when the volume of the vessel is doubled, right? So what I'll do, I'll write it like this: R is equal to K 
कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ ए मीन नंबर ऑफ मोल्स ऑफ ए डिवाइड बाई वॉल्यूम ऑफ वेस्टल रेस पर एन लेट्स कॉल दिस इक्वेशन नंबर वन नाउ रेट बिकम्स हाफ इन स्टेड ऑफ आर इट बिकम्स आर बाई टू वेन वेन वॉल्यूम इज डबल अर्लियर इट वॉज वी नाउ इज गोइन बी टू वी अर्लियर इट वॉज वी नाउ इज गोइन बी टू टाइम्स वी रेस पर एन वॉल्यूम दिस इक्वेशन टू डिवाइड टू विद वन और वन विद टू ट्वाइस इज यूर्स राइट If I divide one with two, what do I get? R R cancelled. Two comes up, so L H side two, right? K K cancelled. N A N A cancelled, right? So it becomes simple two raised power n, perfect. So compare this equation. N value is nothing but one, right? Rest everything is cancelled. N A by V N A by V cancelled. K K cancelled, right? So two comes up, so two raised power n. So n is one. Order of the reaction here is one. Nothing else. I hope this is again clear to everyone. Now, my dear students, one more question which is asked from order that is experimental determination of order. How do you calculate the order experimentally? This is a short, short question which is asked like this. It is a short, short question asked like this. You would have seen the questions as well. You will be given with certain experiments. By looking at the experiments, you will have to calculate what? By looking at the experiments, you will have to calculate order. How do you do it? How do you do it, people? How do you do it? Have you have you done these sort of questions? Have you done these sort of questions? Quick, let me show you their approach. There is a trick also to solve this question, but let's not go with the tricks. Let's see the general approach first, because once your general approach is clear, then only you can go for the tricks. Understand? The reaction that is given to me. This is the reaction that's given to me. Perfect. My dear students, I'll be writing the rate law for this reaction first. So R is equal to K. Concentration of NO raised power x, concentration of H2 raised power y. This is my rate law. In the first experiment, concentration of NO is kept this much, concentration of H2 is kept this much. At that point of time, rate of reaction is this much. This is the data from experiment number one. Right? This is the data for experiment number one. Let me put the data of experiment number one into this equation. As per the first experiment, rate of reaction is how much? 3 into 10 raised power minus 5 is equal to K. NO concentration was kept as 5 into 10 raised power minus 3 raised power X. H2 concentration is kept as 2.5 into 10 raised power minus 3 raised power Y. I'm calling this as equation number 1. Let me fit the second experiment data in this rate law as well. In the second experiment, rate is what? Rate is 9 into 10 raised power minus 5 is equal to K. NO concentration? In the second experiment is 15 into 10 raised power minus 3 raised power x. H2 concentration. H2 concentration is 2.5 into 10 raised power minus 3 raised power y. Calling this as equation number 2. Can't we make equation number 3? Absolutely. What will be equation number 3? It will be 36 into 10 raised power minus 5 is equal to k. 15 multiplied by 10 raised power minus 3 raised power x. 10 multiplied by 10 raised power minus 3 raised power y. This is your equation number 3. Now guys, it's nothing. It is just a matter of calculation. It is just a matter of calculation. What I'll be doing? Let me divide second equation by first equation. Second by first. This term, this term cancel. 9 by 3 is 3. On left hand side it is 3. This whole term, this whole term cancel. K, K cancel. 10 power 3, 10 power 3 cancel. 15 divided by 5 is 3. So this is 3 raised power x. Which tells you that x is nothing but 1. So you got x. Which tells you that x is 1. x is 1. Right? Now, my dear students, now, 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 if you divide 3 by 2, if you divide 3 by 2, 36 divided by 9 is 4, is the equal to, uh, this term, this term cancel, 10 power minus 3, 10 power 3 minus cancel, 10 divided by 2.5 is nothing but 4, so 4 is for y, right? So, from this particular equation, y is 1, you got x, you got y. So, what is the overall order of the reaction? Overall order of the reaction is x plus y, 1 plus 1, that's 2. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear? This is the general approach of solving these equations. By just making the equations, dividing the equations, getting x and y. I want you guys to say it in the chat, if all the things are clear till here. I want you guys, I want you guys, people, I want you guys to let me know in the chats. If all these things are absolutely clear, say it in the chats with some fire emojis. I do not want the Josh to be down, people. Right? The Josh has to be high. It's a 12-hour marathon. And if it's not getting over in 12 hours, I'll do it in 13 hours, 14 hours. But we have to be 
up all the time, yeah? We have to be up all the time. So say it in the chats, quick. I want everyone to write something in the chats. That's what will tell me basically whether you are active in the chats, whether you are listening to the class properly or not. Quick. Quick, people. Do not sleep. <laughs> okay. One question I showed you. I showed you one question with the help of what? With the help of general approach. Another question I'll show you with the help of trick. Another question I'll show you with the help of trick. Understand. This is the reaction. Okay, this is the reaction. Let me write its rate law. R is equal to K. Concentration of NO raised per X. Concentration of Cl2 raised power y. Right? This is your this is this is your rate law. You know it. Let's solve this question with the help of trick. My dear students, if you look at first and second experiment, look at them carefully. In the first and second experiment, do you see concentration of NO is kept same? Yes. In the first and second experiment, concentration of NO is kept same. So imagine NO is not here. Imagine NO is not here. Now, in the first and second experiment, concentration of Cl2 has been changed from 0 0.05 to 0 0.15. That means concentration of NO has been increased three times, right? Concentration of NO has been increased three times. And look at the rate. What has happened to the rate? Rate has also increased three times. Rate has also become three times. Concentration of Cl2 becomes three times. And rate is also becoming three times. So if this is becoming three times, this is also becoming the three times. That means power of Cl2 here should be y. Then only 3 raised power 1 comes out to be 3. If y is 2, then 3 raised power 2 should be 9. If y is 3, 3 raised power 3 should be 27. But in the question, it's mentioning that when you are making this term three times, rate is becoming three times. So power has to be 1. 3 raised power 1 is 3. If power was 2, then 3 raised power 2 has to be 9. Right? So you got the y value? Y value is 1. You got the y value, y value is 1. Right? Now, 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 now. Look at those two experiments where in the concentration of Cl2 has been kept same. If you look at experiment 1 and experiment 3, concentration of Cl2 is same. Right? But concentration of NO you are changing initially. It was 0 0.05. Now it's 0 0.015. So you are increasing the concentration of NO three times. And when you are increasing concentration of NO three times, Rate is becoming 9 times. Look, rate is becoming 9 times. When this is becoming 3 times, when you are doing making it 3 times, this is becoming 9 times. So power has to be 2. Then only 3 cos square becomes 9, right? So x value is nothing but 2. x is 2, y is 1. So 2 plus 1 is 3. Overall order of the reaction is 3. I hope all of you are clear with this particular shortcut to calculate experimentally the order of the reaction. Say yes or no in the chats. In the chats quickly. Say yes or no in the chats quickly, people. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Now something very important. <laughs> now something very important. <coughs> yeah. My dear students, there is a zero order reaction which we have to discuss in detail and different types of questions from it. Understand what is a zero order reaction. Understand what is a zero order reaction. Imagine you have got the reaction, you have got a balanced chemical equation A gives B. Understand carefully. Imagine you have got the reaction A gives B, balanced chemical equation. Its rate constant, for example, is K. I'm assuming that order of this, re this reaction is zero. Order of this reaction is zero. My dear students, let's assume that initially at time t is equal to zero, the concentration of reactant is A naught. Time t is equal to zero means the reaction has not started yet. So what is the concentration of B right now? It will be zero. It will be zero. Now, as the reaction proceeds, as the reaction proceeds, concentration of reactant will keep on decreasing. Let's assume at time T, concentration of reactant left is AT. Let's assume the concentration of product B is BT at time T. Be clear. Be clear with things. Vandana, just wait for that. Wait for that. I'll let you know what to do. When you use the stoichiometric options. Just wait for that. People, be clear, be clear with all these things. First of all, A0. What is A0? A0 is the initial concentration of reactant. 
initial concentration of reactant what is at at is the concentration of reactant left in the container at time t at time t right at time t in the time interval 0 to t in the time interval 0 to t the concentration of a reactant is changing from a naught to a t the concentration of reactant is changing from a naught to a t now if i ask you how do you write the rate of the reaction with respect to a with respect to a it's going to be minus times change in the concentration of a divided by time interval is there any other way to write rate absolutely you can use the rate law rate constant of the reaction concentration of a raised power zero anything raised power zero is one anything raised power zero is one right can i say da will be equal to minus k multiplied by dt minus k multiplied by dt if i integrate this particular equation under the limits here you are integrating with respect to time and time is going from zero to t so limits will be zero to t here you are integrating with respect to concentration of reactant and concentration of reactant is changing from a naught to at a naught to at what is integral of da integral of da is a under the limits a naught to at will be equal to minus k multiplied by t integral of dt is t perfect now people upper limit minus lower limit finally you get the expression at is equal to a naught minus kt this particular equation is something which you call as integrated rate equation for the zero order kinetics integrated rate equation for the zero order kinetics this is super important i'll be using this equation in almost all the equations of zero order right at is equal to a naught minus eight at is equal to a naught minus kt this equation number one which i would want you guys to remember right now this equation number one which i want you guys to remember right now now have you heard about something called as half-life have you heard about something called as half-life Which is represented by t1 by 2, or you can represent it with t50%. How do you define the half-life? I'm not going to derive the expression. I'm going to give you the expression and show you how to use that. What is half-life? Time taken to complete 50% of the reaction, nothing else. Time taken to complete. Time taken to complete. To complete 50 percent reaction time taken to complete 50 percent reaction is something which you call as half life and for the zero order reactions do remember t half is nothing but a naught divided by 2k this is the expression which you have to remember directly i'm not deriving this expression let's not derive them no need to do the derivation etc right perfect have you heard about something called as completion time Have you heard about something called as completion time, which is represented with T 100%? What is meant by T 100%? T 100% is nothing. It is time taken to complete 100% of the reaction. Time taken to complete. Time taken to complete 100% reaction. Time taken to complete entire reaction. In case of zero order, do remember, T half is nothing but A naught divided by K. It is nothing but A naught divided by K. Now people, sorry, it's not T half, it is T 100%, sorry. It is T 100%, time taken to complete, 100% of the zero order reaction is equal to A naught divided by K. Now my dear students, if you think carefully, if you think carefully, look at these two equations, T half and completion time. Look at T half and completion time, T half and completion time. If I divide these two equations, if I divide these two equations, I get one important equation. T 100% is equal to two times the half life. That means if you know the half life of the zero order reaction, if you know time taken to complete 50% of the zero order reaction, you can calculate time taken to time taken to complete 100% of the reaction as well. Right? Perfect. It will be two times. If I say half life of the zero order reaction is 50 minutes, that means its completion time will be 100 minutes into two. Half life of the reaction is 20 minutes. Completion time will be 40 minutes. Nothing else. I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm loud and clear. I hope I'm loud and clear, people. Right? Now, if I ask you, what are the units of rate constant? What are the units of rate constant K? 
in case of zero order you should know it now we have discussed we have discussed units of rate constant k has to be equal to it has to be equal to moles liter inverse second inverse or let's say pressure is in atm or you can say atm second inverse you can say atm second inverse my dear students if i ask you if i ask you calculate the degree of dissociation if i ask you calculate the degree of dissociation alpha in case of zero order reactions how do you calculate degree of dissociation what is mean what is what is meant by degree of dissociation it is nothing but alpha is nothing but number of moles of reactants dissociated divided by initial moles taken number of moles of reactants dissociated divided by initial moles taken number of moles of reactants getting converted into products divided by initial moles of reactants have a look if i ask you how many moles of reactants i had in the beginning a not how many are left 80 i had a not i am left with 80 so how many moles of reactants have got converted into products i had a not i am left with 80 so a not minus 80 it gives me those moles of reactants which have been converted into products it gives me those moles of reactants which have been dissociated divided by initial moles of reactants initial moles of reactants is nothing but a not if initial moles of reactant is a not people if initial moles of reactant is a not try to calculate alpha is equal to a not minus what is 80 80 is given to us as a not minus kt a not minus kt divided by what divided by a not so alpha is nothing but kt divided by a not this expression i want you guys to remember in case of zero order reactions am i clear say it am i clear people am i clear people am i clear people just a second perfect i hope all these things are clear yes and guys there is one more thing which i want you guys to remember in case of zero order reactions then i'll show you certain graphs there is one more thing which i want you guys to remember about zero order reactions examples directly it can be asked it can be asked photochemical reaction between h2cl2 it is the example of zero order reaction remember it directly right decomposition of hi over gold it is the example of zero order reaction decomposition of nh3 over molybdenum this is the example of zero order reaction so you'll be given three four reactions out of which you have to choose which one is zero order if you see any reaction of this manner photochemical reaction between h2cl2 zero order right similarly decomposition of hi over gold zero order decomposition of nh3 over molybdenum zero order remember them directly perfect remember them directly now there are certain graphs which are there in zero order let's have a look on the graphs let's have a look on the graphs my dear students i hope you remember these equations at is equal to a not minus kt right t half is equal to a not by 2k t 100% is equal to a not by k perfect t 100% is equal to 2 times the half life alpha is equal to kt divided by a not alpha is equal to kt divided by a not now 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 there are certain graphs which are related to zero order there are certain graphs which are related to zero order number 1 number 1 number 1 If you have to plot a graph between A T versus T, how the graph will look like? If you have to plot a graph between T half versus A not, how to do that? How to do that? If you have to plot a graph between T hundred percent, T hundred percent versus A not, what will be the nature of the graph? If you need to plot a graph between alpha versus alpha versus A not, right? What will be the nature of the graph? what will be the nature of the graphs first of all in order to plot a curve between at and t you know at is nothing it is a not minus kt so you are plotting at along y axis you are plotting t along x axis this becomes your m the sign here is minus and this is c y is equal to minus mx plus c y is equal to minus mx plus c y is equal to minus mx plus c 
माइनस एम एक्स प्लस सी स्ट्रेट लाइन विद नेगेटिव स्लोप राइट स्ट्रेट लाइन विद नेगेटिव स्लोप वाई इज गोल्ड एम एक्स माइनस सी सॉरी वाई इज गोल्ड माइनस एम एक्स प्लस सी वॉट अबाउट द स्लोप ऑफ दिस गर्व स्लोप इज योर एम वैल्यू एम इज नथिंग बट माइनस के वॉट अबाउट योर इंटरसेप्ट इंटरसेप्ट इज द डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम द ओरिजिन टू द पॉइंट फ्रॉम वेर द कर्व स्टार्ट दट इज ए नॉट दट इज इंटरसेप्ट दट इज इंटरसेप्ट ओके टी हाफ और इज ए नॉट यू नो ऑलरेडी यू नो ऑलरेडी टी हाफ इज नथिंग बट ए नॉट डिवाइड बाई टू के राइट और आई कैन से टी हाफ इज इक्वल लेट मी राइट इट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल ए नॉट डिवाइड बाई टू ए नॉट डिवाइड बाई टू ए नॉट डिवाइड बाई टू के परफेक्ट और लेट्स राइट इट लाइक दिस वन बाई टू के इन टू ए नॉट वन बाई टू के मल्टीप्लाइड बाई ए नॉट टी हाफ यू आर प्लॉटिंग अलॉन्ग वाई एक्सिस ए नॉट यू आर प्लॉटिंग अलॉन्ग एक्स एक्सिस दिस यूर एम वाई इज गुड एम एक्स वाई इज गुड एम एक्स मीन स्ट्रेट लाइन पासिंग थ्रू ओरिजिन वॉट अबाउट इट स्लोप देन इट्स स्लोप मीन्स एम एम इज नथिंग बट वन बाई टू के एम इज नथिंग बट वन बाई टू के सिमिलरली टी हंड्रेड परसेंट वर्स ए नॉट विल बी अगेन स्ट्रेट लाइन बट इट्स स्लोप वॉन्ट बी वन बाई टू के इट बी वन बाई के इट बी वन बाई के I got to know alpha is equal to a not. Ah, uh, sorry, alpha is equal to what was it for the reaction? It was we derived it right now. K T divided by a not. Alpha and a not they are inversely proportional to each other. Alpha a not inversely proportional to each other. Whenever you need to plot a graph between two variables which are inversely proportional to each other, the nature of the curve is hyperbola. It is hyperbola here. These are the graphs which are related to zero order reactions. Let's see what kind of questions are asked. Let's see what kind of questions are asked. my dear students this is the first question on the screen can you give it a try can you give it a try can you give it a try Yes. <clears throat> okay. Look at this particular question, guys. What the question says: For a zero order reaction, A gives B. I am given with the reaction A gives B. I am showing you the general approach. For the reaction A gives B, let's say initially at time t is equal to zero, the reactant concentration is A naught. This is zero. We know it. It was observed that it was observed that at the end of an R, it was observed that at the end of an R. Seventy-five percent of A has reacted. You tell me. It is observed after after an hour. It has been seen. Seventy-five percent of A has got converted into products. My dear students, if seventy-five percent of A has got converted into products, how much A will be left in the container at one hour? Can you say twenty-five percent will be left? If seventy-five percent of A has got converted, twenty-five percent of A will be still in the container. Twenty-five percent of A will be left in the container. Do remember, we always have to write the left-out concentration of reactant. We always have to take the left-out concentration of reactant, which is twenty-five divided by hundred into A naught, which comes out to be A naught divided by four. So this is the concentration of reactant left after one hour, and concentration of reactant left is represented by A T. So this is one condition which I have. This is one condition which I have. This is one condition which I have. Look at the second condition. As per the question, at what time? At what time? At what time? A will be ten percent unreacted. At what time? A will be ten percent unreacted. So at what time ten percent of reactant is left? We always have to take the left out concentration. So at what time ten percent of reactant is left? Let's say at time t. 10% of reactant is left which is 10 by 100 into a not which comes out to be a not by 10 right this is the concentration of reactant left at time t i am assuming at time t 10% of reactant is left we have to get this t we have to get this t now guys tell me one thing how many conditions we have we have two conditions condition 1 condition 2 i'll be writing the integrated rate equation at is equal to a not minus kt This is my integrated rate equation. Perfect. 
Now I'll be using condition one in integrate rate equation. Let's see what we'll get. AT is nothing but A naught divided by four is equal to A naught minus K. A naught minus K. T is one, right? So from here you can get the K. K comes out to be three divided by four A naught. This is your K. So by using condition one, we got the value of K. By using condition one, we got the value of K. Now I'll be using second condition in this equation. Second condition. In the second condition, AT is what? A naught by 10. Is equal to a naught minus k value we already got 3 divided by 4 a naught multiplied by t a naught a naught a naught cancelled so t will come out to be how much can you let me know it will come out to be 1.2 hours it will be coming coming out with 1.2 hours so if you do the calculation a naught a naught a naught cancelled so t comes out to be 1.2 hours what does that mean that means after 1.2 hours you will observe after 1.2 hours you will observe 10 percent of reactant will be left in the container that means 90% of the reaction would have got completed at 1.2 hours. That means 90% of the reaction would have got completed at 1.2 hours. Let me know in the chats if it's clear. Be very quick. Let me know in the chats if all these things are absolutely clear to you. Quickly people. And the ones who have not liked the session yet, I would want every one of you to like the session right now. Ah. Quick. And all those people who have not subscribed to the channel yet, do subscribe to the channel as well. I told you I'll give you the break after completion of this chapter, not now. Okay, so this is done. This is done. Look at this question. Look at this question, guys. We are given with a zero order reaction A gives B. We are given with a zero order reaction A gives B. A table is given to us. A table is given to us. At time t is equal to 0, concentration of reactant is 1 molar. So basically A0 is 1 molar. A0 is 1 molar, right? At 120 seconds, concentration of reactant left is 0 molar. Understand? At 120 seconds, concentration of reactant is 0. That means entire reactant has got converted into product. Right? If entire reactant has got converted into product, what does that mean? That means 100% reaction has got completed. Right? So time, completion time basically is given, 120 seconds. What do we have to calculate? Rate constant. Do you remember? Completion time is nothing but A0 by K. A0 by K is 120. So K will be equal to A0 divided by 120. A0 is 1. 1 divided by 120. This will be moles, liter inverse, second inverse. Because it's a zero order reaction. Done and dusted. Right? Done and dusted. Done and dusted. Again, I'm repeating. These reactions you'll be remembering from now on. Right? Someone is asking what is a zero order reaction? Zero order reaction is the one whose order is zero. Zero order reaction is the one whose order is what? Whose order is zero. Right? Rate versus concentration of reactant. Rate versus concentration of reactant. Rate versus concentration of reactant. If I want to plot this graph for a zero order reaction, your rate loss says that R is equal to K, concentration of reactant raised per zero. Anything raised per zero is one. So rate of the reaction is independent of the concentration of reactant. So if you increase or decrease the concentration of reactant, nothing happens to rate. Rate is constant. Any such reaction, any such reaction in which, any such reaction in which rate of the reaction is independent of the concentration of reactants, that's what you call a zero order reaction. That's what you call a zero order reaction. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear people? Say it quick, 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 quick. Everyone. Everyone, quick. Look at one more important thing. That is the first order reactions. First order reactions. Guys, first order reaction is the one. For example, you have got the reaction A gives B. Assume that it's a balanced chemical equation. Assume that it's a balanced chemical equation. I'm not going to derive any expression here. I'll give you the expressions and let's see how to use those expressions. Okay? Question won't be asked from derivation part. Question will be asked as a problem. Right? So I'll give you all the results here first. I'll show you all the graphs. And my dear students, and then we shall be doing the questions. 
no derivations at all now okay let's assume that order of this reaction is one order of this reaction is one okay at time t is equal to zero initial concentration of reactant is a naught this is zero at time t concentration of reactant left is at concentration of product is bt this is something which i'm assuming this is something which i'm assuming first thing first thing first thing if i want to calculate the, if i want to write the rate law rate law r is equal to k concentration of reactant raised power one this is my rate law this is my rate law this is my rate law can i say can i say order of reaction is one can i say first order reaction first order reactions are the ones in which rate of reaction varies the linearly with the concentration of reactant if you make it two times it becomes two times if you make it three times it becomes three times four times four times five times five times so basically first order reactions are the ones in which rate of reaction varies linearly with what with the concentration of reactant done now people the integrated rate equation the integrated rate equation which we had the integrated rate equation which we had in zero order there is similarly integrated rate equation in first order as well right and you have to remember those expressions at any cost and i'll show you the application part as well first expression my dear students first expression ln of at is equal to ln of a naught minus kt this is the first expression of your integrated rate equation for the first order kinetics ln of at is equal to ln of a naught minus kt remember it remember it directly in zero order it was at is equal to a naught minus kt right for example here i'm writing first order here i'm writing zero order in zero order what was the expression expression was at is equal to a naught minus kt expression was at is equal to a naught minus kt number one number two are there few more expressions for the integrated rate equation for zero order for the first order yes one expression will be log of at is equal to log of a naught minus k divided by 2.303 multiplied by t this one more expression which you will have to remember one more expression which you will have to remember one more expression people k is equal to 1 divided by t ln of a naught divided by at this is one more expression this is basically all these are integrated rate equations these are different forms of integrated rate equation of first order similarly k is equal to 2.303 divided by t it is going to be log of a naught divided by at this is one more expression this is one more expression right this is one more expression now people are there a few more expressions yes there are more yes there are more just a second just a second just a second okay so this one more expression perfect which you will have to remember one more expression people at is equal to a naught e raised power minus kt this is one more expression which is valid for the first order reactions first order kinetics right one more one more expression which you will be remembering perfect are there some other expressions yes there are more expressions do remember p half in case of first order is equal to ln of 2 divided by k or you can say 0 0.693 divided by k this is the time taken to complete 50 percent of the first order reaction Time taken to complete 50% of the first order reaction is calculated with the help of this expression. Time taken to complete 50% of the first order reaction. Right? Completion time is equal to infinite. Remember directly. Remember directly. That means a first order reaction never undergoes 100% completion. A first order reaction never undergoes. 100% completion never undergoes 100% completion do you understand that degree of dissociation alpha is equal to 1 minus e raised power minus kt degree of dissociation alpha degree of dissociation alpha is equal to, is equal to 1 minus e raised power minus kt 
in your zero order that was kt by e naught but here it is 1 minus e raised power minus kt this is one more expression which directly directly you'll have to remember uh well are there more expressions let me check uh t half we got completion time we got alpha we got alpha we got okay few more few more few more few more people time taken to complete x percent of the first order reaction for example they're asking you to calculate uh the time they are asking you, for example, calculate the time taken to complete 25% of the first order reaction. Time taken to complete 30% of the first order reaction. Time taken to complete 50% of the first order reaction. 60%, 70%. So in general, I'm giving the expression. Time taken to complete what? Time taken to complete X percent of the reaction is equal to, is equal to 2.303 divided by K. It's going to be log of 100 divided by 100 minus X. This is basically the time taken to complete, time taken to complete X percent of the reaction. Okay. In this particular expression, do you see A naught anywhere? A naught? No, you do not see A naught anywhere. So can I say time taken to complete X percent of the reaction is independent? It is independent of the initial concentration of reactant. From this statement, you'll get a question. From this statement, you'll get a question. Time taken to complete X percent of the reaction. It is independent of A naught. What it means, you'll get to know in some time. But before that, two more expressions. Time taken to complete 75% of the first order reaction. Do remember, it is two times the half life. Time taken to complete 87.5% uh, of the first order reaction. That is three times half life. Do remember, time taken to complete 99.9% .9 of the first order reaction. It is equal to 10 times the half life. Sometimes they will give you the half life of the reaction and they'll ask you directly how much time does it take to complete 75% of the reaction? How much time does it take to complete 99.9% .9 of the reaction? So directly you can use these results. Directly you can use these results, my dear students. They are super important. They are super important. Okay. Perfect. One more important thing which I'm going to give you now. Understand and remember understand and remember my dear students i'm making a table over here i'm making a table over here understand how the table looks like i'm making a table over here here i'm writing concentration of reactant concentration of reactant moles of reactant or pressure of reactant and here i'm writing here I'm writing time. So concentration of reactant versus time. Let's say at time T1, concentration of reactant was A1. Let's say at time T2, concentration of reactant was A2. Let's say at time T3, concentration of reactant is A3. Let's say at time T4, concentration of reactant is A4. Let's assume that concentration of reactant at time T1 is A1. Now at some other time T2, concentration of reactant is A2. At some other time T3, concentration of reactant is A3. Okay. Now people. Now people, try to understand. If for example, time interval is same. If time interval is same, what does that mean? That means if T2 minus T1 is equal to T3 minus T2, which is equal to T4 minus T3. If for the same time interval, if for the same time interval, A2 minus A1, comes out to be same as that of A3 minus A2. Comes out to be same as that of A4 minus A3. That means common difference is same. That means common difference is same. That means, that means these concentrations of reactants, they are forming arithmetic progression. They are forming AP. Do remember, do remember, reaction at that point of time will have the order zero. So that means this table is given for a zero order reaction. Whenever in the same time interval, the common difference of these terms is same. That means these concentrations of reactants, they are forming the arithmetic progression. Do remember at that point of time, the reaction is of the order zero. Right? And, and, if in the same time interval, if in the same time interval, A2 divided by A1 comes out to be same as that of A3 by A2, which comes out to be same as that of A4 divided by A3, which comes out to be same as that of A5 divided by A4, 
what does that mean that means common ratio is same common ratio is same what does that mean that means concentrations of reactants they are forming the geometric progression gp at that time you remember the reaction is going to be of the first order this is basically valid for the first order these are some tricks guys which i'm telling you some tricks which i'm telling you sometimes you'll be given with all these tables etc etc right you'll be given with the tables and you will be supposed to check the order of the reaction this is the way you do it but do remember do remember these things are valid only if 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 the time interval is same yes am i am i clear am i loud and clear say it in the chat quick say it in the chat quick because i need to show you certain graphs some important graphs then we'll do some questions and again i'm repeating tomorrow's session is again more important 500 extra questions from class 12th physical we are doing tomorrow people am i loud and clear here should i go to the graphs should i go to the graphs first let me show you the graphs which can be asked in the first order reactions understand the first graph which we are going to make that is going to be between ln of 80 versus t ln of 80 versus t second graph which i am taking here that is going to be between log of 80 versus t log of 80 versus t third graph which i am plotting over here that is going to be rate of reaction versus concentration of reactant This is the third graph. Next graph which I'm doing that is going to be between between what t half versus a not t half versus a not right t half versus a not. Okay, one more graph which I'm doing over here that is going to be between alpha versus a not alpha versus a not. I think these are the only graphs which we need here. Okay, one more graph is there that is going to be a t versus t a t versus t. these are the graphs which can be asked in your examination now my dear students how do you plot these graphs try to understand the first one is ln 80 versus t you know the equation ln of 80 is nothing but ln of a not minus kt this term you are plotting along y axis t you are plotting along x axis this becomes your m this becomes your c sin is minus y is equal to minus mx plus c so straight line with a negative slope if i ask you what is going to be the slope slope is nothing but minus k if i ask you what is going to be the intercept intercept is ln of a not correct intercept is c basically right absolutely in the tomorrow session pyq is also will be there don't worry pyq is also will be there ncert exercise questions will be also there all the types of the questions which can be asked tomorrow right at 10 am but i want every one of you to join that session as well it is not only for one day guys this process you have to follow for complete 30 days and trust me you are going to kill it Okay, log eighty versus t. Log eighty versus t. Log eighty versus t. You know your equation. Log of eighty is equal to log of a not minus k divided by two point three zero three multiplied by t. So this log eighty you are plotting along y axis. So this is your x axis. This is your m. The sign is minus, and this is c. Y is equal to minus an x plus c. Straight line with the negative slope, and slope over here is nothing but minus k divided by two point three zero three and the intercept over here is a log of a not correct simple look at this rate versus concentration of reactant you know for the first order reaction r is equal to k multiplied by concentration of reactant raised to the power 1 because order is 1 this you are plotting along y axis this you are plotting along x axis so this becomes m y is equal to mx straight line passing through origin if i ask you about the slope slope is m m is k done and dusted right T half versus A not. T half versus A not. For the first order reaction, you know T half is equal to zero point six nine three divided by k. So T half it is independent of A not, right? In this equation, there is no A not, so it's a straight line, independent, right? Alpha versus A not. We got to know alpha is equal to one minus e raised to the power minus kt for first order, right? There is no A not here, independent, independent, right? A T versus T. I told you already, A T is equal to A not. A T is equal to A not e raised to the power minus k t. So A T you are plotting along y axis, t you are plotting along x axis. Can I say this equation has the format of e raised to the power minus x? 
Y is equal to e raised per minus x. Y is equal to e raised per minus x. Somewhere you would have studied e raised per minus x. Exponentially decreasing. Exponentially decreasing. Exponentially decreasing. If I ask you whether this curve will touch the time axis, understand. If this curve touches the time axis, at that point, AT value will be zero. What is AT? Concentration of reactant left. So at that point, concentration of reactant left will be zero. What does that mean? That means 100% of reactant has got converted into product. What, what does that mean? That means reaction has got 100% completed, but a first order reaction never undergoes 100% completion. So this particular graph, it's not going to touch the time axis. It will touch the time axis at infinity. Right? It will touch the time axis at infinity. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Say it in the charts if it is clear. Yes, all these sessions are super important and nothing will be asked apart from these sessions. Mark my words. Tell me first of all, quickly. Is it clear? People quick, be quick. Is everything clear? Okay. So these were some important graphs. So this curve is not going to touch. It's not going to touch the time axis here. It will touch time axis at infinity. Right? Because a first order reaction takes infinite time to complete. Right? It takes infinite time to complete. Or you can say a first order reaction never undergoes 100% completion. Perfecto. Let's have a look on some important things, people. Let's have a look on some important things. Do you remember I made you write a statement like 10 minutes ago? I told you. I told you time taken to complete X percent. Time taken to complete X percent. Time taken to complete X percent of the first order reaction is independent of the initial concentration. Is independent of the initial concentration. What does that mean? Try to understand. Imagine you have got the reaction A gives B. And I'm writing the same reaction again, A gives B. Okay. Let's say I took the initial concentration of reactant as 2 molar here. Let's say I took the initial concentration of reactant as 2 molar. And I got to know, I got to know that this reaction, I got to know, for example, 10% of this reaction is getting completed in 20 minutes. Let's say I observed it. And the reaction is first order. I observed one thing, guys. For example, I took the initial concentration of reactant 2 molar. And I observed 10% of reaction getting completed in 20 minutes. Now, people, in the same reaction, Whatever initial concentration of reactant you take, whether you take it 10 molar, 20 molar, do remember 10% of this reaction will be still completed in 20 minutes only. That is the meaning of the statement which I gave you. Time taken to complete a certain percentage of the reaction. Time taken to complete X percent of the reaction. Time taken to complete a certain percentage of the reaction is independent of the initial concentration. Okay, now solve this question. What should be the answer? The question is, you have got some reaction, some catalytic decomposition of something, something, right? As per the reaction, it follows the first order kinetics. As per the question, when the initial concentration is 200 molar, it was observed that 73% decomposed. That means 73% of the reaction was getting completed in 100 minutes. 73% of the reaction was getting completed in 100 minutes. Now, as per the question, as per the question, if we take the initial concentration as 600 molar in the same reaction, how much percentage of the reaction will get complete in 100 minutes? I'll say in 100 minutes, same 73% of the reaction will get, com will get completed. Right? Is there anything? Why, why would you use equations in this question? I hope you got to know. Right? If you understood that statement which I gave you, there is no need to use equations. Otherwise, if you want to use equations, you can do that. It will take some 5 minutes. Right? Perfect. I believe it's clear. So whatever initial concentration you keep, you keep, it's going to be same. Same percentage of reaction gets complete in same time. Nothing else apart from that. Okay, this was question number one. Can you solve this question? <clears throat> if you have clear eye, if you have clear eye on what? If you have clear eye on the expression which I gave you, you won't take a lot of time to solve this question. A first order reaction is 75% complete in 100 minutes. 
फर्स्ट ऑर्डर रिएक्शन इज सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट कंप्लीटेड इन हंड्रेड मिनट कैलकुलेट द टाइम टेकन टू कंप्लीट एटी सेवन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द रिएक्शन टाइम टेकन टू कंप्लीट एटी सेवन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द रिएक्शन यू मस्ट बी नोइंग बाई नाउ टाइम टेकन टू कंप्लीट एटी सेवन परसेंट ऑफ द रिएक्शन इज नथिंग बट थ्री थ्री टाइम्स हाफ लाइफ थ्री टाइम्स हाफ लाइफ परफेक्ट थ्री टी सेवेंटी फाइव इज गिवन वॉट इज टी सेवेंटी फाइव इट इज टू टाइम्स हाफ लाइफ Two times half life is hundred minutes, so half life is nothing but fifty minutes. If I got the half life, so can't I write it as three multiplied by fifty? That is going to be one fifty minutes. Done and dusted. Yes, done and dusted. Look at this particular equation. You are given the reaction x gives y plus z. Half life of the reaction is given. Okay, half life is given. Ten minutes. in what in what period of time would the concentration of x be reduced to 10% think over it and let me know the question is saying in what period of time will the will the concentration of reactant left be 10% what does that mean how much reaction should get completed how much percentage of reaction has to get completed as per the question tell me that How much percentage of reaction has to get completed? Tell me that, quick. Guys, it's evident. If ten percent of the reactant has to left in the container, if ten percent of the reaction has to be there in the container, it is only possible if ninety percent reaction gets completed. So basically, in short, we have to calculate time taken to complete ninety percent of the reaction. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? we have to calculate time taken to complete 90% of the reaction now in the question it's not mentioned whether the reaction is zero order or first order but if you see one thing it is mentioned that the reaction is elementary it is mentioned that the reaction is elementary and you know or the elementary reactions order is equal to molecularity order is equal to molecularity what is molecularity one order of the reaction is one so this reaction follows the first order kinetics can understand if it follows the first order kinetics t half is nothing but 0.693 divided by k that is 10 so k has to be equal to 0.0693 and it's going to be minute inverse and if you got k how much percentage of reaction has to get completed 90% that means x is 90 here and you know time taken to complete x percent of the reaction is nothing but 2.303 divided by k log of 100 divided by 100 minus x put x value over here as 90 so you will get the time taken to complete 90% of the reaction Which is two point three zero three divided by zero point zero six nine three. It's going to be log of hundred divided by hundred minus ninety is ten. Log of ten is one. So this term is one. And when you solve this two point three zero three divided by zero point zero six nine three, how much is coming out to be? Three plus thing. It's coming out to be thirty three. So the answer is going to be thirty three minutes. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. This sort of equation can be asked. Look at one more type of equation, guys. The graph is between log eighty versus t. We have made this graph by the way. Log eighty versus t. Few minutes back we made that graph, and the slope of that graph. If you remember, that was minus k divided by two point three zero three. That was minus k divided by two point three zero three. And what means? What is slope? Slope is tan of theta. Slope is tan of theta. What is theta? Theta is the angle which the graph, which the tangent makes with the positive x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. So theta is one thirty-five. It is given. So tan of one thirty-five is minus one. Minus one is equal to minus k divided by two point three zero three, which implies that k is nothing but two point three zero three. What are the units of time? Minutes. So it is minute inverse. It is minute inverse. So we got to know the value of k. But but but, are we supposed to calculate the value of k? No. We are supposed to calculate half life. How do we get the half life for first order reactions? Zero point six nine three divided by k. It is zero point six nine three divided by k value is how much? 2.303. The value will be, I believe, it's going to be 0.3, right? Am I clear with this question as well? <clears throat> Am I clear with this question as well? Say it in the chats, quick. Say it in the chats, quick, guys. Quick, quick, everyone. Okay. One last question in the first order kinetics. 
One last question in the first order kinetics. Understand? In what time will the molar ratio? In what time will the molar ratio of ethylene to cyclobutane? This is your cyclobutane. This is your ethylene. In what time will the molar ratio of ethylene to cyclobutane be one? K is given. Its unit is second inverse. That means the reaction has to be first order. Understood? Reaction has to be first order. Now he is saying that, see you know, as the reaction starts, moles of reactants decrease and moles of products will increase. Moles of reactants decrease and moles of products will increase. Can I say there will be a scenario when moles of reactants and products will be same? When the moles of reactant keeps on decreasing with time and moles of products will keep on increasing with time. Can I say there will be a scenario when moles of reactants and products will become equal? Will become equal. And when the moles of reactant and product becomes equal, at that time, the ratio of moles of reactant and product becomes 1. Question is asking, at what time, at what time, the ratio of moles of reactant and product becomes 1? Or in short, the question is saying, at what time, the moles of reactant and product becomes equal? You understand? At what time, the moles of reactant and product becomes equal? Understand how to solve this. Imagine at time t is equal to 0. I have a moles of this. This is 0. Let's say at time t. Let's say at time t. Out of a moles of reactant, x got converted into product. So I'll be left with a minus x. Now if one mole gives two moles, x are going to give 2x. x will give 2x. This is understood. x will give 2x. I'm assuming this is the time. This is the time at which the moles of reactants and products are becoming equal. That means this is the time at which the ratio of their moles of reactants and products that becomes 1. I'm assuming that. Let's assume this is the time when the moles of reactants and products are becoming equal. Okay. If the moles of reactants products are becoming equal, A minus X is equal to X. So A is equal to what? Uh, just a second guys. Okay, a is equal to 3x, right? And x will be how much? x will be a divided by 3. Right? x will be a divided by 3. x will be a divided by 3. Uh, just a second, this is a minus x, this is 2. Uh, a minus x, 1 mole gives 2 moles, x will give 2x, right? So this is the time when their moles are equal, Right? This is the time when the molar ratio becomes 1. So a minus x divided by 2x is equal to 1. So a minus x is equal to x. So a is nothing but 3x. x is equal to a divided by 3. Okay. x is equal to a divided by 3. We got till now x is equal to a divided by 3. Perfect. a is already given. I'll be using the integrated rate equation. Any form. One form is t is equal to 2.303 divided by k log of a0 divided by at. This is one of the forms. This is one of the forms, people. So T we have to calculate 2.303 divided by K. What is K? K is 2.3 into 10 raised power minus 4. Log of A0 means initial moles of reactant divided by AT means moles of reactant left at time T A minus X. So A minus A by 3 comes out to be 2A by 3. Right? So A gets cancelled out. 2.3, 2.3 cancelled out. So T is equal to 10 raised power minus 4 goes up. Log of 3 by 2 which means log of 3 minus log of 2. Right? So t is nothing but 10 raised to the power 4. Log of 3 is 0 0.47. Log of 2 is 0 0.3. So t comes out to be 1700 seconds. Can you let me know what is meant by 1700 seconds? Can you let me know what is meant by 1700 seconds? I'll say after 1700 seconds, you will observe the moles of reactants and products becoming equal. At 1700 seconds, you will observe that the ratio of the moles of reactants and products are becoming 1. Say it in the chats, everybody. Say it in the chats, everybody. Say it in the chats, everyone. Quick. Quick. Say it in the chats, everyone. Quick. Quick, people. Quick.
I want you guys to, I want everyone to say it people. Everyone means everyone. Right? Do not die. You are dying. You are dying. Do not die at all. I am not going to let you guys die. I won't let you guys die soon. Right? It'll slowly make you die. Yeah? And that's more dangerous. You know it. Quick, quick. Everyone. <clears throat> Perfect. Perfect. The Josh has to be high, guys. Break will be after 30 to 45 minutes or maybe one hour because it will not take more than one hour to complete this chapter now. It will not take more than one hour to complete this chapter. Then I'll give a break for 20 minutes. We'll be back straight away after 20 minutes. Notes for this session I'll give you in this telegram. If you're not there, t.me slash w-a-s-s-i-m-s-i-r-c-h-e-m. This is my telegram where I'll be sharing the notes afterwards. Okay. Perfect. One thing which I would want to discuss with you that is again important and from that questions are asked. From that questions are asked. Understand. Understand guys. You got in your zero order reactions for your zero order reactions T half is equal to A naught divided by 2K. For the first order reactions T half is equal to 0 0.693 divided by K. This is valid for zero order reaction. This is valid for first order. Right? In general, can I say, in general, can I say T half is directly proportional to A naught raised power 1 minus N? Let's check it. If N is 0, so T half is directly proportional to A naught. T half is directly proportional to A naught. If N is 1, if N is 1, 1 minus 1, 0. Anything raised power 0 is 1. So T half is independent of A naught. Is this statement valid? Yes, this statement is absolutely valid. This statement is absolutely valid. Number one. From this particular statement, you can make an equation, guys, which you'll be using frequently. Right? From that equation, frequently questions have been asked. For example, for example, for example, you have got the reaction. For example, you have got the reaction. A gives B. Order of this reaction is N. Understand, order of this reaction is N. When I am keeping the initial concentration of reactant as A01, at that point of time, half-life of the reaction is T half 1. Understand. When I am keeping the initial concentration of reactant as A02, half-life is T half of 2. Half-life is T half of 2. Right? The question says calculate the order of the reaction. This has been from last three years continuously been asked in your mains examination, JE mains. So surely it will be asked in your NEET as well. You know this is directly proportional to this. So you can categorically say one thing. You can categorically make one equation over here. And what is that equation going to be? It's going to be T half 1 divided by T half 2 is going to be equal to is going to be equal. It is directly proportional. So A01, A01 divided by A02 whole raised power, whole raised power, whole raised power what? Whole raised power 1 minus n. Remember this particular equation, this is frequently asked. We have got, we have got 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. We have got 5 terms here. Out of 5 terms, 4 terms will be given. You will be supposed to calculate the fifth one. Right? You'll be supposed to calculate the fifth one. Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this, people? Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this particular thing? Say yes or no, quick. All right, one more thing, one more thing. You know, T half is directly proportional to this. Can I say T half will be equal to uh, constant K multiplied by A naught whole raised power 1 minus N? If I multiply throughout by log, 
it becomes log of t half is equal to log of k plus 1 minus n log of a naught right if i multiply through by log perfect and do a bit of calculation now just do one thing just plot a graph between log of t half versus what versus log of a naught just plot this graph this is y this log of a naught is x right this is m this is c y is equal to m x plus c y is equal to mx plus c what about the slope slope is nothing but 1 minus n what about the intercept intercept is nothing but log of k sometimes you will be given a curve like this sometimes you will be given a curve like this you will be given with the slope from the slope you have to get the n value you can do that that means from the slope of this curve you are calculating the order of the reaction isn't it simple guys isn't it very simple right remember this particular thing as well these are some extra features which i wanted to share with you right by means of which you can calculate order right either from this or from this perfect now have you heard about something called as collision theory have you heard about something called as collision theory I am going to keep it very simple. You will love it. Very simple, I am going to keep it. Have you heard about something called as collision theory? Say it in the chats, quick. Quick, guys. Everyone. Everyone. Guys, again, I am telling you extra questions I will be doing tomorrow. Extra 500 questions. Do not worry. Don't think I am showing less questions or what. Anyways, I am going to show you all the types. More 500 will be done tomorrow. Do not worry. Perfect. Let's have a look on the collision theory, guys. I'll keep it very short, precise, to the point, and whatever can be asked, I'm going to let you know, let you know about that. Okay? Try to understand. As per your collision theory is concerned, as per your collision theory is concerned, for the reaction to happen, for the reaction to happen, for the reactants to get converted into products. For the reactants to get converted into products. The reacting species. That means the reactants. They should collide first. The reactant species. They should collide first. They should collide first. Not every collision. Not every collision. Between the reactants leads to the formation of products not every collision between the reactants leads to the formation of products there are only a particular set of collisions between the reactants which will lead to the formation of products and those collisions you call as the effective collisions those collisions you call as the effective collisions so for the reaction to happen, reactant species, they have to collide first. Not all the collisions, I'm writing it over here. Not all the collisions. Not all the collisions between the reactants. Between the reactants leads to the formation of products. Leads to the formation of products. Only few collisions. Only few collisions between the reactants. Only few collisions between the reactants. Between the reactants. Leads to the formation of products. Leads to product formation. Leads to product formation. And we call those collisions as effective collisions. We call those collisions as effective collisions. Now for the collision to be effective. For the collision to be effective. Two factors are going to come into play. Two factors are going to play a role for the collision between the reactants to be effective. One is called as energy factor. One is called as energy factor. One is called as orientation factor. These two factors are going to decide whether collision between the reactant is effective or not. These two factors are going to decide whether Due to the collision between the reactants, products are going to get formed or not. So, in short, these two factors are going to let you know whether the 
collision is going to be effective or not okay whether the collision is going to be effective or not one is energy factor one is orientation factor now what this energy factor is all about what this energy factor is all about let's talk about this energy factor in detail let's talk about this energy factor in detail energy factor is one of the factors which is going to decide whether the collision between the reactants is going to be effective or not my dear students for example you have got the reaction a gives b you have got the reaction a gives b assume that the reaction is endothermic in nature assume that the reaction is endothermic in nature if the reaction is endothermic if the reaction is endothermic its delta h has to be positive its delta h has to be positive its delta h has to be positive right now my dear students as per energy factor is concerned for this collision to be effective the reacting species have to collide the reacting species these a particles they will have to collide in such a way that they form a complex activated complex as per energy factor once the activated complex is formed it breaks down into products it breaks down into products as per energy factor energy of the activated complex is very high is very high therefore its stability is less if its stability is less it breaks down into the products it breaks down into the products initially let's assume energy of reactant was er right and ep represents your energy of products for example for example as per energy factor is concerned the collision will be only effective if the reacting species collide in such a manner they form the activated complex right which breaks down into the products further try to understand what it means my dear students let's say i'm plotting energy versus progress of reaction let's say i'm plotting energy versus progress of reaction initially at time t is equal to 0 what did we have initially at time t is equal to 0 we had reactants energy of reactant was er right for example this point represents energy of reactants now as per energy factor these reacting species have to collide form the activated complex whose energy is more so they have to form the activated complex whose energy is more right this point represents your activated complex once activated complex breaks down once activated complex is formed it breaks down into products since i am talking about endothermic reaction so let's say this point represent your products right and over here it represents your energy of products energy of products perfect energy of products energy of products now my dear students delta h which is basically ep minus er you can say it right it has to be positive it has to be positive means ep has to be greater than er you know it that's why i showed energy of products more than that of energy of reactants ep minus er is something which you call as delta h ep is the energy gap from here to here from here to here it's energy gap ep minus er that means this particular gap that means this particular gap this particular energy gap it gives you delta h ep minus er ep minus er ep minus er right now my dear students i can say it like this now i can say it like this i can say as per the energy factor for the reaction to happen the reactants how to cross this barrier the reactants how to cross this barrier imagine this is a mountain you have to cross this mountain then only you can form the product i'll say reactants how to cross this energy barrier then only they can get converted into products then only they can get converted into products now not all the reactants will have sufficient energy to cross this barrier not all the reactants will have sufficient energy to cross this barrier right not all the reactants will have sufficient energy to cross the barrier remember the minimum amount of energy which is required to the reactants the minimum amount of energy which is required to the reactants so that they can cross the barrier 
so that they can form the activate complex and activate complex breaks down further. That is something which you call as activation energy. That is something which you call as activation energy. That minimum energy which that minimum extra energy I would say. That minimum extra energy I would say. That minimum extra energy which is required for the product formation. Right? That's what you call as activation energy. Perfect? Guys, if you understand and analyze things, if you understand and analyze things, at time t is equal to zero, I had reactant. Now, how much extra energy I have to give to reactants so that they form the activate complex? I'll say this energy gap, this energy gap, this energy gap. Is that minimum extra energy which I have to give to reactants? Then only they can form the products. Then only they can form the activate complex and that gets broken down into products. So this energy gap is something which I call as activation energy of forward reaction. It's called as activation energy of forward reaction. Now, if you talk about the backward reaction, for the backward reaction, this B is your reactant and A is your product. For the backward reaction to happen, for the backward reaction to happen, this is the reactant. So these reactants have to collide and form the activate complex and activate complex then gets broken down into A. Then only I will say as per energy factor, backward reaction will happen. Right? Now, that minimum extra energy which has to be given to the product so that it forms the reactant, that minimum extra energy which has to be given, the product, given to the product side so that activate complex gets formed and it breaks down into products. That minimum extra energy is basically this gap which I'm talking about. Is this gap which I'm talking about. That is something which you call as activation energy of backward reaction. If you observe this energy gap delta H, this energy gap delta H. And I say this delta H will be equal to EAF minus this energy gap which is EAB. So do remember from this particular equation, question is asked. Delta H is equal to EAF minus EAB. From this particular expression, question is asked. And in your last year NEET examination, it was asked. It was asked. Okay. Now my dear students, few more important things which I'm going to tell you here. Few more important things which I'm going to tell you here. What is that? How many fraction of molecules? Fraction of molecules. Or leave the fraction of molecules aside. I'll make one criteria. Can I say as per energy factor? As per energy factor. Those reacting species, those reacting species, which have got energy, greater or equal to this barrier can cross this barrier, can form the product. Can I say that? Can I say that? Can I say that? I'll say those fraction of molecules which have got energy greater or equal to activation energy, greater or equal to activation energy can cross the barrier. Crosses the barrier as per which factor? As per energy factor. As per energy factor. And at that point of time, we say collision is effective. Collision is effective as per which factor? As per energy factor. So, as per energy factor for the collision to be effective. As per energy factor for the collision to be effective. For the collision to be effective, I'll write it. For the collision, as per energy factor for the collision. To be effective for the collision to be effective, energy of the reacting species has to be greater or equal to activation energy. As per energy factor for the collision to be effective, as per energy factor, okay, energy of reactant should be greater or equal to activation energy. Now, fraction of molecules, fraction of molecules which have got energy greater or equal to activation energy is always equal to E raised power minus Ea divided by R2. If you ask me, how many fraction of molecules are those? How many fraction of molecules are those which have got energy greater or equal to activation energy? If you ask me, how many fraction of molecules are those which cross the barrier as per energy factor? If you ask me, how many fraction of molecules are those which collide effectively as per energy factor? I'll say this term. Which is what you call as Boltzmann's factor. Which is what you call as Boltzmann's factor. 
right? It is going to, this term is going to give you an idea about those fractional molecules which can cross the barrier. Can I say, can I say more the value of this term, more the value of this term, more molecules can cross the barrier? And if more molecules cross the barrier, more will be the product formation. If more is the product formation, more is the rate of reaction. So can I say rate of reaction is directly related to Boltzmann's factor? Right? Can I say that? Yes, I can say that. Point number one. Point number two. There is something called as collision frequency, which I'm representing with ZAB. Collision frequency. This is what your NCRT says. Collision frequency. How do you define the collision frequency? How do you define the collision frequency? How do you define the collision frequency? How do you define it? Number of collisions. Number of collisions happening between the reacting species per unit volume per unit time. Number of collisions happening between the reactant species per unit volume per unit time. Right? Perfect. So, it is basically collision frequency over here. I can say it, these are the fraction of, I mean, those fraction of collisions which are happening in unit volume, in unit time. That defines the collision frequency. Now, you analyze one thing and understand. If collision frequency is more, if collision frequency is more, can I say more collisions will happen between reacting species? Yes, more collisions will happen. More collisions will happen between reactants. If more collisions are happening between the reactants, if more collisions are happening between the reactants, can I say more is the probability of effective collision? Can I say more will be the rate of reaction? So, rate of reaction is also directly proportional to collision frequency. I can say that. I can say that. Right? Now, which factor is left? Orientation factor is left. Orientation factor is left. Orientation factor again plays a role. Orientation factor again plays a role. Orientation factor again plays a role in order to decide whether the collision is effective or not. What is meant by this particular term? Try to understand. For example, you would have studied in your organic chemistry. Let's say this H, H, H and I. I am taking a nucleophile. I am taking a nucleophile. Now this nucleophile, it has got two ways to attack. It can attack either from front side or can attack from back side. Right? Perfect. Since this is delta negative, this is delta positive. So this carbon is electron deficient center. It can attack here from front side or back side. This is the front side attack. This is the back side attack. Now, over here you have got iodine. It's bulky. When this nucleophile comes from the front side, between the bulky ones, there will be repulsion, strike steric hindrance. Right? But if it comes from the back side, Less steric hindrance. Less steric hindrance. So which attack is feasible? Backside attack is feasible. So will the collision happen? Collision can happen in two ways. Either from front, front side or from back side. Backside attack. Backside collision. Should I be calling the collision happening with the proper orientation? Wherein the steric hindrance is less. Repulsions are less. Right? And over here, front side attack. Repulsions more. So improper orientation. Improper orientation. Right? And orientation factor says that collision should happen in such a manner wherein steric hindrance has to be less. So in short, collision has to happen with proper orientation. Perfect. Collision has to have be collision has to happen with the proper orientation. Yes? Is it clear, guys? Is it clear? Say it. Say it in the chats quickly. <clears throat> so only one factor, only energy factor cannot decide whether a collision is effective or not. This also plays a vital role. Right? Both the factors has to favor. So for the collision to be effective, you know, for the collision to be effective, one factor is energy factor. One factor is your energy factor which plays a role. And one factor is your orientation factor. 
वन फैक्टर इज योर ओरिएंटेशन फैक्टर एज पर एनर्जी फैक्टर एनर्जी ऑफ रिएक्टन शुड बी ग्रेटर एक्टिवेशन एनर्जी राइट परफेक्ट एज पर ओरिएंटेशन फैक्टर कोलिजन टू हैपन विद प्रॉपर ओरिएंटेशन इफ दिस फैक्टर फेवर्स इफ दिस फैक्टर फेवर्स if this factor energy factor favors and orientation factor if it is not favoring if collision is not happening with proper orientation collision won't be effective so my point of conveying is my, my point over here is both the factors should favor first energy of reactant should be greater or equal to equation energy and collision has to happen with proper orientation both the ones should favor then only the collision will be effective otherwise not otherwise not one equation which i want to give you here rate of reaction already i told you it is directly proportional to zab it is directly proportional to e raised power minus ea by rt right so in this particular equation is there anything missing the term which accounts for orientation factor that's missing so i'll be using that term as well so this is one equation which you get from collision theory mm -hmm. r is the rate of the reaction r is the rate of the reaction this accounts for the orientation factor perfect this is what you call as collision frequency collision frequency and this is what you call as boltzmann's factor boltzmann's factor i believe it is clear to everyone right perfect and guys one more thing over here i made the graph for endothermic you could have made the graph for exothermic as well what will happen in exothermic this curve will come down like this energy of product will be less than energy of reactant because delta h is negative for exothermic reaction okay i hope i am clear to everyone i hope i am clear to everyone <clears throat> i hope i am clear to everyone okay so basically this is the curve for endothermic and this is the curve for exothermic the curve goes down that's all rest everything is same delta h is equal to eaf minus eab yeah perfect the last topic which we have to discuss over here that is what you call as arrhenius equation arrhenius equation from arrhenius equation you'll get to know how rate constant depends on temperature right guys half an hour more for this chapter we'll take a break for 20 minutes okay Half an hour more. As per Arrhenius equation, your rate constant of the reaction K is equal to A e raised power minus E A divided by R T. So first of all, this is your Arrhenius equation. First of all, this is your Arrhenius equation. This A over here is what you call as pre-exponential factor. This is your pre-exponential factor number one. Number two, E A is what you call as activation energy. A and E A collectively are called as Arrhenius parameters. Collectively called as Arrhenius parameters, and E raised power minus E A divided by R T is what you call as Boltzmann's factor. Boltzmann's factor, okay? Boltzmann's factor. Now we will try to understand. Try to understand one thing. Let's say I got the reaction. Whose temperature you are increasing? You are increasing the temperature of the reaction. If you are increasing the temperature of the reaction, what will happen to this value? E divided by R T. If temperature is increasing, that means denominator is increasing. If denominator is increasing, this whole term will be decreasing. This whole term is decreasing. If this whole term is decreasing, if this whole term is decreasing, if I multiply it with minus sign, so minus E A divided by R T. What happens to this term? This term will increase. This term will increase. If this term is increasing, if this term is increasing, that means A multiplied by this will also also increase, and K value will eventually increase. So do remember your rate constant of the reaction that is directly proportional to temperature, right? Rate constant of forward as well as backward reaction increases. Rate constant of forward as well as backward reaction increases with the increase in temperature. With the increase in temperature, with the increase in temperature, number one. With the increase in temperature, okay. With the increase in temperature, 
do remember do remember on increasing the temperature by 10 degree when you increase the temperature of the reaction by 10 degree rate constant doubles or becomes even more or becomes even more so that means if the reaction is carried out at temperature t if it is rate constant is k now at temperature t plus 10 the rate constant is either going to be 2k or slightly more than this or slightly more than this or slightly more than this right or slightly more than this i'm going to write an explanation here on increasing on increasing the temperature on increasing the temperature of the reaction by 10 degree rate constant doubles or becomes even more or becomes even more why because on increasing the temperature because on increasing the temperature the fraction of molecules the fraction of reacting molecules which have got energy greater or equal to activation those increase and hence rate of the reaction increases hence rate of the reaction increases hence rate of the reaction increases right and my dear students here i am going to define a term that's called as temperature coefficient which i'm representing with n which i'm representing with n how do you define the temperature coefficient it is defined as rate constant of the reaction at temperature t divided by sorry rate constant of the reaction at temperature t plus 10 degree divided by rate constant of the same reaction rate constant of the same reaction at temperature t so tell me one thing you tell me one thing n value will be equal to rate constant at temperature t imagine that is k rate constant at temperature t plus 10 so it has to be it would have doubled it would have got doubled right or slightly more i'm assuming it is doubled it is 2k so kk got cancelled so rate i mean temperature coefficient over here came out to be how much it came out to be 2 temperature coefficient over here came out to be 2 right can i say temperature coefficient its value will be always greater or equal to 2 less than 3 because in some reactions when you increase the temperature by 10 degree rate constant becomes double in some reaction it becomes even more than that it becomes even more than that i believe i'm clear I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Right? Because rate constant at temperature T, I, for example, made that as K. And rate constant at temperature T plus 10. For example, that's 2K. K, K gets cancelled and eventually N value comes out be 2. I hope it's clear to everyone. Can I say it in the chats quick? If it is clear? If it is clear? right there is one more question which can be asked here what is that understand for example you have got the reaction a gives b you have got the reaction a gives b okay a gives b is the reaction let's say at temperature t1 rate of the reaction is r1 let's say at temperature t2 rate of reaction is r2 how do you relate them how do you relate them do remember R2 divided by R1 will be equal to 2 times delta T. Delta T is T2 minus T1. Delta T divided by, divided by 10. This is one very important expression. Why is it important? For example, I am giving you one simple question. For example, I am giving you some simple question. Let's say you have got the reaction A gives B. Its initial temperature is let's say 10 degree. Right? And you are increasing its temperature to 100 degree. I'm asking you how many times rate has increased. Let's assume that at temperature T1 and temperature T2. Let's assume that at temperature T1, rate was R1. At temperature T2, rate is R2. So you know R2 divided by R1 is equal to 2 raised power. Delta T, final minus initial, 90 divided by 10. So R2 is equal to 2 raised power 9 times R1. So rate has increased 2 raised power 9 times. Did you get it? Rate has increased 
टू रेज पार नाइन टाइम्स दीज सॉर्ट ऑफ क्वेश्चन आर आस्ट दीज सॉर्ट ऑफ क्वेश्चन आर आस्ट ओके Now, since we are talking about the Arrhenius equation, as per Arrhenius equation, k is nothing but a e raised power minus e a divided by r t. If I multiply from ln on both the sides, you get something like this. You get something like this. So I can say ln of k is equal to ln of a plus ln of e raised power minus e a divided by r t. So here I can say ln of k is equal to ln of a. Minus e a divided by r t after doing a lot of calculations, right? Because ln of e is one, so this is one more equation which represents your Arrhenius equation, the ln form. If you want to write the log form, ln of k is nothing; it is two point three zero three log of k, right? Ln of a is nothing; it is two point three zero three log of a, log of a minus what? Minus e a divided by r t. If I divide throughout by two point three zero three. it becomes log of k is equal to log of a minus e a divided by 2.303 r multiplied by t this is one more equation which you can remember one more equation which you have have to remember right now people from these particular equations what kind of graphs can be asked the first graph related to this can be ln k versus 1 by t ln k versus 1 by t ln k you are plotting along y axis 1 by t you are plotting along x axis So this is y. This one by t is x. One by t is x, right? This is m. This is minus. This is c. Y is equal to minus mx plus c. Straight line with negative slope. What about the slope of this particular curve? It will be minus e a divided by r. For example, let's say you got the equation like this. So ln of k, sorry, not ln of k. Let's say you need to make a graph between log k versus one by t. Log k versus one by t. Again, the graph is going to be same. Again, the graph is going to be same, but the slope at this particular point of time will be different. It is minus e a divided by two point three zero three r. Minus e a divided by two point three zero three r. Perfect. Right. And one more equation, guys, which I would want you guys to remember directly. I'm not going to derive that. This particular equation. Right. This particular equation. Log of k two by k one is equal to e a divided by two point three zero three r t two minus t one divided by t one t two. This again one equation. and when it's when is it valid for example you have got the reaction a gives b this is the reaction for example at temperature t1 rate constant of the reaction is k1 at temperature t2 rate constant of the reaction is k2 let's say activation energy of the reaction is ea perfect over here you can use this particular expression to calculate anything whatever is asked okay perfect guys whatever is asked you can calculate that from here I believe I'm clear to all the students. I believe I'm clear to all the students. Can you give this question a try? Can you give this question a try? Calculate the activation energy of the reaction. Log of k versus one by t curve is given. Log of k versus one by t is given. Few minutes back we made this curve and we got to know its slope is how much? Its slope is minus e a divided by two point three zero three r. What is slope? Slope is tan of theta. So tan of theta will be minus e a. Divided by two point three zero three r. As per the question, your theta is tan inverse three. That tan was minus three. That means tan of theta will be minus three. Tan of theta will be minus three. So tan of theta here is minus three. So minus three is nothing. It is minus e a divided by two point three zero three r. Or you can say e a is equal to three two zero six point nine zero nine r. Right? This is e a. This is e a. E a is equal to this much. You got to know your activation energy is nothing but It is six point nine zero nine multiplied by r. Now the question says, question says calculate the activation energy in kilojoules. So put the value of r in joules. Six point nine zero nine multiplied by eight point three one four. This is joules per kelvin per mole. But I want kilojoules. So divide by thousand. Now it's going to be kilojoules per mole. First question answer. Second, kilo calories. Put the value of r in calories. So six point nine point nine zero nine multiplied by r value in calories is two. Two calories per kelvin per mole. Now this term is in calories, but I want in kilo calories. So divide by thousand. Now this term is going to be in kilo calories per mole as well. Okay, perfect. Right. So this question is done and dusted. Guys, look at this question and say whether you can solve this or not. Just tell me you can whether you can solve it or not. Temperature T one, temperature T two is given. 
रेट कॉन्स्टेंट के वन के टू इज गिवन यू हैव टू कैलकुलेट द एक्टिवेशन एनर्जी ऑफ द रिएक्शन कैन इट बी डन कैन इट बी डन से येस और नो कैन इट बी डन फ्रॉम दिस पर्टिकुलर इक्वेशन राइट के वन के टू इज गिवन A1, K2 is given, T1, T2 is is given. given. From this particular equation, you just have to calculate EA. Nothing else. I think I'm loud and clear. Perfect. And one last thing I would want to share with you. What is that? Effect of positive and negative catalyst. Effect of positive and negative catalyst. Or you can say effect of catalyst and inhibitor. What a catalyst does. What a catalyst does. For example, I'm taking an endothermic reaction. I'm taking an endothermic reaction. Let's say this energy versus progress of reaction. Progress of reaction. Let's say the path in absence of catalyst is this. This is the path in absence of catalyst. Okay? In absence. In absence of catalyst. Now, in presence of positive catalyst, what positive catalyst does? Positive catalyst speeds up the reaction. It speeds up the reaction. Negative catalyst, it decreases the speed of the reaction. Perfect. Now you tell me one thing. What positive catalyst will do actually? Will it increase? Will it increase or decrease the barrier? Positive catalyst, it speeds up the reaction. That means it decreases the barrier so that more molecules can cross that barrier. So a positive catalyst, its path will be like this. Right? This is in presence of positive catalyst. So in presence of negative catalyst, what's going to happen? Negative catalyst, it decreases the speed. That means less molecules pass the barrier. If less molecules are crossing the barrier, that means, that means the barrier is up. This is in presence of the negative catalyst. So do remember one simple thing. Positive catalyst decreases the activation energy barrier negative catalyst increases the activation energy barrier right activation energy of forward as well as backward perfect of forward as well as backward perfect but do remember catalyst be it positive or negative does not change the delta H for the reaction. Delta H for the reaction. One more thing. A positive catalyst. Positive catalyst. Right? Increases the rate constant of forward as well as backward reaction by equal amount. A positive catalyst increases. Catalyst always increases the rate constant, right? And it increases the rate constant of forward as well as backward reaction. Perfect by equal amounts. And therefore, reaction happens quickly. Perfect. So tell me now, with this your kinetics part is over. Now it is the time for electrochemistry. So I am giving you the break till... You guys have your lunch quickly, but I would want one promise from you that you guys will be back on time. Because if I saw students less, I might cancel the session. You know, you know it, right? What time you'll be back? How, how, many, how, many, how many minutes do you need? How many minutes do you need? How many minutes do you need? Quickly. It's 1.40 right now. So, break till... 2.10. Okay. So session will start at 2.10. Okay guys, you have your lunch quickly. You have your lunch quickly. And we'll start electrochemistry right after that. So 20 minutes is more than sufficient for the break. Be back on time. And I believe you're promising me for that. Yeah?
आई बिलीव यूर प्रॉम मी फॉर दैट ओके चलो गाइस टेक केयर यू गाइस हैव योर लंच आई जस्ट वॉश माई फेस एवरीथिंग राइट एंड आई बी बैक सी यू सी यू इन सम टाइम
<laughs> everyone got back? Is everyone back? Is everyone back? Let me know once, let me know once. Just a second, people. <laughs> <clears throat> yes so what's up how are you all doing can you all see me by the way oh, just a second <clears throat> just a second just a second <clears throat> so now it is the time for electrochemistry to get done and dusted right but before starting this particular session i mean before starting this particular chapter let me know once in the chats the chemical kinetic chapter is it absolutely clear guys tomorrow you have to join the session on priority. Extra 500 questions we are going to do tomorrow. You get that? If by chance in this particular session, if we are like doing some lesser number of questions, that does not matter. Because tomorrow's day is completely for question practice. So do not worry at all. Maybe you might think in one topic, in some topic, I might do some less problems. Reason is tomorrow, it is a question practice session. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so once I would want from everyone, whatever topics we have discussed till now, from chemical context, what is every single thing like damn clear? <clears throat> Honestly, you can let me know in the chats quickly so that I can start this particular chapter. <clears throat> I would want answers from everyone. And everyone means everyone, yeah? Right? <clears throat> no, no, no need to study chemical kinetics from the NCRT. This much, whatever I've taught you, this much is enough. And tomorrow's problem practice session, more than sufficient. Nothing else you are supposed to do. Okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Today we shall be doing class 12th entire physical chemistry. Sir, do you know Shimon sir? Shimon is one of my very close friends. Shimon and me, we have started the teaching career together from Chennai. Right? Ask him. Ask him. Okay. Perfect, perfect. I think everyone got back. So let's get going, let's get started. Mm. My dear students, you know, electrochemistry, it is linked with redox reactions. So in the chapter electrochemistry, there are some things which are prerequisites to start this particular chapter. And those prerequisite things are from redox reaction. So I'll clear certain basic things from the redox reactions which we use in the chapter electrochemistry. So have a proper eye on the things which I'm going to tell you now. And remember them and take a note of every single thing with me. So people, there is a term which you all must be knowing. That is oxidation. How do you define the term oxidation? There are a lot of ways by means of which you can define oxidation. I just need one way. Oxidation means... <clears throat> Oxidation means loss of electrons. Oxidation means loss of electrons. Whenever you see an element undergoing increase in the oxidation state, whenever you see an element undergoing increase in the oxidation state, understand that element is undergoing oxidation. Remember that element is undergoing oxidation. And oxidation always takes place at anode. 
ऑक्सीडेशन ऑलवेज टेक्स प्लेस एट एनोड पॉइंट नंबर वन पॉइंट नंबर टू पॉइंट नंबर टू देर इज समथिंग विच यू ऑल मस्ट बी नोइंग रिडक्शन 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 इन वॉल्स वॉट रिडक्शन इन वॉल्स गेन ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन्स वेन एवर यू सी एन एलिमेंट अंडर गोइंग डिक्रीज इन द ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट understand that element is undergoing reduction and reduction always takes place at cathode reduction always takes place at cathode at the same time that particular element which undergoes oxidation that is what you call as a reducing agent that particular species which undergoes oxidation that is what you will be calling as reducing agent that particular species which undergoes oxidation that's called as a reducing agent that particular species which undergoes reduction that's what you'll be calling as oxidizing agent now what is meant by these two terms try to understand carefully my dear students <clears throat> if you look at this particular reaction let's say zinc solid plus copper di positive let's say it gives zinc di positive aqueous plus copper solid this is the reaction this is the reaction for example if i ask you is there any charge on zinc no its oxidation state is zero is there any charge on copper yes its oxidation state is plus 2 is there any charge on zinc yes its oxidation state is plus 2 is there any charge on copper no its oxidation state is zero now tell me one thing initial oxidation state of zinc is zero final is plus 2 whether the oxidation state of zinc is increasing or decreasing 0 to plus 2 means increase in the oxidation state increase in the oxidation state is what you call as oxidation so zinc is undergoing oxidation oxidation means loss of electrons so i would say zinc is losing electrons zinc is losing electrons that particular species which undergoes oxidation that is what you call as reducing agent so zinc is reducing agent here zinc is reducing agent here similarly check the oxidation state of copper is it increasing or decreasing plus 2 to 0 plus 2 to 0 decrease in the oxidation state decrease in the oxidation state is something which you call as reduction so i would say this copper di positive is undergoing reduction reduction means what reduction means gain of electrons reduction means gain of electrons and that species which undergoes reduction that is what you call as oxidizing agent am i clear say yes or no in the chats quickly say yes or no in the chats quickly am i clear with all these things if i am clear with all these things can you answer me can you answer me for this particular reaction <clears throat> i am writing a reaction cr2o7 di negative plus fe di positive it gives cr tri positive plus fe tri positive assume that this is the reaction you need to identify all the things <laughs> see guys when you calculate the oxidation state of chromium you should know it how to calculate 2x minus 14 is equal to minus 2 so oxidation state of chromium is plus 6 iron here is plus 2 chromium here is plus 3 iron here is plus 3 now tell me all the things is the oxidation state of chromium decreasing yes oxidation state of chromium is decreasing plus 6 to plus 3 decrease in the oxidation state is what you call as a reduction so i would say the cr2o7 di negative it's undergoing reduction a reduction involves gain of electrons so cr2o7 di negative is gaining electrons that species which undergoes reduction that will be called as the oxidizing agent oxidizing agent similarly iron Plus two to plus three, increase in the oxidation state. Increase in the oxidation state is what you call as oxidation. So Fe di positive is undergoing oxidation. If it is undergoing oxidation, it will be losing electrons. It will be losing electrons, and that species which undergoes oxidation and behaves like the reducing agent. Am I clear with this? This is my point number one. Point number two. Point number two. How do you make an electrode? Point number two: How do you make an electrode? Let me give you the idea of how do you make an electrode. Try to understand carefully. For example, for example, my dear students, imagine that I have to make a zinc electrode. 
imagine that I have to make a zinc electrode. Now the point is how do we make it? How do we make it? This is again important. What I'll be doing, I will be taking a container. And in this particular container, I am going to take an electrolyte. I am going to take an electrolyte. Electrolyte which I am taking over here, for example, that is zinc sulfate. That is zinc sulfate. Now this zinc sulfate, imagine it is undergoing dissociation as zinc di positive and SO4 di negative. So can I say in this particular container which you have, you have got two types of ions here, zinc di positives and SO4 di negatives. Now what I am going to do, I am going to introduce a zinc rod here in this container. I'm going to introduce a zinc rod, a rod made up of zinc atoms. I introduced zinc rod into a solution containing its own ions. You get it? I took a rod, I took a zinc rod, and I introduced the zinc rod in a solution containing its own ions. This complete setup over here, I'll be calling a zinc electrode. This complete setup over here, I'll be calling a zinc electrode. For example, you have to make copper electrode. What you will do? You will take copper rod, insert that copper rod in a solution containing its own ions. This complete setup is called as copper electrode. Am I clear with this? Yes, uh, Sravanti, yes, yes. Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this, people? Say yes or no in the chats. Say yes or no in the chats quickly. Yeah. Yes, notes will be available after the class on my telegram t.me t.me slash w a s s i m s i r c h e m. Okay. <coughs> I hope I'm clear with all these things. Now. One more thing, one more thing which I would want to share with you. My dear students, for example, I have to make an hydrogen electrode. Let's say I have to make the hydrogen electrode. Perfect. First of all, its actual construction, how this is formed, how this hydrogen electrode is formed, that I'll let you know in some time. But right here, briefly I'll tell you how hydrogen electrode is made. Just briefly. In detailed format, I'll let you know in, in another uh, 30 to 40 minutes. See guys, what I'll be taking, I'll be taking a platinum rod. This is a platinum rod. This is a platinum rod. Now, my dear students, there is one property of platinum. If you keep hydrogen gas in the vicinity of platinum, if you keep hydrogen gas in the vicinity of platinum, these hydrogen gas molecules are adsorbed on the surface of platinum. They are adsorbed on the surface of platinum. They are adsorbed on the surface of platinum. Now, when the complete hydrogen gas is adsorbed on the surface of platinum, now tell me, is this go rod going to look like platinum or it will look like a hydrogen rod? Because its entire surface is covered with what? Its entire surface is covered with hydrogen gas. So, it, this was a platinum rod, right? Now, imagine entire surface is covered with hydrogen gas. Now, from outside, it does not look like a platinum rod to me. It looks like a hydrogen rod to me, right? It looks like a hydrogen rod to me and I'm going to insert the same rod in the solution. I'm going to insert the same rod in the solution containing which ions? Containing H positive ions. Containing H positive ions. Hydrogen rod has been inserted in a solution containing its own ions. You'll be calling this setup as hydrogen electrode. So this is your hydrogen electrode. This was just the basics which was required. Okay. Now I'm going away going right here to the actual topic which we have to discuss. I hope this basic stuff is clear. <coughs> I hope this basic stuff is clear. Now guys try to understand. The topic which we are going to discuss here, which is our first topic, that is Daniel's cell. Daniel's cell. Daniel's cell my dear students. Few points which you need to remember about Daniel's cell. It is the example of what? It is a typical example of the galvanic cell. It is the typical example of what? It is a typical example of galvanic cell. 
what galvanic cell does galvanic cell converts chemical energy into the electrical energy galvanic cell it converts chemical energy into electrical energy therefore this daniel cell is going to convert chemical energy into electrical energy how exactly you will get the idea in some time number 1 number 2 number 2 <clears throat> number 2 in the daniel cell i'll be using two electrodes one is going to be your zinc electrode one is going to be your copper electrode zinc electrode and copper electrode i'll be using two electrodes here zinc and copper if you compare zinc with copper if you compare zinc with copper zinc is considered to be comparatively more electropositive zinc is considered to be comparatively more electropositive and copper comparatively will be less electropositive the one which is more electropositive will lose electrons the one which is less electropositive it's going to gain electrons here right loss of electrons is something which you call as oxidation and oxidation takes place at anode perfect gain of electrons is terms termed as reduction and reduction takes place at cathode so my dear students do remember over here do remember over here your zinc electrode it behaves like the anode and your copper electrode it is going to behave like the cathode in case of your daniel cell first two points zinc electrode is going to behave like the anode at which oxidation takes place your copper electrode is going to behave like the cathode at which reduction takes place now how this cell exactly looks like try to understand carefully this is one container which i took and in this particular container what did i do i am going to keep zinc sulfate this zinc sulfate has undergone complete dissociation imagine that so you have got zinc di positives and so4 di negatives in this container you have got equal number of cations and anions in this container. Therefore, this solution right now is electrically neutral. Now, in this solution, you are inserting a zinc rod. You have inserted over here a zinc rod. Perfect. Can I say this setup is your basically zinc electrode? This is your zinc electrode. In the similar way, I am taking one more container. And in this particular container, what do we keep? In this particular container, I am keeping copper sulfate. Copper sulfate. I'm assuming that it has undergone dissociation and it has got converted into copper dipositive and SO4 negative. I'm assuming that in this particular container, what do we have? We have got equal number of cations and anions. Therefore, this solution again right now is electrically neutral. And in this one, I'm inserting a copper rod. This particular setup I'm calling as electrode. So how many electrodes we have? We have two electrodes. One is your zinc electrode. One is your copper electrode. Now, my dear students, I am going to connect these electrodes externally with the help of emitter. Externally, I connected them with the help of emitter. And my dear students, internally, internally, I am using an inverted U-type tube. I am using an inverted U-type tube over here. I am using an inverted U-type tube, right? What do we have in this inverted U-type tube? My dear students, in this inverted U-type tube, you are going to keep an inert electrolyte. You are going to keep an inert electrolyte like, like K2SO4, which will be mixed, which will be mixed with gelatin, which will be mixed with gelatin or agar agar, which will be mixed with gelatin or agar agar, right? And when you mix inert electrolyte with gelatin or agar agar, it gives you a jelly-like paste and that jelly-like paste I have kept inside this particular inverted U-type tube and I am, I am sealing the ends of this U-tube by cotton balls. These ends are sealed with the help of cotton balls. Now, if I ask you, which all ions are there in this inverted U-type tube? I have kept K2SO4. That means in this inverted U-type tube, there are SO4 dinegatives and K positives in this inverted U-type tube. And this inverted U-type tube is something which you call a salt bridge. This is something which you call a salt bridge. Now, my dear students, 
you know in your daniel cell your zinc electrode it behaves like the anode and your copper electrode it behaves like the cathode it behaves like the cathode and you know at anode what happens at anode oxidation happens oxidation involves loss of electrons at cathode reduction happens reduction happen involves gain of electrons you know it now if i ask you if i ask you what is happening at zinc electrode what will happen at zinc electrode what will happen at anode you will say at anode oxidation is going to take place right this rod is made up of zinc atoms those zinc atoms will undergo oxidation right they will lose electrons since the rod is made up made up of zinc atoms and those zinc atoms will lose electrons will get converted into zinc dipositive aqueous and how many electrons one zinc atom has lost the rod is made up of zinc atoms one zinc atom is losing two electrons getting converted into zinc dipositive and these two electrons are accumulated on this rod similarly this zinc dipositive it is going to enter into the solution the rod is making up zinc atoms when one zinc atom undergoes oxidation it gets converted into zinc dipositive plus two electrons two electrons are accumulated on the rod and extra zinc dipositive it's going to enter into the solution right initially the solution was neutral now when extra zinc dipositive enters into the solution effectively solution gets positive charge right similarly when one more zinc atom undergoes oxidation two more electrons are accumulated one more zinc dipositive will go here similarly when one more zinc atom undergoes oxidation similarly electrons will be accumulated on this rod if electrons are accumulated on this rod can i say this rod carries a negative charge yes the anodic rod it carries a negative charge perfect now what is going to happen at cathode at cathode do remember reduction takes place at cathode reduction takes place reduction means gain of electrons reduction means gain of electrons now in this particular solution there were copper dipositives and so4 dinegatives the copper dipositive which was there in the solution the copper dipositive is going to collide with this rod is going to collide with this rod and will take two electrons from rod copper dipositive aqueous which was there in the solution it collided with the rod took two electrons from the rod and got converted into copper solid and that copper solid will be deposited slowly on this rod that copper solid will be deposited on this particular rod now my dear students i got to know the reaction taking place at anode reaction taking place at cathode if i ask you if i ask you what will be the net reaction here what will be the net reaction here what you'll be doing you'll be adding these two reactions but remember you won't add these reactions until the electrons in both the reactions are equal but right now electrons in both the reactions are equal right you can directly add them if electrons were not equal you were not supposed to add them you were supposed to you were supposed to you were supposed to make the electrons equal someone is saying why agar agar bro you don't have time to think about all these things why agar agar why this why that whatever i'm teaching you right remember it this will be asked in your neat examination why this why that that time has gone okay you were supposed to ask this question before one year or two years perfect i hope i'm clear loud and clear okay so i'll be adding these two reactions so these two electrons gets cancel out so my net reaction is going to be zinc solid plus copper dipositive aqueous it gives zinc dipositive aqueous plus copper solid this is my net reaction this is my net reaction this is my net reaction if i ask you how many electrons got cancelled out two electrons two electrons n value here is 2 what is n n represents number of moles of electrons exchanged number of moles of electrons exchanged number of moles of electrons exchanged now i'm asking you a question i'm asking you a question the copper dipositive which was there in the solution it collided with the rod it took two electrons from the rod that means from the rod electrons are being snatched so can i say rod will acquire positive charge do remember the cathodic rod here carries the positive charge perfect now my dear students if you look carefully electrons are accumulated on this rod this rod carries positive charge path is already made can i say since this positive and these electrons right can i say path is already made electrons are going to show the moment from anode to cathode 
perfect because positive here electrons here right electrons will start moving from anode to cathode now tell me one thing is it only the moment of electrons no it is not only the moment of electrons it is the moment of electrons in a particular direction and whenever charge moves in a particular direction current is generated right perfect current is generated perfect that's what i told you what's the work of the daniel cell to convert chemical energy into electrical energy that's how current is produced in the daniel cell i hope you got it so the first question which is asked what is the direction of electrons the direction of electrons is from anode to cathode and whatever will be the direction of electrons opposite to that will be the direction of current so what will be the direction of current current direction will be from cathode to anode current direction will be from cathode to anode right now people at the same time at the same time if i ask you if i ask you what is happening to this rod with time the rod was made up of zinc atoms those zinc atoms are continuously undergoing oxidation getting converted into zinc dipositives those zinc dipositives are getting into the solution and a rod can i say thickness of this rod will decrease with time similarly copper atoms are being accumulated on this rod so thickness of this copper rod increase with time this is one more conclusion which you can draw from here right do you remember zinc rod it is thickness it is thickness decrease with time and copper rod it is thickness increase with time this one more conclusion which you can draw from here how many moles of electrons exchanged from anode to cathode two moles of electrons are being exchanged perfect right i hope you got to know how this daniel cell works how current is produced over here now my dear students over here i've used a salt bridge now if you ask me sir what is the use of this salt bridge why did we use the salt bridge try to understand carefully try to understand carefully the solutions which i took in the beginning they were electrically neutral in this solution extra zinc dipositives are coming due to which positive charge is getting developed here this solution in the beginning contained equal number of cations and anions so the solution was neutral in the beginning now what happened after that copper dipositives in the solution they collided with the rod they took two electrons from the rod got converted into copper solid that copper solid got accumulated on the rod due to which what happened to the concentration of copper dipositives in this container concentration amount number of copper dipositive in this container it decreased if copper dipositives decrease in this container can i say copper dipositives decreased but so4 dinegatives are same in number right can i say this solution effectively got negative charge as soon as this solution gets positive this solution gets negative as soon as this solution gets positive at the same time so4 dinegatives will come from the salt bridge will neutralize the solution as soon as negative charge gets developed here k positives from the salt bridge will come from here and will neutralize the solution so the first and the important use of the salt bridge can i say it maintains the electrical neutrality of both the solutions yes can i say it maintains the electrical neutrality of both the solutions your salt bridge your salt bridge your salt bridge it maintains electrical neutrality of both the solutions number 1 number 2 number 2 if you look at this particular scenario what did salt bridge do externally i completed the circuit with the help of ammeter and internally i completed the circuit with the help of the salt bridge so salt bridge it what it does it completes your internal circuit as well it completes your internal circuit as well now if a question is asked whether a daniel cell can work without salt bridge the answer is yes the answer is yes without salt bridge also daniel cell can work how exactly i'll tell you that in some time this is something very important salt bridge it avoids the liquid junction potential now what is meant by that liquid junction potential try to understand that carefully try to understand that carefully <clears throat> see guys over here for example i am taking a bigger size container this is one bigger size container okay and in this bigger si what just happened my god electricity is gone but i feel it's okay you can see me can you can you see the screen can you see the screen say it say it in the chats you can see the screen right so no issues 
तो नो इश्यूज राइट कोई भूत भूत नहीं आएगा चिल चिल ओके लेट्स कंटिन्यू लेट्स कंटिन्यू ओके लेट्स अब लुक सो माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स आई टू का बिगर साइज कंटेनर ओवर हेयर एंड व्हाट एम आई प्लानिंग टू डू आई एम गोइंग टू डिवाइड दिस बिगर साइज कंटेनर इनटू टू इक्वल पार्ट्स I divided this bigger size container into two equal parts with the help of what? With the help of semi-permeable membrane. With the help of semi-permeable membrane. In this part of the container, in this chamber, in this particular chamber, what exactly am I doing? I am going to keep zinc sulfate. I have kept zinc sulfate in this chamber, and that zinc sulfate, you know it already. It got converted into zinc di positives and SO4 di negatives. There are equal number of cations and anions here. Equal number of cations and anions here, right? Okay. Now, my dear students, in this right chamber, in this right chamber, what do we have exactly? I am going to keep copper sulfate, and I'm assuming this copper sulfate has completely got dissociated into copper di positive and SO four di negative. Due to which, this right chambered solution is electrically neutral. Equal number of cations and anions here in the right chamber as well. Equal number of copper di positives and SO four di negatives, right? Now, my dear students, what exactly I'm planning to do? I am going to keep a zinc rod here. It is a zinc rod. I am going to insert a copper rod here in this particular chamber. In this particular chamber, this is copper rod. Let me just do one thing. Let me let me connect them externally with the help of emitter. I connected them. My dear students, if you look carefully, externally the circuit is complete. and internally also the circuit is complete because the two solutions they are in direct contact they are in direct contact in each other so externally as well as internally circuit is complete right externally as well as internally circuit is complete now what is going to happen this zinc will again behave this behave in the same way as anode this copper is going to behave in the same way as cathode right what is going to happen this solution was electrically neutral now the rod is made up of zinc atoms those zinc atoms will undergo oxidation will get converted into zinc di positive that extra zinc di positive is going to enter into this solution due to which this solution effectively got positive charge because of the oxidation of the zinc atom from the rod now this solution it contained equal number of cations and anions equal number of copper di positives and so forth di negatives what happened copper di positive is going to collide with the rod will take two electrons from the rod and will get converted into copper solid that copper solid will accumulate on the rod but what is happening in this right chamber the amount the number of cu di positives are decreasing but but so4 di negatives are remaining the same due to which the solution effectively got negative charge now positive here negative here can i see they'll attract can i see they'll attract when they attract positive for example comes here negative comes here similarly one more positive here one more negative here One more positive here, one more negative here. One more positive here, one more negative here. One more positive here, one more negative here. Now tell me, at this particular junction, if you look at this junction, on the left side of this junction, what do we have? On the left side of this particular junction, we have got the positive potential. On right side of this junction, we have got the negative potential. Can I say at this junction, potential difference is getting created? At this junction, potential difference is getting created, and this potential difference, which is created at the junction. this is something which is what you call as liquid junction potential this is something which you call as liquid junction potential now my dear students if you do not use the salt bridge if you do not use the salt bridge till you can complete the circuit still the cell will work but liquid junction potential will arise liquid junction potential will arise now you tell me one thing if i would have used the salt bridge what would have happened if i would have used the salt bridge what would have happened if i would have used the salt bridge the moment when positive charge got developed in the container at the same time from the salt bridge so4 di negatives would have come would have neutralized this similarly the moment negative charge got created here from the salt bridge k positives would have come and neutralized this due to which there was no generation of positive and negative charges if there was no generation of positive negative charges i'll say this liquid junction potential 
would have got avoided. So, can I say, with the help of salt bridge, with the help of salt bridge, liquid junction potential is avoided. Right? So, salt bridge avoids the liquid junction potential. Do remember this particular point. At the same time, which inert electrolytes can we use? We can use NH4NO3, KNO3, NH4Cl, KCl, K2SO4. These are all the inert electrolytes which we can use in the salt bridge. Right? But those inert electrolytes, you have to mix with gelatin. Okay? Now, my dear students, there's a way. There's a way. There's a way to represent the galvanic cells. There's a way to represent the galvanic cells. How do we represent the galvanic cells? Cell representation. Cell representation. Before talking about the cell representation, please and please look at this particular slide and tell me whether all these things are clear. Tell me whether all these things are clear. Zinc electrode anode, oxidation loss of electrons. Direction of electrons from anode to cathode. Direction of current from cathode to anode. Zinc electrode keeps on dissolving. Thickness of copper electrode increases. Are all these points clear? If yes, let me know quickly in the chats. Quickly. I want everyone to say it. Guys, do not die. I want the Josh to be high. I want the Josh to be high. So I want every one of you to write something in the chats. Anything, whatever you want to write. I want the chats to flow continuously. I want the chats to flow continuously. Which will let me know. <clears throat> perfect, perfect, perfect. <clears throat> perfect. All right, how do you represent the cells? Guys, there is one simple way by means of which you can represent the cells. You'll keep two lines in the middle which will represent your salt bridge. Two lines in the middle which will represent your salt bridge. On the left side of the salt bridge, you'll be always writing anode. On the right side of the salt bridge, you'll be always writing cathode. That's it. Rest everything you know. Rest everything you know. At anode, what happens? Oxidation. At cathode, what happens? Reduction. Rest everything you know. For example, let me show you how do you represent few cells. Let's say this is one of the net reactions which is taking place in some Daniel cell, in some galvanic cell. Let's say this is some reaction. This is some net reaction which is taking place in the, gal in the galvanic cell. Now, now my dear students, how do I represent it? How do I represent it? First thing, what is the oxidation state of zinc here? Zero. Oxidation state of copper here, plus two. Oxidation state of this zinc, plus two. Oxidation state of copper here, zero. Now, first thing I believe you already know how to identify which one undergoes oxidation, which one undergoes reduction. This is something which undergoes oxidation. Increase in the oxidation state. Decrease in the oxidation state means reduction. So I got to know which is undergoing oxidation, which is undergoing reduction. Now people, two lines in the middle, salt bridge. On the left side, write the anode. You know, oxidation takes place at anode. Cathode, a reduction takes place at cathode. On the left side, I'll be writing the anode. At anode, what is happening? Zinc is getting converted into zinc diposter. At anode, zinc is getting converted into zinc diposter. So your zinc solid is getting converted into what? Zinc diposter aqueous. Now tell me, is the state of both of them same or different? This is solid, this is aqueous. State is different. When state is different, when phase is different, when phase is different, when phase is, phase is different, you'll be drawing a single line. If phase was same, if phase was same, then you are not supposed to draw this single line. You are supposed to separate them with the help of comma. You are supposed to separate them with the help of comma. So this is your, this is your anode. Now, on the right side, I'll be writing cathode. At cathode, what happens? Reduction. Copper dipositive gets converted into copper solid. Copper dipositive is getting converted into what? Copper solid. 
Now again, the phase is different. So single line. So you have successfully represented a, a galvanic cell whose net reaction was given to us. You have successfully represented the galvanic cell whose net reaction was given to us. Am I loud and clear? Am I loud and clear, people? Let me give one more example. One more example, which will make it absolutely clear. First thing, oxidation state here is zero. Oxidation state here is plus two. Oxidation state here is plus two. Oxidation state here is zero. Now you know what to do. You know what to do. Zero to plus two, increase in the oxidation state. Means oxidation takes place at anode. Plus two to zero, decrease in the oxidation state. Decrease in the oxidation state is reduction. Reduction takes place at cathode. In the middle, two lines representing solid bridge. On the left side, anode. At anode, oxidation is taking place. Fe is getting converted into Fe dipositive. So your Fe solid is getting converted into Fe dipositive aqueous. Phase is different, so single line. On right side, cathode. Cathode. At cathode, what is happening? Reduction. Reduction of what? Cu dipositive. Cu dipositive aqueous is getting converted into what? Is getting converted into copper solid. Phase is different, single line. You have again successfully represented the galvanic cell whose net reaction was given. One more example. One more example, people. See, first of all, now you can clearly identify this your anode at which oxidation takes place and this your cathode. And you know how to do it now. You know how to do it. Now, people, two lines representing solid bridge. Left side, anode. At anode, sink solid is getting converted into what? Sink solid is getting converted into zinc dipositive aqueous. Now tell me one thing. Is the phase same or different? Phase is different. If phase is different, single line. On right side, cathode. At cathode, what is happening? H positive, getting converted into H2 gas. So H positive aqueous is getting converted into H2 gas. Check the phase. Phase is different, single line. But, 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 tell me one thing. Can we make the hydrogen electrode normally or do we have to use something? I'll be writing comma platinum solid. Platinum solid was used to make this electrode. Do you remember? Do you remember people? Do you remember? Quick. <clears throat> Quick. I hope from now onwards, you can easily do the representation of these galvanic cells. Now comes the most important part of this chapter. See guys, from this chapter, whenever a question is asked, most of the times the question will be asked from the EMF part, Nernest equation part. And whatever I'm going to teach you right now, if you did not understand that, if you do not understand that, you can never understand the Nernest equation. Whatever I'm going to teach you now, if you don't understand that, you can never understand the Nernest equation. So whatever I'm going to teach you now, please and please understand it properly. I'm marking the heading as how to write the cell reactions. How to write the cell reactions from a given cell. From a given cell. I'll take the first example which is very simple, zinc solid, zinc dipositive aqueous, solid bridge, copper dipositive, copper solid. This is my cell, right? This is my cell. Now, my dear students, now, my dear students, can we write the reaction taking place at anode? Yes, we can do. At anode, zinc is getting converted into zinc dipositive. So, I'll say zinc solid will be losing two electrons. Zinc solid will be losing two electrons and will be getting converted into zinc dipositive. Correct? And how exactly I got to know it's losing two electrons? Understand. Initial oxidation state was zero. It is plus two final. Initial final. Final minus initial. Final minus initial is coming out to be two. Zero to plus two means increase. Increase means oxidation. So when zinc is getting converted into zinc dipositive, it is undergoing oxidation. It is losing electrons. How many? Final minus initial two, losing two electrons. Simple. Similarly, at cathode, at cathode, what happens? Reduction takes place. Reduction. So this is plus two, plus two to zero, plus two to zero. Decrease. Decrease means reduction. 
Reduction means gain of electrons. So basically, when copper dipositive aqueous is getting converted into copper solid, is getting converted into copper solid, it will be gaining electrons. How many? Final minus initial, two. So it is gaining two electrons. Now, if I ask you whether electrons in both the reactions are balanced or not, absolutely electrons in both the reactions are balanced. So you can directly add them. When you directly add them, what is the net reaction which you get over here? Zinc solid, copper dipositive aqueous. It gives zinc dipositive aqueous plus copper solid. This is my net reaction. This is my net reaction. And my dear students, if this is my net reaction, can we do one thing? Can we write? Can you let me know how many moles of electrons got exchanged in the net cell reaction? I'll say two moles of electrons got exchanged in the net cell reaction. One more point. If I ask you how to write the reaction quotient of this particular reaction. Reaction quotient. Let me show you how do we write the reaction quotient. My dear students, whenever you have to write the reaction quotient, you'll be always starting with the product. You'll be always starting with the product. If the product is an aqueous state, you will use its concentration. So concentration of zinc dipositive. Raised power stoichiometric option. This product is in solid state. Its active mass is unity. Leave that. Divided by a reactant side. This is in solid state. Its active mass is unity. Leave it. This is an aqueous state. So I'll have to take its concentration. So this is how you write QC expression as well. So these three things are really important. Number one, number one, getting the N value, getting the net cell reaction, getting the QC value. If I'm clear, let me know once in the chats. Let me know once in the chats if I'm absolutely clear to you. Quick. <clears throat> Quick, guys. Assume that this is your one of the cell that's given to us. This is one of the cell that's given to us. Guys, in kinetics only I told you that reactant or product which will be in aqueous state, its active mass will be its concentration, right? The one which is in gaseous state, its active mass will be its concentration or pressure. But here I'll be taking the active mass of gas, gas as pressure. Solid and pure liquid. Its active mass is constant and that constant is taken as unity. You know it already. Discussed. Discussed. Now people, <clears throat> try to understand. First of all, I'll be writing the reaction which will be taking place at anode. Reaction which will be taking place at anode. At anode, what happens? Oxidation. 0 to plus 1. Increase in the oxidation state means oxidation. So H2, when getting converted into H positive, will undergo oxidation. Right? We'll be losing electrons. So H2 gas will be losing certain electrons and will be getting converted into 2 times H positive. I'll have to balance it over here. Okay, now people, since H2 is losing electrons, getting converted into H positive, but how many electrons it lost? 0 to plus 1. Calculate the change. Final minus initial. The value is 1. 1 is the change for one atom, but I have 2. Right? So how many electrons are lost by H2? It is simple, guys. If one hydrogen atom loses one electron, it will get converted into H positive. If you have got two hydrogen atoms, They'll be losing two electrons and getting converted into two times H positive. Simple. Nothing to think. Nothing to think. Now we will, this is the reaction at anode. Similarly, if I ask you, reaction at cathode. At cathode, what is happening? Ag positive is getting converted into Ag. Plus one to zero. Decrease in the oxidation state means reduction. Reduction means gain of electrons. So Ag positive will be gaining electrons, getting converted into Ag solid. I'll say Ag positive aqueous will be gaining one electron and will be getting converted into Ag solid. Now you tell me, can I, can I, can I add these two reactions directly? What do you think? Can I add these two reactions directly, people? I cannot add these reactions directly. Why is that? Because electrons are not balanced. I'm supposed to balance the electrons first, right? So what I'll be doing, I'll be multiplying this particular reaction by two. It becomes two times. This becomes two times. This becomes two times. 
Now the electrons are balanced. Now add the reactions. When you add the reactions, what do we get? H2 gas plus 2 times Ag positive aqueous. What does it give? It gives 2 times H positive aqueous plus 2 times Ag solid. This is your net reaction. Now, if I ask you how many moles of electrons got exchanged in the net cell reaction, you'll directly say two moles of electrons got exchanged. Two moles of electrons got exchanged. My dear students, if I want you guys to write the reaction quotient expression, you can do that. Start with the product, aqueous state. So, concentration of H positive, raised power its stoichiometric coefficient. Solid state, nothing to do with it. Divided by, reactant side. Gaseous phase, use the pressure. Pressure of H2, raised power its stoichiometric coefficient. Aqueous state. Concentration of concentration of Ag positive raised power its stoichiometric coefficient, that's two. So this is your reaction quotient expression over here. Let me know once in the chats. I want everyone to say it if all the things are clear. Say it, people. Say it in the chats. Say it in the chats. Don't be low at all. I want you guys to have the full energy. Say it in the chats, quick. <clears throat> Quickly, guys. Is it clear? <coughs> the electricity did not come yet. Perfect people. <clears throat> now, now comes one more point. Electrode potential. One important thing. Have you studied electrode potential before? What is electrode potential? Tell me that. How do you define the electrode potential? It's a simple term, guys. Electrode potential. Electrode potential. It is defined as the potential difference that gets created that gets created between the rod and the electrolytic solution the potential difference that gets created between the rod and the solution right that's what you call as electrode potential now what does it mean you must be thinking what it means yeah let's try to understand what it means people for example for example i'm taking an electrode over here let's say I'm taking a zinc electrode. If I'm taking a zinc electrode, that means I would have take zinc sulfate in the container, which would have dissociated as zinc di positive and SO4 di negative. Right now, the solution contains equal number of cations and anions, due to which solution is neutral. Now, I'm inserting a zinc rod here. I'm inserting a zinc rod here. So, do you think it's an electrode? Yes, it's an electrode. Yes, it's an electrode. Now, people, this electrode can behave it can behave either like anode or cathode. Right? This electrode, it can behave either like anode or cathode. For example, the electrode behaves like the anode. For example, the electrode behaves like the anode. If it behaves like anode, what will happen? Oxidation. Rod is made up of zinc atoms. Those zinc atoms will undergo oxidation. Right? The rod is made up of zinc atoms. Those zinc atoms will lose two electrons, will get converted into zinc dipositive. This is the reaction that will happen. If this electrode behaves like anode, then this reaction will be happening, right? The rod is made up of zinc atoms. The zinc atoms, they have undergone oxidation, got converted into zinc di positive plus two electrons. What about those two electrons? I'll say those two electrons will be accumulated on the rod. This extra zinc di positive, the extra zinc di positive, from where it came? From where it came? When the atom of the rod has undergone oxidation, it got converted into zinc diapositive and that extra zinc diapositive is going to enter into the solution. Initially, there were equal number of cations and anions. Now, one extra zinc diapositive is entering due to which, due to which, the solution got positive charge. The solution got positive charge, right? The solution got positive charge. The solution got positive charge. Vishnu Priya is saying bye to everyone. Say bye to Vishnu Priya. <laughs> okay? Say bye to her. He is done. He has qualified 715 out of 720. Okay. <clears throat>
my dear students tell me if two electrons are getting accumulated on the rod if two electrons are getting accumulated on the rod if two electrons are getting accumulated if electrons are getting accumulated on the rod which charge rod will get and i say rod will get negative charge tell me one thing solution got positive charge rod got negative charge solution positive rod negative can i say potential difference got created between rod and solution potential difference potential difference got created between rod and solution right and that potential difference which gets created between the rod and the solution that is what you call as electrode potential this potential difference which is getting created between the rod and solution that's what i'll be calling as electrode potential right electrode potential perfect perfect now 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 one more thing one more thing one more thing people one more thing imagine 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 that the zinc electrode for example for example was behaving like the cathode if it was behaving like the cathode what would have happened if the same electrode was behaving like the cathode what would have happened reduction reduction would have happened right the zinc di positives in the solution they would have collided with the rod zinc di positives in the solution they would have collided with the rod would have taken two electrons from the rod got converted into zinc solid the zinc di positives in the in the solution they would have collided with the rod they would have taken two electrons from the rod electrons are being taken from the rod so this rod would have got positive now in the solution initially equal number of cations and anions and ions were there now zinc di positives are undergoing reduction getting converted into zinc solid that zinc solid is being accumulated on the rod so number of zinc di positives in the solution are they increasing or decreasing they are decreasing number of zinc di positives and so4 di negatives initially they were equal now zinc di positives are reducing so4 di negatives are same in number so i'll say the solution effectively got with charge negative rod got positive solution got negative again the potential difference is getting created between the rod and the solution and this potential difference which is being created between the rod and the solution this is something which we call as electrode potential i believe all these things are absolutely clear to everyone now people this electrode potential is simply represented by e electrode potential i'll be representing by e now this electrode potential is actually of two types one i'll be calling as oxidation potential one i'll be calling as reduction potential when i made this zinc electrode to behave like the anode at that time at that time rod got negative solution got positive that potential difference in general is called as electrode potential but that's that is precisely called as oxidation potential in this particular case when i made this electrode to behave like cathode rod got positive solution got negative potential difference got created this potential difference in general is called as in general it's called as electrode potential but precisely now i'll be calling it as reduction potential it depends on the fact whether the electrode is behaving like the anode or cathode if it is behaving like anode the potential difference which gets created between rod and solution that is oxidation potential if the electrode behaves like cathode the potential difference get which gets created between rod and solution that's what you call as reduction potential i hope i'm clear electrode potential is of two types oxidation reduction oxidation potential reduction potential now there is a different way of representing oxidation potential i'll be representing it like this e of m gives mn positive m gives mn positive this reduction potential i'll be representing like this e of mn positive gives m mn positive gives m now how will you identify this is oxidation potential how will you identify this is reduction potential there's a way to check that oxidation state here is zero here the oxidation state is plus n zero to plus n increase in the oxidation state increase in the oxidation state is what you call as oxidation so this is your oxidation potential simple see this is plus n this is zero plus n to zero decrease in the oxidation state decrease in the oxidation state is what you call as reduction so this is definitely your reduction potential right one is oxidation potential one is reduction potential perfect people now now electrode potential when measured under standard conditions 
when you measure electrode potential this potential difference between rod and solution when you measure it under standard conditions standard condition means when pressure is kept one bar temperature constant generally 25 degree centigrade temperature constant generally 25 degree centigrade and concentration of electrolyte as one molar okay right electrode potential of an electrode when you measure under these conditions you call it as the standard electrode potential and eventually you can say your standard electrode potential again is of two types one is called as standard oxidation potential one is called as standard reduction potential you can call it as sop standard oxidation potential you can call this as srp standard reduction potential how do you represent it how do you represent it how do you represent it see guys standard oxidation potential it will be represented like this e naught of m gives mn positive in general right standard reduction potential how do you represent it e naught of mn positive gives n perfect right let me tell you one more thing every element every element has got every element has got a particular a fixed Every element has got a fixed value of SOP and SRP. Every value has got a fixed value of SOP and SRP. You would have seen in your NCRT as well. There is that series given. On that series, electrochemical series, there is SOPs and SRPs of different electrodes, different elements given to you. Every element has got, every element has got a fixed SOP, SRP. And let me tell you for an element, let me tell you for an element, for a particular element, for a particular element, SOP of a particular element is always equal to minus times its SRP. SOP of a particular element is always equal to minus times its SRP. For example, for example, if I write E naught of, E naught of, let's say, let's say E naught of zinc getting converted into zinc di positive. Let's say I'm writing it as X volts. I'm writing it as X volts. Can you let me know whether it is SOP of zinc or SRP of zinc? I want the answer in the chats. Quick. Can you let me know whether it is SOP or SRP of zinc? 0 to plus 2. Increase in the oxidation state. Increase means oxidation. Oxidation means this SOP. SOP. If I ask you, what will be the SRP of zinc? SRP of zinc. You will just reverse it. It will be zinc di positive. This will be zinc. SRP will be just minus the sign. Reverse the sign. Right? So it'll be minus six. Simple. Dusted. Right. Right, people. <clears throat> I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm clear. Now, guys. Time to understand one important thing. Or before telling you that particular thing, do remember one thing. Whatever electrochemical series you see in your NCRT, in that electrochemical series, every element has got a particular value of SOP, particular value of SRP. Those SOPs or SRPs, those SOPs or SRPs of a particular element have been calculated have been calculated with the help of with the help of a reference electrode and that reference electrode that reference electrode over here which we use as that is called as standard hydrogen electrode remember this particular point whatever electrochemical series which you see in your ncrt people which you see in your ncrt That electrochemical series which you see in your NCR, NCRT, in that every element has got a particular value of SOP, SRP, right? Perfect. Those SOP, SRP values of different elements have been calculated with the help of a reference electrode. That reference electrode is what you'll be calling a standard hydrogen electrode. Now, what the standard hydrogen electrode is all about? Let's talk about something about standard hydrogen electrode. Then I'll show you its application part, right? So let's move ahead to something called as standard hydrogen electrode and how it's made how it is made <clears throat> how
how it is made people i am going to take a container over here like this just understand this is one container which i took okay and what exactly i'm going to do i'm going to keep a platinum wire here this is a platinum wire this is a platinum wire i have got a platinum wire here so let me write it this is platinum wire platinum wire coated with coated with platinum black platinum wire coated with platinum black now over here now over here i am going to take a container this is a container okay my dear student the first thing which i am doing i am introducing h2 gas from here i am introducing h2 gas from here let's say i'm introducing h2 gas at the pressure of 1 bar right at the pressure of 1 bar what will happen this platinum wire this platinum wire h2 gas upon the introduction of h2 gas this h2 gas will get h2 gas will get adsorbed on the surface of this wire right h2 gas will get adsorbed on the surface of this particular wire i am going to adsorb this h2 gas till entire surface till entire surface of platinum wire gets covered with h2 i'm assuming entire surface of platinum wire got covered with h2 right now people in this particular container in this particular container what exactly i'm planning to do in this particular container i am planning to keep h positive ions i'm planning to keep h positive ions right h positive ions Imagine the concentration of H positive is one mole. I am keeping the temperature constant, and generally it's kept as twenty-five degrees centigrade. So tell me first of all, have I used the standard conditions? Have I used the standard conditions? Have I used the standard conditions? Check it out. Concentration one mole. Pressure one bar. Temperature constant. Absolutely, I'm talking about the standard conditions. I've taken the standard conditions here. Now. can i say this is basically your h2 rod this h2 rod is introduced in a solution containing h positive ions this entire setup over here is something which i call as standard hydrogen electrode right this is what you will be calling as standard hydrogen electrode yeah perfect right people this is something which you call a standard hydrogen electrode now the standard hydrogen electrode it can behave like anode or it can behave like cathode right it has got the liberty it can behave like anode as well as cathode when the standard hydrogen electrode behaves like anode what happens oxidation oxidation takes place oxidation means loss of electrons so at that point of time h2 gas it gets converted into two times h positive aqueous plus two electrons perfect when it behaves like the cathode reduction takes place when it behaves like the cathode reduction takes place reduction means gain of electrons so h positives from the solution will collide with the rod will take electrons from rod so what will be the reaction just reverse it two times h positive aqueous in the solution they will be taking two electrons from the rod will get converted into h2 gas my dear students these two reactions are very important when hydrogen electrode behaves like anode when hydrogen electrode behaves like cathode when hydrogen electrode behaves like anode when hydrogen electrode behaves like cathode right and remember oxidation potential or let me write standard oxidation potential as well as standard reduction potential of which electrode of hydrogen electrode as per convention is taken as zero is taken as zero is taken as zero that means i can write it like this e not of h2 gives h positive 0 to plus 1 increase oxidation so this is sop this will be zero e not of h positive gives h2 this will be also what this will be zero this will be zero this will be zero am i clear am i clear now you must be thinking why are we studying 
this oxidation potential and reduction potential what is the use of it dear students you get questions out of it right two statements i'm going to give you two statements i am going to give you by means of which you can solve all the questions based on this srp sop two statements that's it remember more the sop of an element more the standard oxidation potential of a species more will be its tendency to undergo oxidation more will be its tendency to undergo oxidation the one which undergoes oxidation that's called as reducing agent that's called as reducing agent so more the tendency to undergo oxidation i'll say better is the reducing agent and better the reducing agent more is going to be its reducing power this particular statement if you remember you are sorted if you remember this particular statement you are done and dusted yes more the sop more the sop more the tendency of the species to undergo oxidation better the reducing agent more the reducing power point number 1 point number 2 more the srp more the srp more is the tendency to undergo reduction more the tendency to undergo reduction right the one which undergoes reduction that's the oxidizing agent so better is the oxidizing agent better the oxidizing agent means more the oxidizing power more the oxidizing power so sometimes you get questions on the base of oxidizing power sometimes you get questions on the base of reducing power sometimes you get questions on the base of better oxidizing agent better reducing agent and all those questions can be done with the help of these two simple statements provided you remember them yeah provided you remember them provided you remember them <clears throat> for example uh let's say i'm taking certain elements here a b c and d just to make you understand a b c d let's say a b c d i'm writing e not of m gives m positive here i'm writing e not of m gives m positive m gives m positive right here i'm writing e not of or just let's take these two values only let's say this is 1 volt this is 2 volt this is 3 volt this is 4 volt let's say this is minus 1 volt right this minus 2 volt this minus 3 volt this minus 4 volt these are two questions which i'm giving you you need to understand them tell me first of all whether this is sop or srp m gives m positive 0 to plus 1 increase increase is oxidation this sop sop which one has got maximum sop this has got more sop more the sop more the sop more tendency to undergo oxidation better the reducing agent so this is the better reducing agent it has got more reducing power so you can give the order of reducing power you can give the order of reducing agent capability right you can give the order of tendency to undergo oxidation all the orders you can give done understood now similarly this is again your sop only sop only this is again your sop perfect now which one has got more sop check the sign as well this has got more sop now more sop more sop means more tendency to undergo oxidation better reducing agent more reducing power right you can give the order of reducing power reducing agent tendency to undergo reduction etc etc yeah am i clear that's great aisha that's wonderful is it clear people is it clear now if i give you a question like this if i give you a question like this if i give you a question like this or leave this question aside we'll solve this after some time but tell me oh uh, wait guys wait wait okay let's solve this question only because in the other question which i was looking i think that is incomplete that question is incomplete there are no values given okay chalo anyways let's solve this question first 
Where, where has it gone? Okay, this is the question. This is the question. Hmm. Someone is saying in the second question it was SRP. Was it SRP in the same question? What are you telling me? It's M gives M positive. Yeah? It's increase. Cello, you are in a position to notice things. Tell me the answer of this question, guys. You have to be very quick. You have to be very quick. You're supposed to be very quick. Look at this particular question. First thing, first thing, first thing. Tell me, are these the examples of oxidation reactions or reduction reactions? What is happening? Loss of electrons or gain of electrons? Gain of electrons. Gain of electrons. Mg dipositive is gaining electrons. So Mg dipositive is undergoing reduction. Zinc dipositive undergoing reduction. Nickel dipositive undergoing reduction. Fe tripositive undergoing reduction. So, what are these values then? These are the reduction potentials. These are the reduction potentials, right? So, E of Mg dipositive getting converted into Mg. Reduction potential. Reduction potential of magnesium dipositive is given to us as minus 2.37 volts. Similarly, E of zinc dipositive gives zinc. This is also the SRP, standard reduction potential. It is given as minus 0 0.76 volts. Similarly, Ni dipositive giving Ni. How much? Minus 0 0.73 volts. Perfect. And Fe tri positive giving Fe. It is minus 0 0.04 volts. Perfect. So these are what? These are the standard reduction potentials. These are the standard reduction potentials. What do I have to check? Which of the following is the better reducing agent? The one which has to be the better reducing agent. Better reducing agent. Reducing agent undergoes oxidation. Right? Perfect. So the one which undergoes oxidation easily will be the better reducing agent. Now, which one undergoes oxidation easily? The one which has got more SOP. But what are these values? These are SRP values. What do I need? I need SOP values. I need SOP values. So I'll change. I'll change. E naught of. Mg gives Mg dipositive. I'm reversing. Mg gives Mg dipositive. Is the quote. Reverse the sign. Plus 2.37. Volts, right? Zinc giving zinc dipositive. It is plus 0 0.76 volts. Similarly, plus 0 0.73 volts. Similarly, plus 0 0.04 volts. This was your nickel getting converted into nickel dipositive. This was your iron getting converted into iron dipositive, right? Now tell me one thing. These are SOP values. Understand one thing. Over here, Mg dipositive was undergoing reduction. It was gaining electrons, right? Over here, magnesium is losing electrons, getting converted into Mg dipost. Right? I hope you're understanding things. Now, what are these? SOPs. This is SOP of Mg. This is SOP of zinc. This is SOP of nickel. This is SOP of iron. What was this? This was SRP of Mg dipost. This was SRP of this. SRP of this. SRP of this. Right? Now, which one do you think has got maximum SOP? Maximum SOP. Maximum SOP. Is this value? Right? So, it is magnesium which has got maximum SOP. Maximum SOP means maximum tendency to undergo oxidation. Better reducing agent. So, what is the answer? It has to be magnesium. Do not write the answer as magnesium dipositive. I hope I am absolutely loud and clear. Yes? <clears throat> Guys, one thing I'll tell you, maybe, see, every live stream of YouTube can be there maximum for 12 hours. When it exceeds 12 hours, the stream breaks. It gets disconnected. By chance, we were not able to complete all the three chapters in 12 hours. Let's say, let's say they get complete in 13 hours. So what I'll do at the 11 hour, 30 minutes, I'll end the stream. I'll create the new stream at that time itself, but you have to be there, right? That will be a new session. You got it? You got it? You got it? So should I tell my team to do that already, right? So that it won't be a problem at that time. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, Maybe in in worst case scenario, I'm saying, huh? 
what time we started we started at 10 uh, 10 to 9 30 wheels means 11 hours 30 minutes treatment uh, akansha do one thing uh, make one more stream tonight only at 9 30 but keep that private for now maybe if i was unable to i mean complete all the things in this stream i'll use that particular stream right 9 30 pe stream uh, aap rakh dena, abhi private rakhna okay right if this stream ends i'll join that stream tonight only okay perfect <laughs> Perfect, guys. All right. I believe this particular question is clear, and you can solve these sort of questions from now on. You can solve these sort of questions from now on. Okay. There was one more question, but the data is incomplete. I think I have forgotten to mention the values over here. Okay. Anyways, you have to check the reducing power. How do you check the reducing power? Reducing power. Reducing power. The one which has got more reducing power will be the better reducing agent. The, which one will be the better reducing agent? Reducing agent undergoes oxidation. So the one which undergoes oxidation easily, right? Now, which one undergoes oxidation easily? The one which has got more SOP. The one which has got more SOP, correct? Perfect. So this is the concept which you will be using in this sort of equation. Anyways, the values are missing here, but I believe you can solve the question with the help of this particular concept. Yeah? Now, people, let's move on to something called as AMF. EMF. How do you define the EMF? How do you define the EMF? This is something again important. So first of all, let me take the galvanic cell over here, which is your Daniel cell, for example. Right? Let me take the Daniel cell. This is your zinc rod and this is the solution. This is your copper rod. This is copper sulfate. Right? And over here, voltmeter, emitter, whatever you want to use. Right? And this is your salt bridge. This is your Daniel cell. Perfect. Now, what Daniel cell does? If I ask you, what Daniel cell does? It converts chemical energy into electrical energy. Basically, basically, the Daniel cell produces current. Basically, the Daniel cell produces current. So, from now onwards, when I say that Daniel cell is working, what does that mean? That means it's producing current. That means it's producing current. If I say Daniel cell is not, Daniel cell is not working. That means it is not producing current. Right? That means it's not producing current. If I say Daniel cell is working, it means it's producing current. Right? Electrons are going from anode to cathode. If I say Daniel cell is not working, that means it is not producing current at all. Okay? Now, people, since it is producing current, imagine this is the direction of electrons, right? And this is the direction of current. This is the direction of current. Perfect. Now you know current only flows, current only flows due to potential difference. Due to potential difference. Current only flows due to what? Due to potential difference. So if this, if this cell is producing current, it can only produce current if there will be potential difference between these two electrodes. Right? It can only produce current if there will be potential difference between these two electrodes. Correct? The maximum potential difference. The maximum potential difference. The maximum potential difference between the electrodes. The maximum potential difference between the electrodes when the cell is not in use. When the cell is not in use is something which you call as EMF of the cell which is represented by E cell. Which is represented by E cell. It is the maximum potential difference. This is your anode, for example, and this is your cathode, right? Perfect. The maximum potential difference between these electrodes, right, when the cell is not in use, is something which you call as EMF. How do you, how do you calculate this EMF? There are a lot of ways, but before that, let me tell you one more point. When EMF is calculated under standard conditions, when EMF is calculated under standard conditions and you know what are the standard conditions when pressure is your one bar concentration of these electrolytes is kept kept as one molar temperature constant generally 25 degrees centigrade when emf when the potential difference between the electrodes is measured under standard conditions 
you do not call it as the normal EMF. What do you call it then? At that point of time, you call it as standard EMF, which is represented by E0 cell. Which is represented by E0 cell. Right? Which is represented by E0 cell. Which is represented by E0 cell. And how do you calculate this E0 cell? Understand, it is always equal to E0 of cathode minus E0 of anode. And remember, here you will be using the SRP of cathode and here you will be using the SRP of anode. SRP of anode. Just remember this part. Just remember this. E0 cell calculation is equal to E0 of cathode minus E0 of anode. And here, for both we have to use SRPs. For both we have to use SRPs. Anyways, you can convert it into different result as well. This is SRP of cathode. Instead of it, you can write minus times SOP of cathode, right? This is SRP of anode. You can write minus times SOP of anode. Then accordingly, the result will change. But I would suggest you guys to remember just one, not more than that. And let me tell you, see, this was your Daniel cell. This was your Daniel cell. For the Daniel cell, your standard EMF is equal to how much? It is equal to 1.1 volts. You can remember it directly. You can remember it directly. Okay. Now, guys, try to understand a few important things which will make sure your concepts are building. Understand. I'm taking two electrodes. E naught of A giving A positive is equal to, for example, 3 volts. E naught of B giving B positive is equal to 5 volts. So, how many electrodes I have? I have two electrodes, A and B. I have two electrodes, A and B. Imagine I'm connecting them externally as well as internally. Imagine I'm connecting these two electrodes externally as well as internally. What I'll get? I'll get one complete cell. How do I calculate E0 cell of that particular cell? How do I calculate E0 cell of that particular cell? How do I calculate E0 cell of that complete cell which got formed when I connected these two electrodes externally as well as internally? Have a look. Is this SOP or SRP? I want in the chats. Is this SOP or SRP? I want in the chats. SOP or SRP? Quick. Is this SOP or SRP? This is SOP. 0 to plus 1. Increase. 0 to plus 1. Increase. SOP. This is SOP. This is SOP. Which one has got more SOP? This has got more SOP. More SOP means more tendency to undergo oxidation. Oxidation takes place at anode. So you understood that this electrode has to be your anode and this electrode automatically has to be your cathode. Perfect. E0 cell is equal to E0 cathode minus E0 anode. But one thing is there, you have to use SRP here. This is SRP of cathode and this will be SRP of anode. Right? What is SRP of cathode? This is your cathode. But this SOP of cathode, what do I need? I need SRP of cathode. So I'll reverse the sign. I'll reverse the sign. It'll be minus 3. Minus. SRP of anode. This is anode, but this is SOP of anode. Convert into SRP. Right? So 8 minus 3 is, sorry. Uh, 5 minus 3 is 2 volts. This is your E0 cell. I hope you got it. I hope you got it, people. Right? Okay, one more example. So that, then only I can move ahead. See guys, E0 of, for example, A positive gives A. It is equal to 5 volts. E0 of B positive gives B. B positive gives B. Or let me write it like this. E0 of B gives B negative. It is equal to minus 3 volts. Right? These are two electrodes which I have here. These are two electrodes which I have. Okay? First thing, first thing. If I join these two electrodes externally as, as well as internally, I'll be getting a complete galvanic cell. How do I calculate E0 cell of that particular Daniel's galvanic cell? It is going to be E0 of your cathode minus E0 of your anode. E0 of cathode minus E0 of your anode, right? Now people, try to understand first of all, try to understand first of all, this is your SOP or SRP, plus 1 to 0, plus 1 to 0, decrease, decrease means reduction, so this is SRP, right? 0 to minus 1, decrease, decrease again is SRP. Which one has got more SRP? Look here, this has got more SRP. More SRP means more tendency to undergo reduction. More tendency to undergo reduction means reduction takes place at cathode. So this is your cathode. And this is your anode. So you identified your cathode and anode. So E0 cell has to be equal to E0 cathode. SRP, SRP. SRP of cathode is 
5 volts minus SRP of anode is minus 3 volts. The value over here comes out to be 8 volts. So 8 volts is going to be the standard EMF of the cell. Right? Am I clear, people? Am I clear? Am I clear? And I hope all of you uh, have enrolled into my telegram, right? Do that. That's important because I keep on updating about all the stuff in my telegram. Right? I hope you know that. Okay. Now, guys, let's move on. Let's move on. Look at this particular question. Can you be able to solve this? First of all, this reaction involves loss of electrons. This reaction also involves loss of electron. Okay. If you look at the net reaction, this is the net reaction that's given. This is the net reaction is given, right? Understand. Oxidation state 0, air plus 2, air plus 2, air 0. So zinc, increase in the oxidation state. Oxidation, that means your zinc electrode is behaving like anode. So automatically iron becomes your cathode. So you understood which one is your anode, which one is your cathode, right? What do we have to calculate? E0 cell? E0 cell is nothing. That is going to be E0 of cathode minus E0 of anode. SRP of cathode, SRP of anode. Now, this is SOP, right? Loss of electron, SOP. This also SOP. What do I need? SRP. What do I need? SRP. SRP of cathode. Cathode is your iron. SRP of cathode. Just change the sign. Minus 0 0.41. Minus SRP of anode. SRP of anode. Anode is your zinc. This is SOP of zinc. So SRP will be minus, minus 0 0.76, right? When you solve this, how much you get? You get plus 0 0.35 volts. Am I clear with this? Are you, are you clear with this? 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 Guys, say yes or no in the chats. Be quick. Be quick. Do not die down. Do not die. Quick, everyone. I want the chats to run fast. They should not move. They should run. What are you doing? What are you doing? Yes, and a lot of people still have not liked the session yet. That is not fair. So please and please do smash that like and mark your attendance. And the ones who have not subscribed to this particular channel yet, I would want you guys to subscribe to this particular channel as well so that you remain updated about all the sessions which we take on an Academy Neat English. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> Perfect. This is something which I wanted. Let me see if there is electricity. Yes, it has come. We can use which which mode do you want? Do you want again the dark mode or this is fine? I think this is fine now, yeah? Now you can see me. Now you can see me. Right? <clears throat> now you can see me. Let's let's have the light mode for some time, then we'll go for the dark mode again, right? Let's have the night mode for some time. I mean the dark mode, I mean light mode for some time. Then after some time we'll have the dark mode again, right? Because my eyes actually I don't know what's wrong with them. <clears throat> okay, I'm going ahead. So people, now, 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 there is something, something very, very, very important. The most important thing in this chapter. That is your Nernest equation. That is your Nernest equation. Nernest equation. Till now, I told you how to calculate 
स्टैंडर्ड ई एम एफ ऑफ अ कंप्लीट सेल राइट ए नॉट सेल आई मीन ए नॉट क्या थोड़ा माइनस ई नॉट एनोड यू नो इट राइट वॉट इज दैट ई नॉट सेल दैट इज बेसिकली ई एम एफ ऑफ द सेल अंडर स्टैंडर्ड कंडीशन बट इफ द कंडीशन आर चेंज इफ द कंडीशन आर चेंज इफ यू डू नॉट हैव द स्टैंडर्ड कंडीशन एट दैट टाइम how would you calculate the emf how would you calculate emf of the cell for that i'll be using this particular equation for that i'll be using this particular equation e cell emf of the cell under non standard conditions under non standard condition right is equal to e not cell that is the standard emf of the cell standard emf of the cell. right you see you know reaction quotient and you know how to calculate okay but i believe before this particular topic let me tell you one more simple thing one more simple topic which i forgot to tell you just a second just a second after that we'll go to the non stress equation okay there is one simple topic that is a relation between delta g and e cell what is delta g gives free energy relation between delta g and e cell i'm not going to derive this result i'll just give it to you right remember your delta g delta g for the cell delta g for the cell is equal to minus nf e cell delta g for the cell is equal to minus nf e cell if i write the same expression under standard conditions it becomes delta g not is equal to minus nf e not cell under standard conditions now why this result why this result why this result people see if you want to make a galvanic cell you can take two electrodes connect them externally internally you'll get a galvanic cell right you'll you'll make a cell in order to make the cell what do you need to do you just need two electrodes connect them externally internally you'll make a cell you'll create a cell but whether that cell will be working or not how to check that how to check that whether that cell will be working whether whether that uh, cell will be producing current or not how do we check that how do we check that let me tell you my dear students imagine i am taking two electrodes connecting them externally internally i got a cell now after doing all the connections external as well as internal if automatically at anode oxidation started at cathode reduction starts if automatically as soon as i complete the cell if automatically at anode oxidation starts at cathode reduction starts that means if the cell reactions are spontaneous if cell reactions happen on its own then you will say the cell is working then you will say the cell is working so for the cell to be working cell reactions are supposed to happen on their own upon the completion of the circuit right now anything which which happens on its own that's called a spontaneous process any process which happens on its own that's what you call a spontaneous process right for the process to be spontaneous delta g system at constant pressure and temperature has to be negative in short i'll say delta g has to be negative i'll say something like this for a cell right for the cell reactions to be spontaneous to be spontaneous for the cell reactions to be spontaneous or i would say or i would say for the cell to be working like a normal galvanic cell like a normal galvanic cell delta g for the cell has to be negative delta g for the cell delta g for the cell has to be negative what is delta g delta g is basically minus nf e cell so minus nf e cell has to be negative when is that possible minus nf e cell this whole term has to be negative this whole term has to be negative right it is only possible if e cell is positive if e cell is negative 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 makes it positive it is not possible right so you can say your e cell has to be positive so you got the criteria for the cell to be working you got the criteria for cell to be working what is that 
डेल्टा जी हैज बी नेगेटिव और ई सेल हैज बी पॉजिटिव आई एम नॉट टॉक अबाउट ई नॉट दिस नॉट ई नॉट है दिस ई सेल दिस इज ई सेल देर इज डिफरेंस बिटवीन ई सेल एंड ई नॉट सेल ई नॉट सेल इज पोटेंशियल डिफरेंस बिटवीन टू इलेक्ट्रोड्स अंडर स्टैंडर्ड कंडीशन दिस नॉट स्टैंडर्ड कंडीशन ओके नाउ इमेजिन इफ डेल्टा जी और लेट मी राइट इट लाइक दिस if delta g for the cell comes out to be positive if delta g for the cell comes out to be positive or i'll say delta g for the cell is positive matlab minus n of e cell is positive when is that possible that is possible if e cell is negative my dear students if delta g for the cell is positive or e cell is negative at that point of time at that point of time delta g positive means cell reactions will be non spontaneous cell reactions will be non spontaneous and if cell reactions are non spontaneous cell won't work it is not going to produce current okay right perfect now one more thing one more thing if you see delta g for the cell coming out to be zero coming out to be zero delta g for the cell delta g is minus nf e cell That means minus of N of E cell is zero, which tells you that E cell has to be zero. This is the condition for the cell to be at equilibrium. What is meant by that equilibrium condition? This is a separate topic, which I'll tell you after some time. But just remember it for now. Remember it for now. If delta G for the cell is zero or E cell is zero, we say the cell is at equilibrium. What does that mean? Right? That is something which I'll tell you after some time. Perfect. Now, guys. Now I'm going to move to the actual stuff. What is that? That is your Nernst equation. That is your Nernst equation, and I'll show the application part of this thing in some time. Nernst equation. My dear students, I told you already. Why do we need the Nernst equation? Why do we need the Nernst equation? My dear students, Nernst equation is used first of all to calculate EMF of a complete cell. Of a complete cell. Complete cell means. which is made up of two electrodes you can call them as two electrodes or you can call them as two half cells one electrode is called as half cell as well so one complete cell is made up of two half cells you know it whenever you make a complete cell and you are supposed to calculate its emf under non standard conditions under non standard conditions under non standard conditions which equation do you use you use the nernst equation how you write the nernst equation at that point of time it is going to be e cell is equal to e not cell i'm not showing its derivation etc etc that's of known use to use to us for now right e cell is called e not cell minus 2.303 rt divided by nf and it's going to be log of qc log of qc now 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 understood understand if for example i take the value of r as 8.314 joules per kelvin per mole right f is the faraday's constant which is 96500 and if i take the temperature as 298 kelvin at that point of time at that point of time this equation gets reduced to this particular format e cell is equal to e not cell minus 0.0591 divided by n and at that time it's log of qc right this is the equation which i'll use to calculate what to calculate emf of a complete cell under non standard conditions right this e cell this is the emf of a complete cell under non standard conditions this is your standard emf this is your standard emf right which is e not cathode minus e not anode i hope i'm clear i hope i am clear people right i hope i'm clear yeah i hope i'm clear this is first application of what this is the first application of nernst equation to come to, to to calculate the emf of a complete cell under non standard conditions now the second application part the second application part second application part second application part to calculate to calculate oxidation potential and reduction potential of half cells of half cells again under non standard condition under non standard condition my dear students the sop srp sop srp you already know for every element which is given in the electrochemical cell now 
What is that SOP SRP? That is oxidation potential, reduction potential under standard conditions. Now, if you change the standard conditions, if you change the standard conditions, how will you calculate oxidation potential of the half cell? How will you calculate oxidation potential of the electrode? How will you calculate reduction potential of the electrode? Right? If you change the conditions. Again, I'll be using an honest equation. Imagine I have got an electrode whose oxidation potential I need to calculate. So this equation I'll write in this format. EOX, which is the oxidation potential of the half cell, is equal to E naught OX, which is the standard oxidation potential of the same half cell, minus 0.0591 divided by N. Then it's going to be log of QC. Then it's going to be log of QC. This is how you calculate oxidation potential of the half cell under non-standard conditions. Now, how do you calculate a reduction potential of the half cell under non-standard conditions? You write like, like this, E RED is equal to E naught RED minus what? Minus 0 0.0591 divided by N. It is log of QC. It is log of QC. This is how you calculate reduction potential of the electrode under non-standard conditions. Oxidation potential of the electrode under non-standard conditions. EMF of the complete cell under non-standard conditions. Am I clear? Gives free energy is extensive property. Extensive. Perfect. Perfect, guys. <clears throat> now, let me directly show you the questions. But, 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 before showing you the questions, I'll give you a few statements, which directly you will remember. Otherwise, there are, I mean, I have to use some mathematics and do those things, but that's of no use to you. Okay, you just remember them directly. Conclusion number one, statement number one. What is that? What is the first statement? Statement is, on increasing on increasing or let me write it directly like this a reduction potential of the electrode a re reduction potential of the electrode reduction potential of the electrode is directly proportional to the concentration of electrolyte in the container reduction potential of the electrode is directly proportional to the concentration of electrolyte in the container so if you have got the container perfect this is the zinc rod for example or let's say this is the metal rod and it is there in a container which contains, let's say, some ions. Perfect. If you increase the concentration of electrolyte here, if you increase the concentration of electrolyte here, the reduction potential of this cell, the reduction potential of this cell, the reduction potential of this half cell, the reduction potential of this electrode, that will increase. That will increase. Okay, that will increase. Second thing, second thing. Oxidation potential of the, oxidation potential of the electrode is inversely proportional to the concentration of electrolyte in the container. Do remember this particular point directly as well. Do remember this particular point directly as well. This is again one important point. This is again one important point. My dear students, okay, after remembering these things, one thing I want to share with you. One thing I want to share with you. For example, you have to write an earnest equation for half cells. Half cells means electrodes. How do you use an earnest equation for electrodes? For electrodes. For electrodes. For example, this is the container which I have. In this container, I have got, let's say, Mn positive ions, right? Which have got concentration C1. I'm introducing a metal rod here. So this is an electrode. This is an electrode. Imagine that this electrode is behaving like the anode. Imagine that this electrode is behaving like the anode. If the electrode is behaving like the anode, it will undergo oxidation. It will undergo oxidation. And when oxidation happens here, I'll say, I'll say the reaction will be M solid, will get converted into M N positive aqueous. And with that, you'll be getting N electrons, right? Perfect. Now, if you use the reaction quotient expression, it is going to be concentration of Mn positive, raised power stoichiometric coefficient. This is solid active mass unity, right? How do you write the Nernest equation? Since I took an electrode, I made sure that electrode behaves like anode, so that oxidation takes place. So that oxidation takes place, right? Right? 
So, so what I'm trying to calculate basically, I'm trying to calculate the oxidation potential. Oxidation potential of the electrode will be equal to E naught OX, which will be given the equation, minus 0 0.0591 divided by N, log of QC. QC is nothing but concentration of MN positive, which will be given in the equation. Perfect. This is how you write the Nernest equation for the electrode whose oxidation potential under non-standard conditions is to be calculated. Now tell me one thing. If the same electrode was behaving like the cathode, if the same electrode was behaving like the cathode, what would have been the reaction? Reduction reaction. So reverse it. When you reverse it, it would have been Mn positive aqueous plus N electrons. Gives what? Gives M solid. This would have been the reaction. So how many electrons, how many moles of electrons are exchanged? N, right? Now people over here, what do we do? I made sure that electrode behaves like the cathode. So technically I'm trying to calculate the reduction potential. So reduction potential of the half cell is equal to E naught RED, standard reduction potential, minus 0 0.0591 divided by N log of QC. What will be QC? QC will be 1 divided by concentration of MN positive. Perfect. This is how you calculate reduction potential of this half cell under non-standard conditions. Right? Perfect, guys. Now, 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 one more thing. Imagine that, imagine that I have to use Nernest equation for hydrogen electrode. Imagine that I have to use Nernest equation for hydrogen electrode. Imagine that I have to use Nernest equation for hydrogen electrode. See, we know SOP, SRP for hydrogen electrode, that's zero. But if I change the conditions, if I change the conditions, oxidation potential as well as the reduction potential of hydrogen electrode will change, right? That is valid at standard conditions. But if I change the conditions, it will change. How do we get that? See, you already know, as I have told you clearly, when hydrogen behaves like anode, the reaction becomes H2 gas, right? It gives two times H positive to aqueous plus two electrons. Perfect. Imagine the pressure here is 180. Perfect. How many moles of electrons got exchanged? Tell me that. N is 2. N is 2. QC. QC will be concentration of H positive raised power 2 divided by pressure of H2. That's 1. Right? Now guys, tell me one thing. I made sure hydrogen electrode behaves like anode. So I'm trying to calculate oxidation potential. I'm trying to calculate oxidation potential of the hydrogen electrode. So EOX is equal to E naught OX minus 0 0.0591 divided by N log of QC. Do you agree with this? This term already is zero. This is SOP of hydrogen. That's zero. Now, normal oxidation potential of hydrogen will be equal to, it'll be minus 0 0.0591 divided by 2. Log of m raised power n is n log m. So 2 comes to the front. Then you have got log of H positive concentration. Perfect. So 2 to cancel. So EOX is equal to, I'll first of all write 0 0.0591. Minus log H positive means, minus log H positive means pH. pH of the solution. pH of the solution which was there in the container. Right? So this is a general expression by means of which you can calculate oxidation potential of the hydrogen electrode if the partial pressure of H2 is kept as 1 bar or 1 atm. I clear? If you want to calculate the reduction potential of hydrogen electrode, you know EOX is equal to minus times. So reverse it. So it will be minus 0 0.0591 multiplied by pH. Or you can follow the entire process again. Entire process will be make, write the reaction at cathode get the QC, then write the expression in terms of ERED is equal to E naught RED, etc, etc. You'll get this particular thing. Yeah? Am I loud and clear? Am I loud and clear? So people, let's try to solve certain questions by means of which all these stuff, all this stuff will be absolutely clear to every one. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead, people. Calculate the oxidation potential of this half cell. Calculate the oxidation potential of the half cell. There will be no break. Just wait. I'll give you the break at 6 or 6.30. Okay? Got it? Got it? Okay, I need to calculate the oxidation potential. If I need to calculate the oxidation potential, oxidation happens at anode. So I have to make sure that this electrode behaves like the anode. I'll have to make sure that this electrode behaves like the anode. Okay, right. 
And when this electrode behaves like the anode, what happens? Oxidation, right? Oxidation state here is zero. Iron here is in dipositive. Oxidation means loss of electrons. So the reaction has to be Fe solid gives Fe dipositive aqueous plus how many electrons? Plus two electrons. This is the reaction. This is SO4 dinegative. So this has to be Fe dipositive. Right? Yeah? So this is the reaction which will happen when the electrode behaves like what? Guys, it's simple. You have taken the iron, you have taken the iron rod and you have introduced iron rod in a solution containing FeSO4. That's what I did. That's what I did. Right? Now, if you look carefully, how many moles of electrons got exchanged? Two. If I ask you what will be the QC expression, it will be concentration of Fe di positive. Raised power stoichiometric coefficient, that's one. The solid, nothing to do with that. Now, what is, how much is the concentration of Fe di positive? See, you have taken FeSO4 in the container basically. In the container, you had taken what? You had taken FeSO4. This FeSO4 would have dissociated as Fe di positive plus SO4 di negative. Initially, you took its concentration how much? 0 0.1 molar. So this was 0, this was 0. Now it would have got completely dissociated. So this is 0. 1 mole gives 1 mole. 0 0.1 gives 0 0.1. Even this gives 0 0.1. So, so you got to know the concentration of Fe di positive and concentration of SO4 di negative in this container. In this container, right? So put it here. QC is equal to concentration of Fe di positive 0 0.1 means 10 raised power minus 1. This is the QC value. N value we got. Okay. Now, what do I need to calculate? Oxidation potential. EOX is equal to E naught OX minus 0 0.0591 divided by N. And then you have got log of QC. Perfect. So EOX is equal to E naught OX standard oxidation potential. Take this. Is this standard oxidation potential or SRP? Quick. Is this SOP or SRP? Plus 2 to 0. Decrease. Decrease means reduction. So this is SRP. But what do I need? What do I need? Do I need SRP or SOP? This is SRP. But I need SOP. I need SOP. So I have to reverse the sign. It will be plus 0 0.44 minus 0 0.0591. N value is given to me as 2. And log of QC. QC is nothing but 10 raised power minus 1. So log of M raised power N. N log M. So minus 1 comes to the front. Log 10 is 1. Right? Minus 1 comes to the front. Log 10 is 1. So minus 1 means it will be plus and solve it, get the answer in volts. This is the oxidation potential of the half cell which we were supposed to calculate. Question number one. Question number two. Question number two. Question number two. A hydrogen electrode is given whose oxidation potential is to be calculated. So to calculate the oxidation potential of the hydrogen electrode, I'll make sure it behaves like anode. And when it behaves like anode, you already should remember the reaction now. H2 gas gives 2 times H positive plus 2 electrons. This has to be the reaction at anode. Agreed? Right? This will be the reaction at anode. I told you already, when hydrogen gas behaves like anode, this is the reaction. When it behaves like the cathode, reverse the reaction. This has to be remembered now. Okay? So N value first of all, N value is 2. N value is 2. Perfect. Write the QC expression. QC is going to be concentration of H positive raised power 2 divided by partial pressure of H2. What is the concentration of H positive? Concentration of H positive will be 10 raised power minus 1. Raised power 2 divided by partial pressure of H2 is 10. So this 10 comes up. The value will be 10 raised power minus 3. So QC is 10 raised power minus 3. QC is 10 raised power minus 3. If QC is 10 raised power minus 3, I can easily calculate the oxidation potential of the half cell, which will be equal to E naught OX minus 0 0.0591 divided by N. And it is log of QC, right? This is something which I need to calculate is equal. This term is zero. Why is that? Because I'm given with hydrogen electrode and SOP as well as SRP of hydrogen electrode is zero minus 0 0.0591. N value is two log of QC. QC is nothing but 10 raised power minus three. So this will be minus 0 0.0591 divided by two log of M raised power N, which will be N log M. So minus three comes to the front. Log 10 is one. Solve this value. Get the answer in volts. Is it clear? Is it clear? Say it in the chats once. Say it in the chats. Everyone. Say it in the chats. Everybody. Everybody people, everybody.
Lesson is not completed. Wait. It is just half is done yet. Half is done. That's it. Half is done. Half is done. Okay. Now, this was how do we calculate oxidation potential and reduction potential of the half cells. Right? Now, how do we calculate EMF of a complete cell with the help of Nernst equation? For that purpose, I will take an equation over here. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay. QC calculation once more. Just a second. Okay. Let me let me show it to you once more. QC calculation. Maybe. See the concentration of HCl was given. HCl. So basically, you have taken hydrogen rod, introduced it in HCl solution. So it is scenario like this, guys. You have to understand this now, right? This is HCl which you have taken in the container, which would have dissociated as H positive and HCl negative. And here you have got hydrogen rod with the help of platinum. Perfect. Concentration of HCl was how much? 10 raised to the power minus one molar, right? Initially, this would be zero. This would be zero. Now it would have got completely dissociated. So zero, one mole gives one mole. 10 power minus 1 gives 10 power minus 1, 1 mole gives 1 mole, 10 power minus 1 is going to give 10 power minus 1. The concentration of H positive in the final solution is 10 raised power minus 1. That's what I have put over here. Right? Someone is saying, can I leave physical chemistry? Yes, it's completely your wish. You can leave physics also, biology also. Right? You can, you can leave anything. Anything you can leave, right? Anything you can leave. Yeah? <clears throat> right? Exactly. You can leave neat also. What is the point of giving neat? Nothing. Wastage of time, energy, everything. Right? <clears throat> yeah. Santosh is a PWN. That's great. Wherever you are studying, does not matter. Wherever you are studying, it hardly matters. It is just if you are getting content, if you are getting things, nothing else matters. Oh, Farah is from Xylem. Nice. You must be knowing Ashima. Must be knowing Amrit. They are all my friends in Xylem. The chemistry educator Sudarshan. Hmm. <clears throat> Some people are from Vedantu, right? I know everybody there. And everybody knows me there. Should we move ahead? Perfect. Let's go. Let's get going. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's get going. Let's get going. Let's get going, guys. Okay. So, till now, I was telling you how do we calculate the oxidation potential, reduction potential of half cells under non standard condition. Now it is the time to calculate the EMF of a complete cell. And how do we do it? Try to understand. First thing, this is the solid bridge. On the left side of the solid bridge, you have got anode. On the right side, you have got cathode. So the first thing always is going to be 
write the reaction at anode. Write the reaction at anode. At anode, what's happening? N is getting converted into SN dipositive. So SN solid is getting converted into SN dipositive aqueous. And with that, it will be losing two electrons because oxidation is taking place, right? Right, people? Similarly, you can easily write the reaction taking place at cathode. You can do that, right? At cathode, reduction takes place. So PB dipositive is getting converted into PB. So my reaction is going to be PB dipositive aqueous, right? It will be getting two electrons, getting converted into PB solid. Now, if I ask you whether electrons are balanced or not, yes, electrons are balanced. So, add the two reactions. When you add the two reactions, two electrons, two electrons cancel, right? This is SN solid plus PB dipositive aqueous. It gives what? It gives SN dipositive aqueous plus PB solid. This is my net reaction. Now, my dear students, if I ask you what is the N value? If I ask you what is the N value? If I ask you what is the N value, N value here is 2, right? Because 2 moles of electrons got cancelled, right? If I ask you the QC expression, QC is going to be concentration of SN di positive, raised power stoichiometry coefficient 1. This is solid, nothing to do with it. Solid, nothing to do with it. Divided by concentration of PB di positive, raised to the power stoichiometry coefficient 1. Now, if I ask you what is the concentration of SN di positive given, 1 molar divided by concentration of PB di positive. 10 raised power minus 3 molar. So the value comes out to be 10 raised power 3. So this is your QC. This is your QC, right? This is your QC. Now, if I ask you what about E0 cell, you will say E0 cell is nothing. That is E0 cathode minus E0 anode. What is E0 cathode? SRP of cathode. SRP of anode. So let's calculate SRP of cathode and anode. SRP of cathode. Which one is cathode? Lead. SRP of lead is given. Minus 0 0.13. Minus SRP of anode. Anode is this, this is your anode, and SRP of anode is also given, right? Is this SRP? Yes, plus 2 to 0, right? So it is minus 0 0.14. The value over here comes out to be 0 0.01. So this is your E0 cell. You calculate E0 cell as well. Now what is left? We have to calculate EMF. How do we calculate EMF? You will simply write the equation E cell is equal to E0 cell minus 0 0.0591 divided by N then it's going to be log of QC, right? I'll be writing E cell is equal to, what is E0 cell? What is E0 cell? E0 cell is 0 0.01 minus 0 0.0591 divided by N value is 2 log of QC. QC is nothing but 10 raised power 3. So I can calculate E cell from here. It is going to be 0 0.01 minus 0 0.0591 divided by 2 log of M raised power N is N log M. So 3 log 10 is 1. Now it is just the matter of calculation. Calculate it and get the answer in volts. Am I clear? Am I clear? Guys, try to understand one more thing. Looking at the sign of A cell, whatever will be the sign of A cell, if it comes out to be positive or negative, if it comes out to be positive or negative, if E cell comes out to be positive, if E cell is positive, that means delta G is negative, so cell will be working. If E cell comes out to be negative, delta G will be positive and E cell I mean, uh, the cell will not be working. People are saying it's coming out to be negative. If it is coming out to be negative, if it is coming out to be negative, if it is coming out to be negative, what does that mean? E cell is negative. So delta G positive, cell reaction is non spontaneous right? The cell will not work. So the question can be in this format as well, whether the cell will be working or not, right? Whether the cell will be working or not. I believe I'm clear. I believe I'm clear to everyone. Okay. Perfect. Now guys, let me tell you one more simple topic. Let me tell you one more simple topic. What is that? That is Nernest equation at equilibrium. Try to understand this, okay? Nernest equation at equilibrium. Already I have told you at equilibrium. Already I have told you at equilibrium. Delta G is 0. If delta G is 0, E cell is also 0. E cell is also 0, right? E cell is also 0. Now if I use the Nernest equation, if I use the Nernest equation, your Nernest equation will be in this format. Just a second. You know, your actual format of Nernest is E cell is equal to E naught cell minus 2.303 RT 
divided by nf and it's log of qc right now at equilibrium at equilibrium since e cell is zero since e cell is zero if e cell is zero this comes on this side so i'll say e not cell will be equal to 2.303 rt divided by nf log of at equilibrium do remember qc reaction quotient is what you call as equilibrium constant reaction quotient is what you call as equilibrium constant so this is one more expression by means of which you can calculate e not cell one expression already we know e not cell is equal to e not cathode minus e not anode this is one more expression sometimes a question comes in which equilibrium constant will be given then accordingly use this expression get the e not cell done understood right perfect and my dear students one more thing one more thing if you put the value of r here as 8.31 8.314 if you take temperature as 298 kelvin if you take faraday's constant 96500 so therefore at that point of time your e cell will come out to be 0.0591 divided by n log of equilibrium constant perfect remember it remember it i believe it's clear i believe it is clear to everyone i believe it's clear to everyone let me quickly make you understand what this equilibrium condition is why all this happens why all this happens see i told you already on increasing the concentration of electrolyte on increasing the concentration of electrolyte reduction potential increases reduction potential increases right reduction potential increases reduction potential is directly proportional to concentration of electrolyte in the container oxidation potential is inversely proportional to concentration of electrolyte in the container you know it i have told you this imagine this is your zinc electrode imagine that this is your zinc electrode right imagine that this is your copper electrode this is your copper electrode right this is your ammeter voltmeter whatever this is your salt bridge perfect right i'm assuming this zinc to be anode this to be cathode let's say reduction potential of this zinc electrode is let's say let's say i'm just making you understand nothing else let's say reduction potential of zinc electrode is 5 volts here the reduction potential of the copper electrode is 10 volts it is 10 volts okay let's say now which one has got more reduction potential copper more reduction potential means more tendency to undergo reduction right reduction takes place in cathode so this automatically works at cathode cathode this works as anode right now as the cell works as the cell works zinc di positives in this container will increase zinc di positives in this container will increase so in short can i say the concentration of electrolyte in the left container is increasing similarly cu di positives will undergo reduction they will get accumulated on the rod so concentration of electrolyte in the right container is decreasing right if concentration of electrolyte in the left container is increasing right container is decreasing you know your reduction potential it is directly proportional to concentration of electrolyte already discussed right if we, if electrolyte concentration is decreasing in the left container the so reduction potential of this half cell is decreasing reduction potential will be decreasing over here uh, sorry reduction potential will be increasing here right on increasing the concentration of electro concentration of electrolyte is increasing so reduction potential is increasing concentration of electrolyte is decreasing here so reduction potential is decreasing reduction potential is decreasing perfect initially this was 5 volts this was 10 volts now with time concentration of electrolyte in this container is increasing so reduction potential of this half cell is increasing and concentration of electrolyte in this half cell is decreasing reduction potential of this half cell is decreasing so reduction potential of anode is increasing reduction potential of cathode is decreasing so can i say there will be a time when the reduction potential of both the electrodes will be same or in general i'll say there will be a time when electrode potential of both these electrodes will be the same at that time will there be any potential difference between the electrodes at that time there will be no potential difference between the electrodes right current flows due to potential difference if there is no potential difference there is no current if there is no potential difference there is no current and that stage in a cell when electrode potential of both the electrodes becomes same that point in the cell when potential difference between the electrode becomes zero that point in the cell well when no current is generated from the cell that stage is what you call as equilibrium stage so equilibrium stage e cell is zero done that's why e cell is zero 
Is it clear? <coughs> and these expressions are used at equilibrium. Perfect, guys. Am I clear? Am I clear? I believe I'm clear. Notes कहां पे मिलेंगे Notes यहां पे मिलेंगे टी डॉट एम ई स्लैश डब्ल्यू ए एस एस आई एम एस आई आर सी एच ई एम सी एच ई एम ओके आई मोइंग ऑन आई मोइंग ऑन पीपल आई एम मोइंग ऑन आई एम मोइंग ऑन Just a second. What is the time? It's four thirty. Yeah, four thirty to five thirty. ओके व्हाट इज द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक व्हिच वी आर गोइंग टू डू व्हाट इज द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक व्हिच वी आर गोइंग टू डू This chapter is not done yet. There is lot pending. Someone is in P vlog, huh? Nice, good. Keep up. Okay. <clears throat> now, guys, there is again one important thing which we are going to do now. That is going to be. That is going to be your concentration cells. That's going to be your concentration cell. concentration cells concentration cells till now what did we see we are uh, in the galvanic cells if you would have seen if you would have observed in the galvanic cell we take two different electrodes connect them externally internally right that's what we do connect them externally internally get a cell two different electrodes but in concentration cells what will happen we will take two same electrodes we'll take two same electrodes we'll take two same electrodes connect them externally and internally but where the difference will lie we we'll, no doubt we'll take two same electrodes where in or let me write it like this but concentration of electrolyte concentration of electrolyte or partial pressure or partial pressure is kept different or partial pressure is kept different is kept different due to which emf is generated due to which emf is generated due to which emf is generated what does it mean you'll get the idea in some time first of all try to note down all these things but your students this concentration cell this concentration cell wherein two same electrodes are used but the concentrations or partial pressures are kept different these concentration cells are basically of two types these concentration cells are basically of two types number 1 number 1 is called as electrolytic concentration cell number 2 it is going to be electrode concentration cell electrode concentration cell in case of electrolytic concentration cell in case of electrolytic concentration cell 
no doubt two same electrodes will be used two same electrodes will be used right but but concentration of electrolytes in both the containers will be kept different will be kept different but partial pressure of both the electrodes will be kept same in case of electrode concentration cell again two same electrodes will be used two same electrodes will be used no doubt but what will happen concentration of electrolytes over here is kept same but partial pressure of two electrodes is kept different is kept different is kept different one more thing in case of your concentration cell since you are using two same electrodes if you want to calculate e naught cell what is e naught cell e naught cathode minus e naught anode since if you are using two same electrodes so there srps will be same so e naught cell in case of your concentration cell that will be always zero e naught cell in your concentration cell that will be zero right that will be zero now let me make you understand one by one what this electrolytic concentration cell is and what electrode concentration cell is let's have a look what i'm exactly going to talk about see so guys for example i'm going to show you this in the form of a question let's say i'm writing a cell over here try to analyze things zinc solid this is zinc dipositive whose concentration is c1 solid bridge zinc dipositive whose concentration is c2 and this is zinc solid first of all look at the cell am i using same electrodes or different electrodes say yes or no in the chats two same or different two same electrodes if i'm using the same electrodes what this cell will be called as it will be called as the concentration cell if it is a concentration cell what about the e naught cell what about the e naught cell that will be zero that will be zero e naught cell will be zero number 1 number 2 number 2 number 2 <clears throat> number two on the left side of the salt bridge this is your anode on the right side of the salt bridge this is your cathode anode cathode i identified my anode cathode after the identification of anode and cathode what exactly am i going to do what exactly am i going to do just look at the cell and tell me whether the concentration of electrolyte has been kept same or different different so which type of concentration cell it is when electrolyte is kept different it is the example of your electrolytic concentration cell involving which electrodes i would say involving involving metal metal ion electrode involving metal metal ion electrode something which you identified already now the same procedure i'm going to follow the same procedure what will be the reaction taking place at anode at anode zinc is getting converted into zinc dipositive so zinc solid getting converted into zinc dipositive whose concentration is c1 and there will be plus 2 electrons because reaction is taking place at anode similarly at cathode at cathode reduction zinc dipositive getting converted into zinc so zinc dipositive zinc dipositive whose concentration is c2 right it will be getting two electrons getting converted into zinc solid now people everything is same right electrons are same so i can directly add them up when i add them up what is something which i'll be getting two electrons two electrons cancel the zinc solid zinc solid cancel so i'll be getting zinc dipositive whose concentration is c2 it gives zinc dipositive whose concentration is c1 okay get the qc value qc will be simply c1 divided by c2 right what was c1 c1 is the concentration of electrolyte in anode and c2 is the concentration of electrolyte in cathode perfect if i want to get the n value n value is 2 now if i use the nernst equation now if i use the nernst equation i can say e cell is equal to e naught cell is 0 minus 0.0591 divided by n then it's log of qc what is qc qc here is c1 divided by c2 right so i'll say your e cell will be equal to 0.0591 divided by n minus times log right so take the reciprocal minus of this so it has to be c2 divided by c1 right this is my e cell this is my e cell this is my e cell for this concentration cell this is my e cell for this concentration cell now tell me one thing tell me one thing for this concentration cell to be working for this cell to be working for the reaction for the cell reactions 
to be spontaneous what has to be the condition condition is e cell has to be greater than zero e cell has to be greater than zero e cell can be only greater than zero if this term will be greater than zero if log of c2 divided by c1 is greater than zero when can be this particular term greater than zero this term will be only greater than zero when this whole term will be greater than one right if c2 divided by c1 will be greater than one which is telling you that c2 has to be greater than c1 what was c2 concentration of electrolyte in cathode what is c1 concentration of electrolyte in anode can i say that electrolytic concentration cell involving metal metal ion electrodes will work only its cell reactions will be spontaneous only if the concentration of electrolyte in cathode will be greater than that of concentration of electrolyte in anode can you understand one thing concentration of electrolyte in cathode has to be more since the electrodes are same but for the cell to be working concentration of electrolyte in cathode has to be more and concentration of electrolyte in anode has to be less if concentration of electrolyte in cathode is more, that means reduction process of cathode will be more. If concentration of electrolyte in anode is less, that means its reduction potential is less. One is having more reduction potential, one is having lesser reduction potential. Right? Perfect. So potential difference got created. If potential difference gets created, current will flow. Done and dusted, right? Someone is saying, where did that negative sign go? This was log of C1 by C2. When you multiply it with minus, you will be getting the reciprocal. It will be C2 by C1. Am I clear, people? Okay. This is your electrolytic concentration cell. Now, which one is left? Electrode concentration cell. Electrode concentration cell. What happens in electrode concentration cell? In electrode concentration cell, what do we do? Tell me that. In electrode concentration cell, what do we do? Concentration of electrolyte is kept same, but partial pressure is kept different. For example, I've got a cell like this. PT solid, comma. This is H2 gas, whose partial pressure is, for example, P1 bar. This is H positive, whose concentration is C molar. This is salt bridge on the right side. H positive, whose concentration is C molar. And this is H2 gas, whose partial pressure is E2 bar, right? This is again platinum salt. If you look at this cell carefully, if you look at this cell carefully, tell me, have I used same electrodes? Yes. So it's a concentration cell. If it's a concentration cell, directly one thing should strike your mind that E0 cell is zero. That E0 cell is zero, right? E0 cell is zero. Now, 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 concentration in both the containers is kept same, but Partial pressure is kept different. Pressure here is P1, here is P2. So which type of the cell is? It's your electrode concentration cell. And it is basically the example of electrode concentration cell which involves the hydrogen electrodes. Now the process you know. At anode what will happen? Oxidation. This is your anode. When hydrogen electrode behaves like the anode, what will be the reaction? H2 gas whose pressure is P1. It gives 2 times H positive whose concentration is C molar plus 2 electrons. This is the reaction at anode. Understand carefully. If I ask you what will be the reaction at cathode, I'll say at cathode reduction takes place. Reduction is gain of electrons. Gain of electrons. So reaction will be 2 times H positive whose concentration is C molar. It will be gaining 2 electrons and getting converted into H2 gas whose pressure is how much? Whose pressure is P2? Whose pressure is P2? Now if I ask you whether, whether, whether I can add these reactions? Absolutely, because electrons are balanced. Electrons are balanced. So this 2, 2 got cancelled, right? And this term, this term got cancelled because concentration is same. What am I left with? H2 with pressure P1 gives H2 with pressure P2. Okay, with pressure P2. Now, if I ask you about QC, QC will be simply P2 divided by P1. If I ask you the N value, N value is nothing but 2. E0 cell already we have calculated. E0 cell already we have calculated, right? Now, my dear students, if I ask you to use an earnest equation, E cell is equal to E naught cell is 0 minus 0 0.0591 divided by N. It is a log of QC. QC is P2 divided by P1. Now, if I multiply this mine with this log, if I multiply this minus with the log, it becomes log of, take the reciprocal, it is P1 divided by P2. So, this is how you calculate your E cell. 
This is how you calculate your E cell in case of your electrode conservation cells. Now, for this particular cell to be working, or I'll say for the cell reactions to be spontaneous, for the cell reactions to be spontaneous, E cell has to be greater than zero. E cell can be only greater than zero if this term is greater than zero. This term can be only greater than zero if this term is greater than one. So P1 divided by P2 has to be what? Greater than one, which tells you P1 has to be greater than P2. What is P1 and what is P2? P1 is the partial pressure of anode. P2 is the partial pressure of cathode. So partial pressure of anode has to be greater than that of partial pressure of cathode. Then only, then only E cell will come out to be positive. Then only cell reactions will be spontaneous. And therefore, the cell will work like a normal galvanic cell. Right? I hope I am absolutely clear. I hope I'm absolutely clear. <clears throat> I hope I'm absolutely clear, people. Okay? Now we are going to, to move into the next part. Okay, can you tell me the answer of this question? Guys, you should be able to, please. Don't break my heart here. Ah. What do you think is the answer of this question? <laughs> Break after this chapter, not now. This chapter I'll complete in two more hours. Okay, then I'll give you half an hour break. Tell me the answer. Check the cell first of all. Check the cell. Check the cell. Electrodes are same. So concentration cell. Uh, concentration is different. So electrolytic concentration cell. Electrolytic concentration cell involving? Electrolytic concentration cell involving? Metal, metal ion electrodes. For this cell to be working, concentration of electrolyte in cathode should be more than anode. Cathode here is C1. Anode here is C2. So C1 has to be greater than C2. Then only this cell will work like a normal galvanic cell. Then only this cell will produce current. Right? So, cell reactions will be spontaneous if C1 is greater than C2. A is correct. Right? Perfect? Right, guys? Number one. If C2 is greater than C1, if C2 is greater than C1, current flows from cathode to anode. If C1 was greater than C2, then it would be working normally like your galvanic cell in which current flows from cathode to anode. But this cannot be the answer. If C1 is greater than C2, if C1 is greater than C2, so concentration of electrolyte in cathode is more, right, than anode. So cell reactions will be spontaneous. If cell reactions are spontaneous, at anode oxidation takes place, at cathode reduction takes place, and current will flow, flow from cathode to anode. Cathode to anode, yes, this is correct. If C1 is equal to C2, if C1 is equal to C2, if concentration is same, there'll be no potential difference, right? Cell will not work. So A, C as well as D. A, C as well as D. Yeah, A, C as well as D. Now, people, I am going to move on to the electrolysis part. I hope all these things are absolutely clear. Right? I hope all these things are absolutely clear. Now, let's move on to the electrolysis part. To the electrolysis part. This is again important and it's simple at the same time. You'll understand it very easily. Okay? You'll understand it very easily. So, how this electrolysis, what is this electrolysis all about? Hey guys, for example, I'm going to take a container here. Try to understand carefully. In this container, I'm either going to take molten electrolyte or an aqueous electrolyte. I'm going to take either molten or aqueous. Let's say I'm taking molten NaCl. I'm taking molten NaCl. I'm taking molten NaCl. Molten NaCl means I'm taking NaCl liquid. This is the molten NaCl here. So if I ask you in this particular container, what all ions will be there? Na positive will be there. Cl negative will be there. In the same container, I'm introducing two electrodes. This is electrode number one. This is electrode number two. Electrode one, electrode two. Okay. Now my dear students, I'm connecting these electrodes to the external battery. This is the external battery. This is the external battery. That electrode which I'm connecting with the negative terminal will get negative charge. That one which is connected with the positive terminal gets the positive charge. 
this negatively charged rod over here, over here, is called as cathode. Is called as cathode right now. Earlier, in case of your Daniel cell, the negatively charged rod was your anode, but here it's cathode. And this positively charged rod here is anode. Okay. Now, at cathode, you know what happens? Reduction. At anode, what happens? Oxidation. Oxidation, right? So, first of all, this negatively charged rod will attract Na positive towards itself. And this positively charged rod will attract Cl negative towards itself. So, this negatively charged rod is attracting Na positive towards itself. So, this is cathode, right? At cathode, reduction takes place. So, so Na positive will undergo reduction here. So, at cathode, what is happening? Na positive will undergo reduction. What does that mean? Na positive will gain one electron and will get converted into Na solid. And this Na solid will get deposited over here. Okay. This Cl negative, it's going where? It's going to anode. At anode, oxidation takes place. Right? So, at anode, oxidation takes place. Oxidation means loss of electrons. So, Cl negative, when it goes to anode, it undergoes oxidation. It loses electron. And the reaction will be 2 times Cl negative gives Cl2 gas plus 2 electrons. This is the reaction at anode. Right? Now, my dear students, if you look carefully, what is the question which will be asked over here? What will be the question which will be asked? Question will be very simple. At anode, what happened? At cathode, what happened? So I'm just writing the conclusion. What is the conclusion here? Conclusion is at cathode, sodium metal is deposited. At cathode, sodium metal is deposited. Right? And at anode, what happened? At anode. Is metal being deposited or gas being liberated? Cl2, gas is liberated. Cl2, gas is liberated, right? This is something which is happening at cathode and this is something which is happening at anode. Am I loud and clear? Right? Am I clear? For example, for example, let's say I need to do the electrolysis of PBBr2. Imagine I need to do the electrolysis of PBBr2. Can you do it? Can you do it, people? So, first of all, again, in the container, I'll show you the similar way. I've got molten, right? Molten PBBr2. Lead bromide I have. It is molten PBBr2. Right? That means what kind of ions will be there? It's going to be PB di positive and Br negative ions. Now, here I'm introducing two rods. Right? Here I am introducing two rods. Perfect. Here I am introducing the two rods. Perfect. And my dear students, here you have got negative part. This is positive. Negative one here is called as cathode. And positive one here is called as anode. And you know what happens at anode and cathode. Oxidation, reduction, etc. etc. Right? Now you tell me. At cathode, you know reduction happens. At cathode, reduction happens. Reduction of what will happen? This negatively charged rod will attract this, right? So, Pb di positive will be gaining two electrons, will get converted into Pb. So, lead is being deposited at anode, at anode, at anode, at anode. This will go here. So, the reaction will be at anode oxidation will take place, right? So, 2 times Br negative gives what? It gives Br2 plus two electrons. So, what is happening? Conclusion is important. That's it. Conclusion is important. At cathode, lead is being deposited, right? And Br2 is being liberated. Am I clear? Am I clear? And this particular cell in which electrolysis is carried out, this particular cell in which electrolysis is carried out, what do you call this as? You call this as electrolytic cell. You call this as electrolytic cell. Now, my dear students, try to analyze things. Try to analyze things. Till now, I was talking about the molten, the molten. I was talking about the molten electrolytes. I did not introduce the aqueous electrolyte yet. I did not introduce the aqueous electrolyte yet. Right? See what happens when we introduce the aqueous electrolyte. Understand? Let's say I'm writing the heading as electrolysis. Electrolysis of, for example, aqueous NaCl. Electrolysis of aqueous NaCl. What is meant by electrolysis of aqueous NaCl? For example, I am taking the electrolytic cell. 
over here i am taking aqueous nacl right i am taking aqueous nacl nacl aqueous what does that mean nacl with water nacl with water if i ask you how many types of ions will be there there will be na positive surely there will be cl negative but there is water as well so there will be h positive as well as oh negative correct so there are two types of cations and two types of anions Someone is saying, how can a human see screen for more than five hours continue? How can a human stand for six hours continue? And talk. And at the same time, that human is fasting. Right? Why do you only think of yours? Done? Dusted? <clears throat> yeah? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to say? If yes, say it quickly. I'll answer. Where do I live? I am from Srinagar, JNK. I am from Kashmir. Let's continue. Let's continue, yeah? Okay? So do whatever, whatever I am saying, right? Because all these, this time is not going to come again, right? No way. <clears throat> okay, look at this particular scenario now. Which electrolyte did I take? I took aqueous electrolyte so basically in the container do we have uh two types of cations now yes we have got two types of cations we have got two types of anions as well right now my dear students what exactly i'm going to do at this particular point of time i'll take two electrodes i'll take two electrodes right i'll connect these electrodes with the battery so this is your negative this is your positive this negatively charged rod i'm calling as cathode here this is something I'm calling as anode, right? I'm calling as anode. You know what happens. At anode, what happens? At cathode, what happens? You know it, okay? At cathode, you know, a reduction takes place. At anode, what happens? Oxidation takes place. Now, now, so what is this negatively charged rod? Na positive as well as H positive would want to go, right? Towards this negatively charged rod, Na positive as well as H positive would want to go. Right? Agreed? They would want to go. Yes, they would want to go. But, but, I can say it like this. Na positive as well as H positive, both would want to undergo reduction here. Both would want to undergo reduction here. Similarly, Cl negative as well as OH negative, both would want to undergo oxidation here. But, a reduction of two cations is not possible. Similarly, oxidation of two anion is not possible. Oxidation is not possible for two. A reduction of two cations is not possible here. Oxidation of two anions is not possible here. Now the point is, 
among these two cations, among these two cations, which one will undergo oxid? Which one will undergo reduction? Similarly, among these two anions, among these two anions, which one will undergo oxidation? It depends on their discharge potential. It depends on the discharge potential of these ions. So first of all, you will have to remember the discharge potential series of cations and anions. What all cations I had? H positive and Na positive. H positive and Na positive. That cation will undergo reduction at cathode. That cation will undergo reduction at cathode, which has got lesser discharge potential. Lesser discharge potential. So this has got lesser discharge potential. It will undergo reduction. It will undergo reduction. Now, anions. Anions. What all anions I had? I had Cl negative and OH negative. Cl negative, OH negative. Which one has got lesser discharge potential? This one. So this will undergo oxidation. This will undergo oxidation. So I got to know, I got to know H positive. I got to know H positive is going to undergo. H positive is going to undergo what? H positive is going to undergo reduction. And it is your Cl negative which will undergo oxidation. I got to know my ions. One which will undergo reduction. This will undergo oxidation. Okay. Before writing the reactions, I want you guys to remember two reactions. Two more reactions I want you guys to remember. One is called as oxidation reaction of water. This is the oxidation reaction of water. And this is the reduction reaction of water. When water undergoes oxidation, O2 gas is produced. H positives are produced. And four electrons. Reduction reaction of water. H2 gas is produced. And O's negatives, here two electrons are gained. These two reactions I want you guys to remember directly without wasting any sort of time. Without wasting any sort of time. Am I loud and clear? Am I loud and clear? Okay. So my dear students, my dear students, I told you already, I told you already, I told you already, H positive will undergo reduction here. But this H positive has come from where? It has come from water. It has come from water. H positive has come from water. So I'll write the reduction reaction of water at cathode. And what is the re reduction reaction of water at cathode? This is the reduction reaction of water at cathode. This is the reaction which will be taking place at cathode. Okay, this is the reaction taking place at cathode. Similarly, similarly, if you ask me, sir, what about anode? At anode oxidation takes place. Oxidation of Cl negative will happen. Right? So the reaction will be simple. 2 times Cl negative. You Cl2 plus 2 electrons. This is the reaction which takes place at anode. So what are the conclusions? Conclusion is at cathode what is being liberated. If you see clearly at cathode H2 gas is being liberated. At cathode H2 gas is being liberated. And at your anode my dear students. What is being liberated? Cl2 gas is being liberated. Am I clear to everyone? Am I clear to everyone? Yes. Let me take one more example so that it becomes absolutely clear to you. Then only I can move on to the next topic. My dear students, let's say we are doing the electrolysis. Electrolysis of aqueous copper sulfate. Asha, by the way, whatever electrodes I was taking till now, those are inert electrodes. Right? Using inert electrodes. Okay, whatever electrolysis I showed you till now. Everywhere, I was taking what? I was taking inert electrode. Now, I believe you can do all the things easily here in this particular part. Tell me, you are using what? You are first of all taking your electrolytic cell. One is your anode, one is your cathode, you know it. Right? And over here, you have taken aqueous copper sulfate. That means in the container, there will be copper dipositive. There will be SO4 dinegative. There will be H positive. There will be OH negative. Right? Let's say this is your negative, this is positive. Perfect. This is your negative terminal, this is positive terminal. Negative terminal is what you call as cathode. Right? Positive terminal here is what you call as anode. And you already know all the things at cathode. Reduction is going to happen at anode. Oxidation is going to happen. Now, this negatively charged rod will try to attract this as well as this. So both these ions would want to undergo reduction here. But that one will undergo reduction which has got lesser discharge potential. 
copper dipositive has got lesser discharge potential so what will be the reaction at cathode i'll say at cathode copper dipositive will undergo reduction it will gain two electrons will get converted into copper solid so it is basically going to be copper solid which is going to get deposited here okay now at anode at anode what happens at anode at anode oxidation takes place at anode oxidation takes place right so this as well as this would want to undergo oxidation but but discharge potential of oh negative is less so it's going to be oh negative which will undergo oxidation but that oh negative has come from water so you will write the oxidation reaction of water here you will write the oxidation reaction of water here right and what is the oxidation reaction of water if you look carefully oxidation reaction of water is this one right and o2 gets liberated o2 gets liberated so what are the conclusions at the end conclusions are important that's it conclusions important that's it so at anode o2 gas gets liberated o2 gas gets liberated at anode and similarly at cathode copper solid it gets deposited can you do all these electrolysis can you do all these electrolysis can you do all these electrolysis now people actual part actual part actual part now from this discharge series you can do electrolysis of everyone by just remembering these discharge series right by remembering the discharge series right you can do all the possible things all the possible things all the possible things this question on electrolysis of dilute h2so4 using platinum electrode right the product obtained at anode at anode oxidation will take place what is the product at anode uh someone is saying but sir so4 is shown in the chart that its electrode its discharge potential is more i'm talking about lesser discharge potential that cation which has got lesser discharge potential right that will undergo reduction that anion which has got lesser discharge potential that will undergo oxidation lesser lesser right what is the answer of this question quick hello this is your homework question this you can check okay perfect people now this is something important faraday's first law of electrolysis from this faraday's first law questions are frequently asked now what faraday's first law of electrolysis is all about my dear students you saw during electrolysis what happens what do we do imagine this is your electrolytic cell imagine this is your electrolytic cell and you have taken electrolyte here okay these are your electrodes which you have connected with the external battery which you have connected with the external battery what this external battery does what this external battery does can i say it sends charge in the solution it sends charge in the solution due to which breakdown of electrolyte happens due to which breakdown of electrolyte happens due to which breakdown breakdown of electrolyte happens my dear students we observe till now at some electrodes metal gets deposited at some electrodes gas gets liberated we saw that we saw that right at some electrodes metal gets deposited at some electrodes gas gets liberated now this faraday's first law states that mass of the substance in grams mass of the substance in grams deposited or liberated at an electrode mass of the substance deposited or liberated at an electrode is directly proportional to the charge which goes into the solution more the charge going into the solution more will be the mass of substance either getting deposited or liberated okay now mass of substance deposited or liberated is equal to remove the proportionality use a constant z what is z here z is something which is equal to e divided by 96500 and z is something which we call as electrochemical equivalent electrochemical equivalent electrochemical equivalent so i'll say mass of substance deposited or liberated is equal to z is nothing but e divided by 96500 right divided by 96500 
perfect this is the first result which i would want you guys to remember from this result you will be getting a lot of questions right or 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 let me convert it in this form just a second i can say mass of substance deposited or liberated is equal to equivalent mass of the same substance equivalent mass of the same substance which is being deposited or liberated that will be molar mass of the substance divided by n factor multiplied by this is 96500 and over here this is q this is q or uh, just a second just a second i want to get the other result just a second equivalent mass of the substance i'm keeping it as such q will be nothing it will be current multiplied by time q is equal to it you know it divided by 966500 this expression please and please remember do remember this particular expression number 1 number 2 number 2 the second expression which i am going to make over here it is going to be mass of substance deposited or liberated is equal to what is e equivalent mass of the substance deposited or liberated which will be equal to molar mass of the substance divided by n factor of the substance here in the denominator 96500 here you have got i multiplied by t when you take m in the denominator here mass of substance deposited or liberated divided by molar mass of the same substance given mass by molar mass that is number of moles so number of moles will be i multiplied by t divided by n factor multiplied by 96500 right so sometimes you will be asked a question you will be asked a question calculate the moles of substance deposited or liberated is equal to i into t divided by n factor into 96500 sometimes you will be asked a question sometimes you will be asked a question calculate the calculate the volume of the gas liberated at stp calculate the volume of the gas liberated at stp what you will do you will calculate moles of the gas liberated you will multiply that with 22.4 liters at stp right sometimes volume of the gas liberated will be asked so calculate moles of the gas liberated and at the end multiply that with 22.4 you are done okay are you ready to do the questions with me before doing the questions understand one thing over here i introduced a term n factor n factor here right how do we calculate n factors you should know it as well how do you get the n factors you should know it as well see my dear students in this particular reaction imagine there's a balanced chemical equation in this equation how many electrons are being exchanged 12 12 moles of electrons are being exchanged right if i ask you calculate the n factor of a n factor of a will be moles of electrons exchanged divided by stoichiometric coefficient So six by one is six. If I ask you n factor of b, sorry, it's not six. It is twelve divided by one, right? It is twelve divided by one. That is twelve. That is twelve. If I ask you what about the n factor of b, n factor of b, n factor of b will be moles of electrons exchanged divided by stoichiometric coefficient six. If I ask you what is the n factor of c, moles of electrons exchanged divided by stoichiometric coefficient is three here. This is the n factor of C. N factor of D. Twelve divided by four is three. Twelve divided by six is two. This is how you are going to get the n factors. Moles of electrons exchanged divided by stoichiometric coefficient. Divided by stoichiometric coefficient, right? And people, look at the first question which we have. As per this question is concerned, we are doing the electrolysis of aqueous copper sulfate. We are doing the electrolysis of aqueous copper sulfate. So in the electrolytic cell, we have taken aqueous copper sulfate in which in which 1.5 amperes of current is going for 10 minutes what is the mass of copper deposited at cathode few minutes back we did the electrolysis of aqueous copper sulfate and we saw if you remember at cathode copper was getting deposited at cathode copper was getting deposited and in this question itself we have to calculate the mass of copper deposited the so mass of copper deposited in grams is equal to equivalent mass of copper multiplied by i multiplied by t Divided by nine six five double zero. This is the equation I'll be using, right? First thing, if you ask me, sir, what is the n factor of copper? N factor of copper is electrons exchanged. That's two divided by its stoichiometric coefficient is one. So its n factor is two. Number one. Number one. So mass of copper deposited here will be equal to equivalent mass of copper is molar mass of copper, which is sixty three point five divided by n factor of copper. That is two. Here it is nine six five double zero. current of 1.5 amperes is going in how much time in 10 minutes convert that into seconds so multiply it with 60 when you solve this did you solve this anyone so people are getting 0.3 grams right so 0.3 grams of copper is being deposited at cathode when you are doing this sort of the electrolysis 
राइट आई बिलीव आई एम क्लियर आई बिलीव आई एम क्लियर ओके सेकेंड टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन अच्छा बाई द वे बाई द वे वन मोर थिंग वन मोर थिंग If by chance they had asked you to calculate moles of copper deposited, right? If by chance they had asked you to calculate moles of copper deposited, you got the mass of copper deposited, mass of copper deposited divided by molar mass of copper. You will get number of moles of copper deposited. That's it. Isn't it simple, guys? Isn't it simple? Look at this question. Look at this question. <clears throat> one farad of electricity is passed. One farad. So charge is one farad. One farad means how many coulombs? Nine six five double zero coulombs. To a ten liter of solution, you have got an aqueous solution whose volume is ten liter of NaCl. Okay, calculate the pH of the solution. Calculate the pH of the solution. So basically, as per the equation is concerned, you have taken you have taken aqueous NaCl into the container, right? And you are doing its electrolysis. You are doing its electrolysis. When this electrolysis is done. What will be the pH of the final solution here in the container? What will be the pH of the final solution here in the container? That's something which I'm supposed to calculate. What will be the pH of the final solution in the container? My dear students, if you remember, we have done the electrolysis of aqueous NaCl, and look at the reaction. This is the reaction which will take place at anode, and this is the reaction which takes place at cathode. Right? Perfect. If you look carefully, if you look carefully. In this particular reaction, is there any H positive or OH negative? No. But, but, in this particular reaction, do you see H positive or OH negative? Yes. Through this particular reaction, OH negatives are liberated. OH negatives are liberated. Through this particular reaction, OH negatives are liberated. And those OH negatives will be basically going into the solution, which will be deciding the pH. Right? Now tell me. Can't we calculate number of moles of OH negative produced, which will be equal? Number of moles of OH negative produced will be equal to I into T. I into T is Q divided by uh, divided by n factor of OH negative multiplied by nine six five double zero. Right? This is the equation which I'll use. As simple as that. Now we will try to understand number of moles of OH negative liberated produced into the solution. Q is equal to one farad. Perfect. N factor of OH negative will be equal to two divided by two. That's one. And here you have got nine six five double zero as well. So the value comes out to be one. The value comes out to be one. So how many moles of OH negative are liberated into the solution? One mole of OH negative. Can't you calculate concentration of OH negative? What is concentration? I'll say moles of OH negative divided by volume of solution in liters. How many moles of OH negative are being liberated? One. What is the volume of the solution in liters? It is ten. So the value comes out to be ten raised per minus one molar. This is the concentration of OH negative. If you got the concentration of OH negative in the solution, can't you calculate pOH? P stands for minus log. So it will be minus log of OH negative. So it is minus log of ten raised per minus one. The value comes out to be one. This is pOH. You would have studied in your earlier classes. pH plus pOH. pH plus pOH is nothing but fourteen. So pH will be equal to fourteen minus pOH. So fourteen minus one comes out to be thirteen. So thirteen is the pH of the final solution. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Let me know in the chats quickly. Let me know in the chats quickly, everyone. Everyone, done with this? Let's see a few more questions. I want everyone to say it, people. Am I clear? Am I clear? Look at this one more question. Look at this question as well. How come that moles formula arises? I gave you the formula to calculate moles, right? Moles is equal to I multiplied by T divided by n factor into nine six five double zero. Instead of I multiplied by T, I wrote Q. Because Q is equal to I T, right? Okay. How much current is required? How much current is required to produce H two gas at the rate of one mL per liter at STP? As per the question, we have to produce how much? How many milliliters of H two gas? We have to produce one mL of H two gas, right? At STP. 
as per the question. We have to produce 1 ml of STP in how many seconds? 1 ml per second in 1 second. As per the question, we have to do the electrolysis and due to the electrolysis, 1 ml of H2 gas has to get produced in 1 second. 1 ml of H2 gas has to get produced in 1 second. If I ask you, how many moles of H2 should get produced? 1 divided by 22400. These many moles of H2 are supposed to get produced in 1 second. Right? These are the moles of H2 which are supposed to get produced in 1 second. These are the moles of H2 which are supposed to be liberated in 1 second. If I use the Faraday's first law, moles of H2 liberated will be equal to I multiplied by T divided by N factor of H2 multiplied by what? 96500. Tell me one thing. How many moles of H2 are supposed to be liberated? 1 divided by 22400. 1 divided by 22400 is equal to I multiplied by T. What is I? What is I? Current. Okay, current we have to calculate. Time is 1 second. N factor of H2. N factor of H2. It is 2 divided by 1. That's 2. Multiplied by 96500. When you calculate I from here, it will come out to be 8.61 amperes. So 816, 8.61 amperes. 8.61 amperes of current is required during the electrolysis. Then only 1 ml of H2 gas will be liberated in 1 second. Am I clear? Am I clear people? Am I clear to everyone? Am I clear to everyone? Now, <clears throat> Faraday's second law of electrolysis. What is Faraday's second law of electrolysis all about? See guys, first thing, first thing, the way we calculate number of moles of any substance, the way we calculate number of moles of any substance. In the similar way, you can calculate number of gram equivalents of the substance as well. Right? The way you calculate number of moles of some substance. In the similar way, you can calculate gram equivalents of the substance as well. How do you calculate gram equivalents? Gram equivalents of the substance is equal to mass of substance divided by equivalent mass of the substance. Something which you all must be knowing now. Right? How do you calculate gram equivalent? Mass of the substance. Gram equivalence of the substance is always equal to mass of the substance divided by equivalent mass of the substance. Now guys, what Faraday's second law is all about. Imagine you have got two or more than two electrolytic cells. Imagine you have got two or more than two electrolytic cells containing different electrolytes. Containing different electrolytes. So all these cells are containing different electrolytes. All these cells are containing different electrolytes. Now, I'm connecting these cells with the external battery. I'm connecting these cells with the external battery. Correct? Perfect. I'm connecting this with this, this with this. Negative. So this is negative. Positive. So this is positive, which makes this negative, which makes this positive, which makes this negative, which makes this positive. Perfect. All these containers are containing different electrolytes. If I ask you one thing, if I ask you one thing, are these cells in series or parallel? These cells are in series, right? If these cells are in series, can I say same current will be going in all the cells? Same current will be going in all the cells, right? Same current will be going in all the cells because it is a series combination. It is a series combination. It is a series combination. Right? Right, people? Am I clear? Am I clear? All these cells are in series. So same current will be going in all the solutions. As per Faraday's second law is concerned, gram equivalents, gram equivalents of substance deposited or liberated at every electrode will be the same. Assume that, imagine that, imagine that, imagine that, imagine that A is getting deposited here, B is getting liberated here. Imagine C is getting deposited, D is getting liberated. Imagine E is getting deposited, F is getting liberated. Now Faraday's second law says that 
gram equivalents of A deposited will be the same as that of gram equivalents of B liberated, which will be equal to gram equivalents of C deposited, which will be equal to gram equivalents of D liberated, which will be equal to this as well as this. That's all. That's all. Gram equivalents of substances deposited or liberated everywhere will be the same. Will be the same. Will be the same. Okay? Will be the same. This is the simple concept which has to be used in the questions. Or people, you can do like this as well. If you talk about the simple electrolysis, if you talk about the simple electrolysis, in case of simple electrolysis, in case of the simple electrolysis, wherein, wherein you take one container, electrolyte and the electrodes. Imagine, imagine something is getting deposited here and something is getting liberated here. Let's say A is getting deposited here, B is getting liberated here, right? So if I use Faraday's second law here, I can say gram equivalents of the A deposited should be always equal to gram equivalents of B liberated. So gram equivalents deposit or liberated everywhere are supposed to be the same. Okay, everywhere are supposed to be the same. Correct? For example, for example, one question which will clear everything. We are doing the electrolysis of aqueous CuSO4. Okay. The mass of the metal deposit is equal to uh, mass of the metal deposited. So when we do the electrolysis of aqueous CuSO4, this is the reaction which takes place at cathode. This is the reaction which takes place at anode. You should know it now. At cathode, copper gets deposited. At anode, O2 gas gets liberated. Right? At anode, O2 gas gets liberated. So, as per the equation, mass of the metal deposit, that means mass of copper deposit, has to be, it is equal to 63.5 grams. Calculate the mass of gas liberated. Gas is being liberated at anode. So, we have to calculate mass of O2 produced. Mass of O2 produced. Right? And at the same time, at the end, we'll have to calculate volume of O2 produced at STP as well. These are the two things which I'm supposed to calculate. My dear students, if you look carefully, if you look carefully, at your cathode, copper is getting deposited, at your anode, oxygen is getting liberated. Can I say gram equivalents? Can I say gram equivalents of copper deposited will be equal to gram equivalents of O2 liberated? Simple, right? Gram equivalents of copper will be equal to Mass of copper divided by equivalent mass of copper. Gram equivalence of O2 will be mass of O2 divided by equivalent mass of O2. Perfect, right? Now people, try to understand what I'm going to say. Mass of copper deposited is equal to 63.5 divided by equivalent mass of copper is equal to molar mass of copper divided by n factor of copper. 2 divided by 1 is 2 is equal to mass of O2 produced. I need to calculate divided by. Equivalent mass of O2, equivalent mass of O2 will be molar mass of O2 divided by n factor of O2. n factor of O2 will be uh, 2 divided by stoichiometric coefficient, that's 1 by 2. So the value comes out to be 4. So it's, I mean, n factor here is 4, right? So this term, this term cancel, 2 comes, comes up, right? This is 8, so this is 8 is equal to mass of O2 in grams. So I got to know mass of O2 produced will be nothing but 16 grams. Mass of O2 produced is equal to 16 grams. So this was one question. Second, volume of O2 produced. I calculate mass of O2 produced. If I ask you how many moles of O2 got produced, you will say mass of O2 produced divided by molar mass of O2. So 0.5 moles of O2 have been produced. So volume of O2 produced will be equal to moles of O2 produced multiplied by 22.4 liters. The value comes out to be exactly 11.2 liters. So 11.2 liters of O2 have been produced at STP. I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm clear. Okay. This question, can you give it a try? Should I be giving this question as the homework? Should I be giving this question as the homework? Yeah? 
Okay, say it. It is similar question. Three electrolytic cells are there, right? One concept has to be used. Gram equivalence, deposit or liberate, everywhere is same. Okay. Now comes the last part of this chapter, that is the conductance part. But I believe conductance part will do after a break. Okay. Let's take a quick break. But I would want every one of you to be back. I would want every one of you to be back. Break till. All Rosla, I'll be doing after the break, okay? Iram, you'll have to get the iftar and stuff and you'll have to do the iftar and stuff while watching the lecture. Okay? Or should we continue? Okay, let's continue for one more hour. People are saying, let's continue for one more hour. Okay, let's continue for one more hour. <clears throat> All right, now we are going to talk about the conductance part. We are going to talk about the conductance part. Guys, have a proper eye on this particular part as well because questions are frequently asked. Questions are frequently asked. Okay. My dear students, imagine Imagine I'm going to take an electrolytic cell. Imagine I'm going to take an electrolytic cell. This is the electrolytic cell which I'm taking over here. For example, these are the plates, which are my electrodes. This is one of the plate. This is one more plate, right? This is one more plate. Okay. I'm assuming I'm assuming we have got an electrolyte present in this particular container. And this is connected with the external battery. So this is negative, this is positive. One is negative, one is positive. One is negative, one is positive. Let's try to do one thing. Let's try to do one thing. If you look carefully, see what I'm doing and tell me what exactly I'm doing. Or just a second. Do you see we got a cube over here? Do you see we got a cube over here? Do you see that we got a cube over here? Can I say this cube, it contains electrolyte. I'll make this cube separately now. I took this cube out and I'm making it separately. I took the cube out and I made it separately. Okay. This particular plate carries with charge? Negative. This particular plate carries with charge? Positive. In this cube, what do we have? We have got electrolytic solution here. In this cube. Let's say the distance between these electrodes is represented by L. Let's say it's L centimeters. Okay. Let's say this area of cross section. This is the area of cross-section of the plate which is there in the solution. This is that area of cross-section of the electrode which is there in the solution. Let's say that is a centimeter square. Perfect. This particular cell is something which you call as conductivity cell. This is what you call as conductivity cell. Now for this conductivity cell, we are going to define certain terminology. Number one, first terminology. Resistance offered by the conductivity cell. You know this. 
resistance offered by the conductivity cell r will be equal to how much will be equal to how much <clears throat> how do you calculate this quick r is equal to rho l divided by a resistance offered by this conductivity cell r is equal to rho l divided by a what are the units of this resistance over here it is going to be ohm or you are going to represent it like this perfect point number one point number two <clears throat> point number two if for example if for example if for example l is equal to one centimeter a is equal to one centimeter square i hope you know what is l and what is a this is l and this a right at that point of time can i say volume of the cube is one centimeter cube can i say in the container we have got one centimeter cube of electrolyte present right i'll say resistance offered by this much of electrolyte resistance offered by this much of electrolyte is called as resistivity at this point of time r is equal to rho so what is rho rho is something which you call as resistivity right resistivity is nothing it is the resistance of this particular unit cube it is the resistance it is the resistance of this particular unit cube which contains which contains one centimeter cube of the electrolytic solution okay now guys if you understand carefully if you understand carefully can you calculate can you get r from here right i'll say simply uh, sorry rho is equal to ra divided by ra divided by l you can do that rho is equal to rho is equal to r right rho is equal to r here you defined it now if you want to define the resistivity if you define the resistivity resistivity is nothing but rho rho can be calculated as r a divided by l r a divided by l now if you ask me what are these units this is ohm centimeter square this centimeter right so it's going to be ohm centimeter it's going to be ohm centimeter resistivity this is your resistivity now if you ask me what about conductance what about conductance conductance is represented by g and conductance is defined as inverse of resistance conductance is defined as inverse of resistance right so it's going to be 1 divided by r is nothing but rho a divided by rho l by a so rho l divided by a so that a comes up perfect if you ask me what are going to be the units of this conductance 1 divided by r right either you call it a simon or you call it as ohm inverse or you can call it as mo the choice is all yours the choice is all yours okay choice is all yours this was your conductance this was your conductance now guys there is one more point that is conductivity conductivity which is represented by kappa conductivity kappa conductivity how do we get it conductivity is defined as inverse of resistivity inverse of resistivity right inverse of resistivity and you already know 1 divided by what is the resistivity what is rho rho is r a divided by l rho is r a divided by l so that l comes up or you can write it like this 1 divided by r multiplied by l by a this is one very important result which you are going to remember from now onwards. Kappa is equal to 1 divided by r multiplied by l by a. Either you will remember the result in this format or you can remember it like this. Kappa is equal to 1 by r is nothing. It is your uh, capacity, uh, what do I call this as? Conductance. 1 by r is conductance multiplied by l by a. Perfect. Now, if you want to have a look at the units, Conductance unit is Simon. This is centimeter. This is centimeter square. So Simon centimeter inverse. Or, or instead of Simon, you can write Mo. Mo centimeter inverse. Or you can write Ohm inverse centimeter inverse. Perfect. And this L divided by A. L divided by A combinedly, I'll be calling it as cell constant. 
combinedly i'll be calling it a cell constant and the units of cell constant here will be centimeter inverse because this is centimeter this is centimeter square so it has to be centimeter inverse so this was your conductivity this was your conductivity now comes one more term that's called as that's called as molar conductance or you can call it as molar conductivity as well molar conductivity which is represented by lambda m which is represented by lambda m how do you exactly define it and i'm not showing you the questions yet i'll show you the questions in some time okay just take a note of all these things first of all <clears throat> molar conductance molar conductance is defined as the conductance shown by the solution conductance shown by the solution when one mole of electrolyte it is a conductance shown by the solution when one mole of electrolyte is present when one mole of the electrolyte is present in a given volume of solution in a given volume of solution for example what it means what it means my dear students if this is the conductivity cell this is the conductivity cell right imagine volume of the solution here inside this conductivity cell is v centimeter cube i'm assuming in this solution there is one mole of electrolyte present one mole of electrolyte is present in for example in a given volume of solution whatever conductance this solution shows at this point of time when one mole of electrolyte is present in a given volume of solution that conductance shown by the electrolyte is something which you call as molar conductivity so what is molar conductivity what is molar conductivity it is basically the conductance shown by one mole of the electrolyte in a given volume of solution okay right now its result is important and you will be directly remembering that i'm not deriving any results here okay so lambda m is equal to kappa multiplied by 1000 divided by molarity this result you will be using when this result you will be using when you have to calculate molar conductivity in simon centimeter square per mole but by chance if they ask you to calculate molar conductivity in simon meter square per mole how do you do it how do you do it the formula gets changed and remember it directly lambda m is equal to kappa divided by 1000 multiplied by molarity okay perfect this is all about your molar conductivity this is all about your molar conductivity similarly there is something called as equivalent conductivity there is something called as equivalent conductivity there is something called as equivalent conductivity equivalent conductivity equivalent conductivity is represented by lambda eq equivalent conductivity is represented by lambda eq now how do you define it equivalent conductivity is simple defined like this the conductance the conductance shown by shown by the electrolytic solution when one gram equivalent of electrolyte when one gram equivalent of electrolyte is present is present in a given volume of solution in a given volume of solution and my dear students what it means exactly if you look at the earlier case if you look at the earlier case i took one mole of electrolyte here in the container now instead of one mole imagine that i'm taking one gram equivalent I'm taking one gram equivalent of electrolyte in this chamber, right? Let's say one gram equivalent of electrolyte is present in a given volume of solution. Whatever conductance it will be showing at that point of time, that is something which you'll be calling as equivalent conductivity. That's something which you'll be calling as equivalent conductivity. And it's a result, it's pretty much simple. It's kappa multiplied by 1000 divided by normality, right? When lambda EQ has to be calculated in Simon centimeter square per equivalent, right? Or lambda eq can be written as kappa divided by kappa divided by thousand multiplied by normality when lambda eq has to be calculated in simon meter square per equivalent these are the two results which i would want you guys to remember directly
which I would want you guys to remember directly. I believe it's clear. Yeah. Right, people? At the same time, since you got to know lambda EQ, since you got to know lambda EQ is equal to kappa multiplied by 1000 divided by normality, right? Instead of normality, can I write normality is nothing but molarity multiplied by n factor? Right, normality is molarity multiplied by n factor. You should be knowing it. Normality is equal to molarity multiplied by n factor. What do you call this particular term as? I'll write lambda EQ is equal to this particular term is what you call as lambda m, motor conductivity divided by n factor. This is the direct result by means of which you can relate motor conductivity and equivalent conductivity of a solution, of an electrolytic solution. Right? Yeah? Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Let's try to do the questions so that you'll understand what all these things exactly are all about. Look at the first question. Look at the question, people. The first question says that the specific conductance. Specific conductance means conductivity. Specific conductance means conductivity. Conductivity. Of a 0.1 molar solution of MgCl2 is 0.009 time and centimeter inverse. Cell electrodes of area of cross section 1.5 centimeter square and placed 0.5 centimeters apart in MgCl2 solution, right? How much current should flow? A potential difference between the electrodes is 5 volt, 5 volt. We have to calculate how much current, how much current. Yeah, how much current? Can you let me know how do I calculate current? Current can be calculated with the help of Ohm's law. I is equal to V divided by R. Potential difference is given, 5 volt. It is just, I just have to calculate resistance. How do I calculate resistance? How do I calculate resistance? You know? Uh, I gave you a result few minutes back. Uh, conductivity is equal to 1 divided by R multiplied by L divided by A, right? Well, conductivity as per the equation is given, 0 0.009 is equal to 1 divided by R multiplied by L by A. L is 0 0.5. A is how much? 1.5. So from this particular equation, can't you calculate R? Right? R will come in ohm. And when you calculate R, put it here, you'll be getting the current in amperes. Done? You'll be getting current in amperes. So when you see its exact solution, it'll be at the end, 0 0.135 amperes is going to be the answer. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? One more question. <clears throat> One more question. Hello, this is easier only. Calculate the conductivity and equivalent conductivity. Let me see some other question. Comparatively difficult. Not difficult though, which will take time. Okay, look at this question. The equivalent conductivity, the equivalent conductivity of 0 0.1 normal solution of CaI2, so lambda EQ, is given as 100 Simon centimeter square per equivalent. Cell constant is also given as per the question, 0 0.25 centimeter inverse. How much current will flow when the potential difference is kept 5 volts? How much current will flow? How much current will flow? I, you have to calculate again. So, I is nothing but V divided by R. I is nothing but V divided by R. What is V? V is 5. R, I need to calculate. Now, how do I calculate R? How do I calculate resistance? Resistance is there in only one formula, if you see. Resistance is there in only one formula, if you see. Uh, the formula is, conductivity is equal to 1 divided by R multiplied by L by A. No doubt, L by A is given. But K is not given. So, you cannot calculate resistance from here. So it is better to calculate K first. It is better to calculate K first. From where you will calculate K? As per the equation, lambda EQ is given. Lambda EQ is nothing. It is kappa multiplied by 1000 divided by normality. Right? So from here, lambda EQ is given. Lambda EQ is given as per the equation. Normality is given. 0 0.1. Right? So from here you can calculate conductivity part. K you can calculate in Simon centimeter inverse. When you calculate this K, you can put this K here. L by is already given, so you can get the R, resistance you can get. And once you get R, put the value of R here, you can get the current in amperes. Guys, isn't it again simple?
Isn't it simple again? So what will be the final answer? It will be 0 0.2 amperes, right? Final answer will be how much? 0 0.2 amperes. First you are getting the conductivity, then you are getting the resistance, then you are getting the current. Okay? I'm just manipulating the formulas, nothing else. I'm just manipulating the formulas. I'm doing nothing else. Nothing I'm doing. Now, what is the effect of dilution on molar conductivity? Right? Effect of dilution on molar conductivity. My dear students, it's pretty much simple. Or you can directly rem remember as well. You can directly remember as well. Let's not stretch the things. Let me just tell you two, three points which are of use to you. Let's not use, let's not divert, let's not explain a lot of things. Whatever is required, let's stick to that. First of all, imagine in the conductivity cell, you have a strong electrolyte. Imagine in the conductivity cell, you have got a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolyte. If you do the dilution, with the dilution, with the dilution, with dilution. I'll be asking you the questions. You be active in the charts. I'll be asking you. With the dilution, when you dilute, when you add more solvent, when you add more solvent, when you add more solvent, positive and negatively charged ions, positively and negatively charged ions in the conductivity cell, which were given by the strong electrolyte, will they come close or they go far? They will go far from each other and when positive and negatively charged ions will go far distance between them increases force of attraction decreases if force of attraction decreases can i say ions now will freely move and when ions will freely move what will happen to the molar conductivity molar conductivity will increase molar conductivity will increase as simple as that Right? This is the logic for strong electrolyte. This is the logic for strong electrolyte. Imagine you have taken a conductivity cell. There is one mole of strong electrolyte in a given volume of solution. Now you are diluting it. You are diluting it. You are adding more solvent. Ions, oppositely charged ions will, be, will go far. Right? Distance between them increases. Force of attraction decreases. Ions now can move freely. Molar conductivity automatically increases. Okay? Now if you talk about the weak electrolyte, if you talk about the weak electrolyte, imagine one mole of weak electrolyte is there in the container. Imagine one mole of weak electrolyte is there in the container. Okay, imagine one mole of weak electrolyte is there in the container. With dilution, weak electrolyte is the one which partially dissociates. Weak electrolyte is the one which partially dissociates, which does not dissociate 100%. Right? With the dilution, with dilution, you should be knowing degree of dissociation of weak electrolyte that increases with the dissociation with the dilution degree of ionization degree of dissociation of weak electrolyte that increases that means the weak electrolyte gets more and more converted into ions right therefore number of ions therefore number of ions in the solution will increase if more ions are getting in the solution that means more is going to be the molar conductivity more is going to be the molar conductivity more is going to be the molar conductivity. Am I clear? So molar conductivity of strong electrolyte as well as weak electrolytes with dilution increases. But reasons are different. Reasons are different. Reasons are different people. Reasons are different. Am I clear? Am I clear? Now, if you look carefully, if you look carefully, in case of strong electrolyte, in case of strong electrolyte, when you keep on doing the dilution, when you keep on adding the solvent, ions are going far, ions are going far, ions are going far, distance is increasing, force of attraction is decreasing. Can we say there will be a stage when the ions will be at infinite distance apart? There will be a stage when ions will be at infinite distance apart and when the ions are at infinite distance apart, force of attraction between them is zero. At that point of time, ions can move freely. There will be no force of attraction. When I say the molar conductivity at that point will be the maximum when there is no force of attraction between the ions. 
right? That maximum molar conductivity is something which you call as molar conductivity at infinite dilution, right? That's something which is called as molar conductivity at infinite dilution. I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. When you continuously keep on diluting the solution, ions of the strong electrolyte, they're going far, far, far. There'll be a time when the oppositely charged ions will be at infinite distance apart. Infinite distance apart. Force of attraction will be zero. Force of attraction will be zero. Ions are going to move freely now. No, attra no interactions at all. Ions are freely going to move. So molar conductivity at that point of time will be the maximum and that maximum molar conductivity is called as molar conductivity at infinite dilution. Lambda M or lambda naught M. Lambda M or lambda naught M. Am I clear? Am I clear people? Okay, one more thing. <clears throat> one more thing. For example, I want to draw the I want to draw the graph between molar conductivity versus under root of C, where C is the concentration. What is concentration? Number of moles per unit of volume. Let's say I'm drawing the curve for the strong electrolyte. For the strong electrolyte. Concentration is number of moles per unit volume. Perfect. Now guys, I need to draw this curve for what? For the strong electrolyte. For the strong electrolyte. First of all, if you look at this particular point, if you look at this particular point, at this point, a root C value is 0. If root C is 0, that means C is 0. That means C is 0. If C is 0, that means volume of the solution is infinite. Volume of the solution is infinite. That means right now I'm talking about the infinite dilution. At infinite dilution, is the molar conductivity maximum? Yes, at infinite dilution, the molar conductivity is maximum. Let's say this is the maximum value of molar conductivity here. Right? Or I'll directly say at infinite dilution. At, at infinite dilution. Molar conductivity is maximum, which is equal to lambda naught m or lambda infinite m. Now when you come forward, in the forward direction, root c is increasing. If root c is increasing in the forward direction, if root c is increasing, if root c is increasing in the forward direction, that means c is increasing. C increasing means volume decreasing. Volume of the solution is decreasing. If volume of the solution is decreasing, that means oppositely charged ions are coming closer. Distance between them is decreasing. Force of attraction is increasing. If force of attraction is increasing, that means ions cannot move freely now. If ions cannot move freely now, that means molar conductivity is decreasing. That means molar conductivity is decreasing. Right? So when you go in the forward direction, molar conductivity here will decrease. Molar conductivity will decrease like this. And when you extrapolate it, when you extrapolate it over here, this particular value is the maximum molar conductivity, right? Which is also called as molar conductivity at infinite dilution for a strong electrolyte. Yeah? Is it clear? This for strong electrolyte. I hope you got to know how this curve is formed. Now there is one statement, guys. This curve, this curve, it looks like a straight line with a negative slope. So its equation has to be y is equal to minus mx plus c. What is y here? Y is your lambda m right is equal what is c c is the intercept from here to here which is lambda naught m lambda naught m what is this minus let's say intercept i mean let's say the slope over here is a what is x x is root c x is root c this equation is something which is valid for strong electrolyte and this is something which you call as d by huckel equation this is something which you call as d by huckel equation am i clear this is something which you call as D by Huckel equation. Right? Perfect. Now, my dear students, when you make the similar curve for the weak electrolyte, when you make the similar curve for weak electrolyte, lambda m versus root c, lambda m versus root c, it comes out to be hyperbola. It comes out to be hyperbola. If it is hyperbola, that means it's starting somewhere from infinity. That means it's starting somewhere from infinity. What does that mean? If you extrapolate also, you cannot get the molar conductivity at infinite dilution from this graph. It is for weak electrolyte. Right? You cannot get molar conductivity at infinite dilution for a weak electrolyte. 
for a weak electrolyte from this particular graph from this particular graph but for a strong electrolyte we can get what did we do we extrapolated and we got motor conductivity in different dilution but for weak electrolyte for weak electrolyte you cannot get it from the graph now in order to get the molar conductivity of weak electrolyte at infinite dilution we are going to introduce a law that's what you call as kohl ross law so first of all you tell me why am i going to introduce the kohl ross law quick why am i going to introduce the kohl, kohl ross law quickly tell me i already told you the logic So, Kohl Ross law is mainly given for what purpose? To calculate the molar conductivity at infinite dilution for the weak electrolyte. Because from the graph, we are unable to do that. From the graph, we are unable to do that. Right? Now, what is Kohl Ross law all about? <clears throat> Have a look at the definition. It's pretty much simple, guys. It is pretty much simple. See, this is something which I was making you understand. This is for strong leg light this for weak leg light right okay so lambda naught m for the weak leg light cannot be found from the intercept in case of weak leg lights right but for the strong leg lights you can do that anyways what am i introducing now i'm introducing the kohl ross law i'm using the i'm introducing the kohl ross law just a second I'm introducing the Kohl Ross law. My dear students, what this Kohl Ross law exactly is all about? Look at the definition. The equivalent conductivity, the equivalent conductivity of any electrolyte, the equivalent conductivity of any electrolyte at infinite dilution, at infinite dilution, is the sum of equivalent conductivities of their ions. What is meant by that? What is meant by that? Just a second. Just a second, guys. See, guys, what it exactly means. See what it exactly means. For example, you have taken an electrolyte. This is the electrolyte here. This is the electrolyte here, right? Now, imagine you have done the infinite dilution of the electrolyte. Okay? Let's say you have done infinite dilution of the electrolyte electrolyte is ab right which contains your cation and anion which contains your cation and anion right now if you have done the infinite dilution if you have done the infinite dilution can i say can i say molar conductivity or equivalent conductivity both will have maximum value at that point of time I'm talking about equivalent conductivity. Equivalent conductivity at infinite dilution will be equal to. At equivalent, at, at, at infinite dilution, will there be any force of attraction between the ions? At infinite dilution, the oppositely charged ion will be at infinite distance apart. There will be no force of attraction. They are free to move. They are free to move. They are free to move. So can I say, equivalent conductivity at infinite dilution, as per kohl ross law, is the sum of the equivalent conductivities of their cations and anions again at infinite dilution again at infinite dilution did you get this point did you get this point people did you get this particular point see guys here we have to analyze certain things i'm going to turn the lights off because electricity is gone Guys, this is something important. See, I'll make it clear a little more. I'll make it clear a little more. Understand. 
For example, you have got the electrolyte like this, AXBY. Tell me how this AXBY undergoes dissociation. X times AY positive plus Y times BX negative. Okay. Now there are certain ways of writing Kohl-Ross law. Certain ways are there. I can write equivalent conductivity at infinite dilution of your electrolyte is the sum of is the sum of equivalent conductivities of its ions. This is one of the statement. It can be written like this. Lambda naught EQ of B negative. This is one way. This is one way. Right? Now, if you want to write molar conductivity, molar conductivity at infinite dilution of AXBY will be equal to molar conductivity here. Then you have to take these stoichiometric coefficients into consideration. So you'll write X times molar conductivity at infinite dilution of AY positive plus this is Y times molar conductivity at infinite dilution of BX negative. Right? Of BX negative. Of BX negative. You need to know how to write all these statements because there will be different, different types of the equations. There will be different, different types of the equations. Okay? Correct? Correct, people? There is one more result as well which I told you already if you remember. Equivalent conductivity is equal to molar conductivity divided by n factor of the electrolyte. Right? If you talk about it at the infinite dilution, this result sometimes works as well. Perfect? Right? This is going to be the direct result between the two. If you know the n factor of the electrolyte, you can, you can solve all the things. You can solve all the things. You can solve all the things from here. Am I, am I, am I clear people? Am I clear till here? Am I clear till here? Am I clear till here? There are three applications of the Kohl-Ross law, which are very important, which you need to remember, which you need to know, right? There are three. There are three applications of the cold law. I'll give, I'll give you the break after half an hour. In half an hour, I'll complete this chapter. Then I'll give you the break for half an hour, okay? At 6.35 or 6.40, I'll give you the break. Then we'll take half an hour break. Then we'll come back with the solution chapter. My dear students, the first application of it is the calculation. cold law is used to calculate, to calculate the conductance of the weak electrolyte at infinite dilution. What I told you, if you want to calculate the molar conductivity of the weak electrolyte at infinite dilution, you can do that with the help of Kohl-Ross law. And how exactly? How exactly? See guys, as per this particular scenario, molar conductivity at infinite dilution of HCl is given. Understand, molar conductivity at infinite dilution of HCl is given. Is given, right? It will be molar conductivity of H positive plus molar conductivity of uh, CL negative. Since HCl breaks as H positive plus CL negative, there, is no, there are no stoichiometric coefficients. And this particular value is given to me as 426. I'm not writing the units, okay? At the same time, lambda naught M, lambda naught M of NaCl, which NaCl breaks as Na positive CL plus CL negative. Stoichiometric coefficients are 1. So, it is Na positive plus lambda naught M of, lambda naught M of CL negative. This value is also given as 126. Similarly, similarly, molar conductivity at infinite dilution of the salt, CH3CONA, it can be mentioned as lambda naught M of CH3CO negative plus lambda naught M of what? Lambda naught M of Na positive. And this value is given to us as how much? 91. 91 Simon cent cent centimeter square per mole. I am supposed to calculate the molar conductivity at infinite dilution for the weak electrolyte. This is the weak electrolyte. I am supposed to calculate its molar conductivity. How do we do it? How do we do it? How do we do it? I need to calculate lambda naught m of CH3COH. So basically I need to form this. Lambda naught m of CH3CO negative plus lambda naught m of H positive. This is something which I need to calculate. This value I need to calculate. Perfect. It is basically lambda naught m of ch 3 coh Now, how do I get these two? How do I get these two? What do I need to do here? 
what do i need to do here first of all first of all uh just a second if i call this as equation 1 if i call this as equation 2 if i call this as equation 3 if i just do one algorithm if i do equation 1 equation 1 plus equation 3 plus equation 3 minus equation 2 let's see what do we get equation 1 is basically lambda not of h positive plus lambda not of cl negative right plus 3 plus 3 means lambda not of ch3 co negative right plus lambda not of na positive so plus 3 minus minus 2 minus 2 means na positive and then it's minus cl negative if you see cl negative cl negative cancel na positive na positive cancel what i'm left with i'm left with the same thing what i was supposed to get lambda not m of ch3 co negative plus lambda not m of h of na h positive perfect so this equation i am getting when i am doing this algorithm 1 plus 3 minus 2 same operation you'll be doing with their lambda not values so 1 is 426 3 is 91 and 2 is 126 solve this get the value of lambda not m of ch3 cooh if i am clear let me know once in the chats if i am clear let me know quickly in the chat If I'm clear, let me know quickly in the chats. Everyone, people, everyone, everyone. This was the first application of the Cohen-Ross law. Second application is, in order to calculate the degree of dissociation of the weak electrolyte, degree of dissociation of the weak electrolyte is equal to, is equal. To, remember the formula directly. Molar conductivity of the weak electrolyte at a given concentration. Divide by molar conductivity of the same weak electrolyte at infinite dilution. For example, I've got CH three COH. Okay, when I'm keeping its concentration, for example, one molar. Let's say its molar conductivity is, for example, five uh, Simon centimeter square per mole. Let's say. Now at infinite dilution, definitely will be more. Definitely will be more at infinite dilution. At infinite dilution, molar conductance is maximum. Let's say it is thousand Simon centimeter square per mole. If you know this is this is the molar conductivity of CH three COH at a particular concentration, this is the molar conductivity of the same CH three COH at infinite dilution. I know both the things. I can calculate lambda for CH three COH molar conductivity at a given concentration five divided by molar conductivity of the same electrolyte at infinite dilution. That's thousand five by thousand will give you the value of alpha degree of dissociation of the weak electrolyte, right? Degree of dissociation of the weak electrolyte, right, people? perfect now here you can do one more thing you can do one more thing people you can do one more thing for example for example you have got a weak electrolyte ab you have got a weak electrolyte if it is a weak electrolyte it is going to remain in equilibrium with its ions its ions are a positive aqueous and b negative aqueous i have taken a weak electrolyte which is in equilibrium with its ions imagine its concentration initially is c this is zero this is zero degree of ionization is alpha so this is c minus c alpha This will be C alpha. This will be C alpha. Correct? C minus C alpha. C alpha. C alpha. Now ionization constant of this weak electrolyte Ki will be equal to concentration of A positive C alpha, concentration of B negative C alpha divided by concentration of this C minus C alpha. So finally, after solving, it comes out to be C alpha square divided by one minus alpha. This is the ionization constant of the weak electrolyte. Now, now, my dear students, the weak electrolyte which I have taken. if you know its molar conductivity at a given concentration if you know molar con conductivity at given concentration and at the same time if you know its molar conductivity at infinite dilution right you can further modify this you know your alpha of the weak electrolyte is equal to molar conductivity of this weak electrolyte at a given concentration molar conductivity of the given electrolyte at infinite dilution so alpha we know if you put alpha here you will be getting a final result ki is equal to c alpha square Alpha square is molar conductivity at a given concentration. Ka square, right? Divided by, divided by what? Divided by lambda not m ka square as well. Perfect. And in the denominator, it is one minus alpha. Alpha is molar conductivity at a given concentration divided by molar conductivity at infinite dilution. Perfect. 
दिस इज इक्वल दिस इक्वल दिस विल फाइनली कम आउट बी लैमडा एम सी का स्क्वायर डिवाइडेड बाय डिवाइडेड बाय डिवाइड बाय इट्स गोइंग टू बी लैमडा नॉट एम माइनस लैमडा एम सी एंड ओवर हेयर इट इज गोइंग टू बी लैमडा नॉट एम आई डी स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज हाउ यू कैलकुलेट This is how you calculate ionization constant of a weak electrolyte with the help of, with the help of, with the help of molar conductivities. This is one general result which you have to remember. This is one general result which you need to remember. ओके एम आई क्लियर पीपल टिल हेयर एम आई क्लियर टिल हेयर आई शो यू द एग्जाम्पल ऑल्सो आई मीन यू जस्ट हाउ टू नो हाउ टू मेक दीज एक्सप्रेस इफ यू गेट द आयोन आई मीन इफ यू गेट अ वी क्लिक लाइट it's ionization constant you should be able to write in terms of lambda m and lambda not okay in terms of lambda m and lambda not i hope i'm clear with this i'm moving ahead i'm moving ahead my dear students there is one more application of the cole ross law one more application i'll be giving you directly the result and after that we'll see the questions i'll be giving you the result and we'll see the questions calculation of molar conductivity calculation of molar conductivity of a sparingly soluble salt sparingly soluble salt that salt whose solubility is very 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 less right calculation of a, of molar conductivity of a sparingly soluble salt at infinite dilution If you will be having a sparingly soluble salt, how do you calculate its molar conductivity? How do you calculate its molar conductivity? Direct result I'm giving you: molar conductivity of a sparingly soluble salt, right, at infinite dilution is equal to is equal to is equal to same kappa multiplied by thousand divided by solubility divided by solubility perfect solubility of the sparingly soluble salt, or you can directly say it like this. Kappa multiplied by thousand divided by molarity. Remember these two expressions directly, and let's utilize them in the question. Let's utilize them in the questions. No need to give it a lot of thought. No need to give it a lot of thought. Guys, after this chapter, one chapter is remaining, which we'll do after some time, right? But let's try to do certain questions first of all. Let's try to do certain questions first of all. Tell me the answer of this particular question. Tell me the answer of this particular question. Tell me the answer of this particular question. Ajit, Navin, batteries. I won't be doing here. Battery is something which you will read from NCERT. These are two. Those are two, three paragraphs. You have to remember them. There is nothing to teach in batteries. You have to mug up them. Okay. There is nothing to teach there. and by the way i want everyone to be present tomorrow in the present in the tomorrow session yeah okay limiting molar conductivity of ca di positive cl negative or this okay the value of limiting molar conductivity of cacl2 first of all how cacl2 undergoes dissociation you should know it first of all how cacl2 undergoes dissociation ca di positive plus 2 times cl negative i need to calculate molar conductivity of cacl2 at infinite dilution how exactly you are going to do it it's going to be 1 Multiplied by molar conductivity at infinite dilution of calcium di positive plus two molar conductivity at infinite dilution or Cl negative, right? This is equal to Ca di positive is given. How much? Something something. How much? Under nineteen plus two times seventy six point three. Just solve this. The value you'll be getting in Simon centimeter square per mole. Is it clear? Simple, right? a simple question this is a simple question this is okay look at this particular question 
look at this particular equation. You should be able to solve this one as well. Yes, tomorrow 10 a.m. the problem solving session will start. Okay, guys, what do you think about this one? Molder conductivity of Al2SO4 whole thrice. First of all, you should know how Al2SO4 whole thrice undergoes dissociation. Al2SO4 whole thrice will undergo dissociation as 2 times Al tri positive plus 3 times SO4 dinegative. Correct? So, molar conductivity at infinite dilution of Al2SO4 whole thrice will be equal to 2 times the molar conductivity at infinite dilution of Al tri positive plus 3 times the molar conductivity at infinite dilution of SO4 dinegative. Right? This term is given as per the equation which is 858 is equal to 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by this is something which we are supposed to calculate let's call this as x let's call this as x plus 3 times plus 3 times so4 dinegate is how much 160 so from this particular equation you can calculate x so what is the value of x which you are getting from here what is the value of x which you are getting from here quick x value will be getting exactly as c right which is 189 centimeter square per mole right people Duration of the problem solving session will be 7 to 8 hours because 500 questions we are going to solve. Extra 500 questions. All the concepts which I gave you today, I'll be using them tomorrow. <clears throat> Tell me, how, how do you solve this question? How do you solve this question? Molar conductance of 0 0.1 molar aqueous solution of ammonium hydroxide. Right? Molar conductance at 0.1 concentrate. Okay, this is the substance which is given to us. When its concentration is 0.1 molar, when its concentration is 0.1 molar, its molar conductivity at that point of time is given as 9.54 Simon centimeter square per mole. This is given. So this is basically molar conductivity at a given concentration when the concentration is 0.1 molar. At the same time, Molar conductivity at infinite dilution is also given. How much? 238 Simon centimeter square per mole. What do we have to calculate? Nothing. Degree of dissociation. Degree of dissociation will be molar conductivity at a given concentration divided by molar conductivity at infinite dilution. So it is nothing but 9.54 divided by 238. How much this comes out be? How much this comes out be? Can you let me know quickly? Can you let me know quickly how much it comes out be? It'll be approximately 4, I believe. Right? I mean 0 0.04. This is degree of dissociation. If this is degree of dissociation, we have to calculate percentage dissociation. Percentage dissociation is degree of dissociation multiplied by 100. Right? Which will be 4% approximately. Right? So option C is the one which is correct. Option C is the one which is correct among all. Right? Now, with this, your electrochemistry is done and dusted. We are going to take a break. Right? Since a lot of people are fasting today. Right? I know that. And I am also the one who is fasting. So, let's meet at 7 p.m. sharp. Okay? But I would want everyone to be there at 7 p.m. Okay, this is the last chapter which we are going to do. With this year, uh, with this year, class 12th physical chemistry will be over. Right? But I would want every one of you to be there on time. Yeah? Let's complete the solution as well. Let's not wait for long. Let's kill it. And I'll be giving you small, small. By the way, I won't be teaching concentration terms in solution. Concentration terms, I'll be teaching in mole concept. Concentration terms, here I won't be teaching. I'll be teaching that in mole concept directly. Okay? 
it, I'm telling you again, your batteries, you have to read them from NCRT. There is nothing to teach. You have to remember them. You have to mug up those paragraphs. Okay? I want every one of you to be back at exactly 7 p.m. Exactly 7 p.m. Right? Be there on time because we have to complete. We need to complete. Okay? And tomorrow's session, again, everyone has to join in because tomorrow it's going to be extra problem practice session. We are not going to keep any single stone unturned people. Right? Everything will be done. Everything will be done. I'll see you. I'll see you after the break. Till then, you take care. Bye-bye.
<clears throat> Are you guys back? Are you guys back? Yes. Uh. Call up, call up everybody, call up everybody. Quick. One more chapter to go and we are done for the day. And we are done for the day. Call up, call up everyone. <clears throat> and we shall be starting. <clears throat> I'm doing good. How are you all doing? I'm doing amazing. I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> What's up? How are you all doing? <clears throat> How are you all doing? Are you all alive? Are you all alive? <coughs> are you all alive? Yes, yes, yes. I had food. I had food. How many marks these chapters will contain? See, uh, in your electrochemistry, <clears throat> this year, three to four questions, sure shot. Right? In your kinetics, minimum three questions. And in your solution, minimum two questions. Right? So approximately 10 questions will be asked from these three chapters, which I have taught you today. 10 questions, guys, 10 questions. That means 40 marks you're securing, right? If you have watched the session completely, 40 marks you're securing. <clears throat> no, no, don't skip solution. Solution is easy kill chapter, guys. Do not, do not think of skipping solution chapter. It's easy chapter. Why will you skip the easy ones? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <clears throat> There's no need to. <clears throat> Has my voice changed? Or is it the same the way I started in the morning? Has it changed a bit? Guys, tomorrow, tomorrow's marathon is super important, right? Extra 500 question practice from solution, kinetics and electrochemistry, right? So do join that. The session is already public. I want you guys to smash the like on that session first. Go, go and smash the like and mark your attendance. I, I'm, I'm seeing you from here. Go right now. <clears throat> <clears throat> Then only I'll be starting the session. <clears throat> Otherwise not. There are 540 people watching me right now. So let me see whether all of you have smashed the like on the tomorrow session or not. It's not done yet. Do it right now, everyone. The tomorrow session which is already scheduled. Top high 500 questions of physical chemistry. Likes are not increasing in that session. Go and do it quickly. <laughs> Go and do that quickly. <clears throat> it's not done. It's not done yet. Quickly, quickly. That will let me know about the attendance for tomorrow. By the way, in the solution chapter, I'm not going to discuss the concentration terms here. Concentration terms. I'll be discussing when I'll be teaching you the mole concept. Okay? Concentration terms, I'll be discussing with you when I'll be teaching you the mole concept. Perfect? So do not worry about the concentration terms, from which again you'll be getting the sure shot question in the NEET 2024. But that part, concentration terms, I'll be doing in the mole concept. Here, right now, I'll be talking about particularly the liquid solutions. Okay, I'll be talking about particularly about the liquid solutions. <clears throat> so should we start already? Should we start already?
All ready, people? All ready? This chapter will not take more than two, two and a half hours. I'll complete it within uh, two and a half hours. So don't worry. And everything. I won't skip anything. Mole concept kab hoga? Mole concept will happen in week two. Week one schedule I've already given you, right? In week two, uh, in week two, I'll be doing class 11th inorganic and class 11th physical in week two. Perfect. <coughs> so guys, first of all, first of all, you should know about the different types of solutions. You should know about the different types of solutions. You must have heard about something called as binary solution. What is the binary solution? How do you define the binary solution? My dear students, as per the name is concerned, binary solution is the one which has got two components, which consists of two components. Among those two components, one component will be solute and one component will be solvent. Simple. You have got ternary solution. Ternary solution is the one which consists of three components. Out of those three components, there will be one solvent and two solute. Two solute components. Similarly, my dear students, you have got quaternary solution as well. In quaternary solution, what do we have? We have got four components. Uh, just a second. What is mentioned over here? I think, uh, just a second. You have got four components. Out of which three are going to be solute and one is going to be solvent. This is something basics which you all must be knowing already, right? Perfect. Binary solution, two components, one solute, one solvent. Then two solute, one solvent. Then three solute, one solvent, quaternary. Similarly, in this chapter, you'll frequently come across this particular term, aqueous solution. What is an aqueous solution? Aqueous solution is the one wherein the solvent used is water. Wherein particularly water is used as the solvent. This is something I believe you already know. Okay. This is something which I believe you already know. Similarly, one thing which I want you guys to do on your own. Have you seen your NCRT for solution? There is one table given. There is one table given. There is one table given. Nine types of solutions are given. Solid in liquid. Solid in gas. Solid in solid. Gas in solid. Gas in liquid. Gas in gas. Right? Have you seen that? Have you seen that table ever? Guys, I want you to be active in the chats. Don't do this. Have you seen that table ever? <clears throat> I want every one of you to say it. Have you seen that table? <coughs> All the examples which are given in that table, do remember them. Examples given in that table, I would want you guys to remember. See, there is nothing to teach in that table. If there was something to teach, I would have taught it. But all those things you have to remember, right? So please and please do not avoid that particular table. Please and please do not avoid that particular table, which consists of nine types of solutions and their examples. So do remember those examples. Those are important. From that, you'll be definitely getting a memory-based question. Okay? Now, I'm moving ahead. I'm going on. I'm moving on to the actual topic, which we have to discuss. Just a second. <coughs> Just a second, people. <clears throat> okay. The first topic which we are going to discuss here, that is going to be vapor pressure. How do we exactly define the vapor pressure? What all things we have to keep in mind when we the term vapor pressure and where all it's involved. Let's read this particular slide, then I'll make you understand what vapor pressure is all about. My dear students, as per the definition, vapor pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by the vapors. The pressure exerted by the vapors of the volatile liquid when liquid and its vapors are in equilibrium at a particular temperature. Point number one. Any liquid which can form its vapors is called as volatile liquid. Right? Perfect. At equilibrium, amount of vapors generated are fixed. Vapor pressure does not depend on the amount of liquid, etc. etc. What it means exactly? <clears throat> Try to understand. <laughs> Try to understand people what this vapor pressure is all about. 
Why do students imagine that I have taken a container? The container is closed on all the sides. The container is closed on all the sides. Now over here, what exactly am I doing? I am taking a volatile liquid. What is meant by the volatile liquid? What is meant by the volatile liquid? Over here, I have taken a volatile liquid. Volatile liquid is the one which can form its vapors. Like you have got water. Water is the example of the volatile liquid. For example, water. Perfect. Any liquid which can form its vapors, right? That's something which you'll be calling as volatile liquid. Perfect. Let's say this water in the container, it's kept at a particular temperature. It's kept at a fixed temperature. Let's say the temperature is 25 degrees centigrade. Let's say the temperature is 25 degrees centigrade. Now, what is going to happen here? What is going to happen here? Some of the water molecules will escape, will get converted into vapors. Some of the water molecules will escape and will get converted into vapors. So basically, imagine I've got the liquid L in the container. I've got the liquid X in the container, which is water basically, right? So what is the first thing which is happening? Some of the water molecules are getting converted into vapors. Perfect. So what is happening? Evaporation is happening. Evaporation is happening. Right? And, and due to evaporation, this liquid is getting converted into gas. Some of the water molecules escaped out and got converted into vapors. Now, after some time, what you will observe? You will observe some of the vapors getting converted into liquid as well. You will observe some of the vapors getting converted into liquid as well. That means after some time, you will observe one more phenomenon. It's condensation. That is condensation. Right? That is condensation. Perfect. That is condensation. My dear students, there will, there will be a stage. A stage will arise here. A stage will arise here. At which rate of evaporation and condensation becomes equal. A stage will arise. A stage will arise when rate of evaporation, when rate of evaporation and condensation becomes what? Becomes equal. Right? That particular stage is something which I call as equilibrium stage. That stage is what I call as equilibrium stage. Perfect. Temperature of the system I've kept constant. Temperature of the system I've kept constant. So first what happened? Evaporation happened. Then condensation happened. After that, rate with which evaporation is happening, with the same rate condensation is happening. That means, imagine, imagine, if four water molecules are getting converted into vapors, at the same time, four vapor molecules will be getting converted into liquid. Perfect. So can I say, can I say, when equilibrium is established between liquid and its vapors, can I say, as soon as equilibrium is established, as soon as equilibrium is established, can I say, in this part of the chamber, you will get some fixed amount of vapors. There will be fixed amount of vapors. Absolutely, there will be fixed amount of vapors. Because equilibrium has established the rate with which evaporation is happening with the same rate, with the same rate, with the same rate, condensation is also happening. Yeah. Perfect. Let me just turn the lights off. Okay. Now, now people, now people, since at equilibrium, we have got fixed amount of vapors here. Okay. Now, my dear students, if I ask you a question, whether these vapor particles, whether they'll be in rest or motion, <clears throat> what do you think? Whether these vapor particles will be in rest or motion, they'll be in motion. If these vapors at equilibrium are in motion, can you say they'll be colliding with each other at the same time, they'll be colliding with the walls of the container? Yes. They'll be colliding with the top surface of the liquid as well? Yes. Dear students, if these vapors are in motion, they are colliding with each other, they are colliding with the walls of container, they are colliding with the top surface of the liquid. Can I say these vapors are exerting pressure on the surface of the liquid? Can I say that? And that pressure, that pressure which is exerted, that pressure which is exerted by the vapors of a volatile liquid, when liquid and its vapors are in equilibrium at a particular temperature, that pressure is something which you call as vapor pressure. That pressure is something which you call as vapor pressure. Perfect. I believe you got the idea of what vapor pressure is all about. Okay. That pressure which is exerted. 
that pressure which is exerted that pressure which is exerted by the vapors when liquid and its vapors are in equilibrium at a particular temperature that is something which you call as vapor pressure okay now people <coughs> if you look at this particular slide i think all the points are clear just this thing do remember it directly vapor pressure it does not depend on the amount of liquid it does not depend on the shape of the container in which you keep the liquid for example if i have a glass of water over here right and if i have a bucket of water over here if i have a bucket of water over here both are kept at same temperature both are kept at same temperature both are at equilibrium with their vapors both are at equilibrium with its vapors do remember they will have the same vapor pressure irrespective of the amount of liquid taken irrespective of the shape of the container right okay now the important point is on what factors on what factors this vapor pressure depends factors affecting vapor pressure my dear students there are particularly two factors which are going to affect the vapor pressure particularly there are two factors number one that is the force of interaction between the liquid molecules number two that is temperature now let's have a look how the force of interaction between the liquid molecules and how temperature is going to affect the vapor pressure try to understand again this is the container which i took again this is the container which i took and over here what do we have we have got a volatile liquid in this container perfect which is kept at a particular temperature temperature of the liquid is constant for example temperature of the system is constant now i am assuming equilibrium has established between vapors and the liquid equilibrium has established at equilibrium you will find a fixed amount a fixed quantity of these vapors you know it already perfect my dear students just understand one thing over here in the bulk what do we have over here in the bulk we have liquid molecules right we have liquid molecules these are liquid molecules between the liquid molecules there will be force of attraction there will be force of attraction now you think over it if force of attraction between liquid molecules is more if force of attraction between liquid molecules is more will the escaping tendency be less or more escaping tendency will be less if force of attraction is more if force of attraction is more escaping tendency if force of attraction is more escaping tendency is less if force of attraction is more between the liquid molecules escaping tendency is less if escaping tendency is less amount of vapors generated will be less amount of vapors generated will be less and if amount of vapors generated are less eventually vapor pressure will be less perfect this is the first factor so i'll categorically say your vapor pressure it is inversely proportional to force of attraction between the liquid molecules more the force of attraction between the liquid molecules lesser the vapor pressure perfect second factor that is temperature that is temperature now think on your own think on your own this liquid over here imagine it was at 25 degree centigrade imagine it was at 25 degree centigrade now what i'm doing exactly i'm increasing the temperature of the same liquid i'm increasing the temperature of the same liquid till 35 degree centigrade till 35 degree centigrade i'm assuming at 35 degree centigrade this liquid is also in equilibrium with this vapors right what do you think we have increased the temperature earlier this was equilibrium this was at equilibrium now at 35 also it is at equilibrium we have increased the temperature upon increase in the temperature what would have happened can i say more vapors would have got generated which is evident if more vapors have got generated more vapor pressure will be there so upon increasing the temperature what happens to vapor pressure when you increase the temperature vapor pressure increases vapor pressure increases right this particular equation is the one which will let you know which will let you know mathematically it will let you know that vapor pressure increases upon increase the temperature this particular equation right this what is this what you call as clausius clapeyron equation this equation is going to let you know that vapor pressure actually increases when you increase the temperature how exactly try to understand what exactly i'm going to say why do students imagine this is the liquid right which is in equilibrium with its vapors which is in equilibrium with its vapors when the temperature was t1 imagine the vapor pressure was p1 when the temperature changed to t2 let's assume the vapor pressure is p2 let's assume the vapor pressure is p2 okay now first of all 
you are converting liquid into gas. Liquid into gas. Is it endothermic or exothermic? This process endothermic? If it is endothermic, delta H sign has to be positive. Delta H sign has to be positive. Now imagine, imagine, imagine I'm increasing the temperature. Imagine I have increased the temperature. What does that mean? That means T2 is greater than T1. That means T2 is greater than T1. If T2 is greater than T1, T2 minus T1 will come out to be positive or negative. T2 minus T1 will come out to be positive. T2 minus T1 will come out to be positive. This is here T2 minus T1. T2 minus T1 is coming, coming out to be positive. So this term is positive. This term is positive. This term is positive. That means log of P2 by P1. Log of P2 by P1 is coming out to be positive. Now when can the log of P2 divided by P1 positive? You tell me. When is log x positive? Log x is positive when x is greater than 1. Similarly, log P2 by P1 will be positive when P2 divided by P1 will be greater than 1. Which tells you that P2 is simply greater than P1. What was P2? P2 was the vapor pressure at temperature T2. Right? So when you increase the temperature, when you increase the temperature, vapor pressure of the liquid automatically increases. Simple? Is it clear? Say it in the chats quickly. <clears throat> <laughs> Say it in the chats quickly. Yes. Perfect. So two factors on which vapor pressure actually depends upon. Now, have you heard about something called as boiling point? Have you heard about something called as boiling point? This again very important point. Boiling point. The temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the external pressure, which is atmospheric pressure generally. What does it mean? What does it mean? Understand carefully guys what exactly I'm going to say. <laughs> Imagine this is the volatile liquid here. Imagine this is the volatile liquid here. Okay. Imagine this is the volatile liquid here. Let's assume that. Let's assume that this liquid is in equilibrium with its vapors. Okay. Assume that this liquid is in equilibrium with its vapors. For example, <laughs> for example, outside there is external pressure which is basically your atmospheric pressure. How much that is? Let's say that is 760 mm of Hg. This is the outside pressure. External pressure. Okay. Now my dear students, Assuming that, for example, temperature of the system right now is 25 degrees centigrade. And at this temperature, let's say the vapor pressure, let's say the vapor pressure of the liquid, let's say it is equal to 100 mm of Hg. Let's say it is equal to 100 mm of Hg. The temperature of the liquid is 25 degrees centigrade. At 25 degrees centigrade, vapor pressure is, of the liquid is 100 mm of Hg. External pressure is how much? 760 mm of Hg. Now you tell me one thing. If you want to increase the vapor pressure of this liquid, if you want to increase the vapor pressure of this liquid, are we supposed to increase the temperature? Yes, we are supposed to increase the temperature. When we increase the temperature of this liquid, can I say vapor pressure will slowly, slowly keep on increasing? Upon increasing the temperature, vapor pressure of the liquid will keep on increasing. Right? On increase the temperature, vapor pressure will keep on increasing, vapor pressure will keep on increasing. Can we say there will be a particular temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to the external pressure? Yes. At a particular temperature, what you'll observe? You'll observe at a particular temperature. If you keep on increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature, there will be a particular temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid would have got equal to atmospheric pressure, external pressure. That temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure, becomes equal to the external pressure. That temperature is something which you call as boiling point. Am I clear with this? Say yes or no in the chats. Am I clear with this? <clears throat> Say yes or no in the chats. Quick. <clears throat> Quick guys, everyone. That temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure, external pressure. That is what you call as <coughs> boiling point. <coughs> yeah. Perfect. Now, my dear students, two terminologies I've cleared you till now. One is vapor pressure, what is boiling point? Okay. Now, this is something 
which you would have studied many a times in your boards, etc., etc. A lot of questions are asked from this topic, Rolt's Law. Okay, Rolt's Law. What is Rolt's Law all about? Let's read the definition first, statement first, then I'll make you understand what it means. My dear students, Rolt's Law states that the partial vapor pressure, the partial vapor pressure of a component over a liquid, over a liquid, is directly proportional to mole fraction of the component in the liquid phase. In the liquid phase, what it means, what it means, try to understand what it means. Try to understand very carefully what it means. Imagine that this is one container which I have. <clears throat> and here I have got one more container. And my dear students, here I have got one more container. These are the three containers which I have. Imagine that this first container, it contains your liquid A. It contains your volatile liquid A. Volatile liquid A. Imagine in this container, what do we have? We have got a volatile liquid B. We have got a volatile liquid B. Okay. If this is a volatile liquid, definitely you'll find some vapors of A here. Definitely you'll find some vapors of B here. Perfect. Can I say A is right now present in its pure form? There is nothing apart from A in the container. Either there are, there is liquid A or there are vapors of A. This A is right now present in its pure form. Right? Perfect. This A is right now present in its pure form. Vapor pressure of A, when A is present in its pure form, is represented by P0A. What is P0A? It is the vapor pressure of A in pure state, in pure form. In pure state, in pure form. Correct? Over here, B is also present in its pure form. There is nothing added with B. So, vapor pressure of B over here is represented by P naught B, which is something I call as vapor pressure of B. In which form? In pure form. In pure form. Correct? Right? Let's say number of moles of A in the liquid state is Na. Number of moles of A in the vapor phase are Na dash. Number of moles of B in the liquid phase is Nb. Number of moles of B in the vapor phase, it is Nb dash. It is Nb dash. Now, dear students, if you mix both the liquids in this container, if you mix both the liquids in this container, right, you mixed both the liquids in this particular container. Now, what do you have over here? You have got a solution of A and B. You have got a solution of A and B, correct? Will there be only vapors of A? No, there will be vapors of A as well as B. There will be vapors of A as well as B. Right? There will be vapors of A as well as B. Let me tell you, the total vapor pressure of this solution I am representing by PS. This is the total vapor pressure of the solution. Is the total vapor pressure of solution only due to vapors of A? Only due to vapors of B? Or both have contributed? I will say both have contributed. Right? So, I'll say total vapor pressure of A is equal to contribution made by vapors of A towards the total vapor pressure plus contribution made by vapors of B towards the total vapor pressure. This is the total vapor pressure of the solution. This is the total vapor pressure of the solution. What is PA? It is the contribution made by vapors of A towards the total vapor pressure. This is the contribution made by vapors of B towards the total vapor pressure. Towards the total vapor pressure, right? Perfect. As per which law? This is your Dalton's law basically. This is your Dalton's law. First of all, this PA over here, you call this as the partial vapor pressure of A. This PB over here, you call it as the partial vapor pressure of B. You call it as partial vapor pressure of B. Now guys, if you think carefully, in this solution, in this part, there is liquid A as well as B. There are moles of A as well as B, right? Perfect. What Rolt's law says that? What Rolt's law says? Rolt's law says that. Rolt's law says that. That liquid whose mole fraction, that liquid whose mole fraction in the solution phase, in the liquid phase is more, will contribute more towards the total vapor pressure. It is evident. We have got A as well as B in the liquid form here. Right? If the mole fraction of A in the liquid form is more, that means, if mole fraction of A in the liquid form is more, that means A will form more vapors. So, contribution 
made by A towards the total vapor pressure will be more. That tells you that partial vapor pressure of A will be more. Isn't it simple? Isn't it simple, people? So I can say, I can say, the partial vapor pressure of A is directly proportional to mole fraction of A in the solution phase. Similarly, partial vapor pressure of B is directly proportional to mole fraction of B in the solution phase. First of all, what is chi A and chi B? Chi A is something which you call as mole fraction. Mole fraction of A in which phase? In liquid phase. In liquid phase. Now similarly, what is chi B? Chi B is something which you call as mole fraction. Mole fraction of B in which phase? In the liquid phase. In the liquid phase. Correct? In the liquid phase. Perfect. Now guys, if you remove the proportionality sign, PA will be equal, this will be P naught A multiplied by chi A. PB will be equal, P naught B multiplied by what? Multiplied by chi B. Perfect. This is your Rolf's law. Why you are afraid of this? Why you are afraid of this? Why were you afraid of this? Isn't it very simple? Isn't it very simple? Guys, if you want to draw the graph between PA versus chi A, what will be the nature of the curve? <coughs> Tell me that. PA you are plotting along y-axis. Chi A you are plotting along x-axis. So y is equal to x and this m. Y is equal to mx. So it's a straight line. What about the slope of this straight line? Slope means m and m is nothing but p naught a. Perfect. Similarly, if you want to plot a graph between, if you want to plot a graph between pb and chi b, can you do that? Absolutely. You should be in a position to do that. Y is equal to mx. Again a straight line. What about its slope? Slope is nothing but p naught b. I believe I'm clear. I believe it's clear. <coughs> now people, for example, for example, you have to plot a curve between, between PA and chi B. And chi B. Can you, can you plot this curve? I want to see what you think about this. PA versus chi B. Now first of all, tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. In this solution, in this solution, mole fraction of A is chi A. Mole fraction of B is chi B. Okay. So this solution is a binary solution. It is a binary solution. Right. It is a binary solution. And you know, chi A plus chi B value will be 1. Chi A plus chi B value will be 1. Absolutely. Chi A plus chi B value will be definitely 1. Okay. If chi A plus chi B is 1, look at this particular formula. P A is nothing. It is equal to P naught A. Instead of chi A, I can write 1 minus chi B. No worries at all. Instead of chi A, I can write 1 minus chi B. Absolutely. So, your P A comes out to be P naught A minus P naught A multiplied by chi B. Correct? Look at this graph. You are plotting P A along Y axis. You are plotting chi B along X axis. This becomes your M. This becomes your C. The sign is minus. Y is equal to minus MX plus C. Y is equal to minus MX plus C. What is it? Straight line with negative slope. Y is equal to minus MX plus C. Straight line with negative slope. If I ask you, what about the slope of this graph? Slope of this graph will be simply minus P naught A. Absolutely clear? Is it clear? <laughs> Is it clear, people? I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Right? I believe it's clear. The same thing was mentioned here. The same thing which is mentioned here. Now there is something called as Rolt's law for a solution containing no, containing volatile components. Rolt's law for a solution containing volatile components. It is the same thing which I showed you. It is the same thing which I showed you. This was a volatile component. This was a volatile component. This is a solution containing volatile component. And you got to know total vapor pressure of the solution is equal to partial vapor pressure of A plus partial vapor pressure of B. It is just you have to play with this equation, nothing else. You just have to play this with this equation, nothing else. Okay, and how you are going to play with this equation? Guys, it's pretty much simple. See, look here. Look here. Just a second. Yeah, okay. So I'm showing you Rolf's law for the solution containing volatile, containing volatile components. You got to know your PS. Your PS is nothing. It is PA plus PB. And few minutes back only I told you, what is PA? As per Rolf's law, it is P naught A chi A. 
what is PB? It is nothing but P not B chi B. This is one of the result which you will be using in the questions directly, which you will see in some time. Number one. Number two, you can do one more thing. PS is equal to P not A chi A. Now, instead of chi B, what you can write? Instead of chi B, you can write 1 minus chi A. Does not make a difference, right? So, PS will be equal to P not A chi A plus P not B minus P not B chi A. Now, if you look at this particular equation, here you have got chi A, here you have got chi A. If you take chi A as common, so PS comes out to be. First, I'll write P not B separately. Let me write P not B plus chi A I have taken common. It is going to be P not A minus P not B and I have taken chi A common. So, this is one more equation which can be formed here. This one more equation which can be formed here. Or you can form one more equation. Over here, I have substituted XB as 1 minus XA. You could have substituted XA as 1 minus XB. You would have got one more equation. You would have got one more equation. Right? And what is that one more equation? Let's see. Let's try to make that too. So, PS will be equal to P not A as such. Instead of chi A, I am writing 1 minus chi B. Plus P not B as such. Multiplied by what? Multiplied by chi B. So, your PS comes out to be equal to P not A minus P not A chi B. Plus what? Plus P not B and this is chi B. So what I'll be doing, I'll write P not A as such. Now here chi B is common. If I take chi B as common, it is going to be P not B minus P not A and I have taken chi B common over here. So this is one more equation. There is no need to remember these equations. It is just you should be able to make these equations. It is just you should be able to make these equations. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Now, my dear students, now, my dear students, I'll show you something very important. I'm pretty much sure till now that thing was not clear to you. Yeah, that is that graph. Have you seen that graph? 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 Right, that graph X shaped. I'm pretty much sure. You would have studied that once, yeah? Let's try to understand how that graph is formed. That's important. First thing, the things which I told you till now. One is your PA is equal to P not A chi. One is your PB is equal to P not B chi B. One more thing. Chi A plus chi B is equal to 1. Is equal to 1. My dear students, let's do one thing. Let's do one thing. Let's say along y-axis, I'm plotting vapor pressure. Along x-axis, I'm plotting mole fraction. Mole fraction. The sky represents mole fraction in solution phase. In liquid phase, I mean. In liquid phase. Okay. Let's start with this particular point. Let's start with this particular point. Let's assume that at this particular point. At this particular point. Let's assume that chi A is 1. Let's assume that chi A is 1. Okay. Chi A is 1. If chi A is 1, that means chi B is 0. That means chi B is 0. That means in the container, what do we have? We do not have B. We have got only A in the container. So can I say A is present in the pure form? So whatever will be the vapor pressure right now, that will be only due to pure A. And vapor pressure due to pure A is what? Vapor pressure due to pure A is P naught A, right? Let's say this point represents your P naught A. This point represents your P naught A. Now tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. Let's say this point. <laughs> if you go, if you go, if you go in the right direction, the value of chi B is going to increase. The value of chi A is going to decrease because chi A plus chi B has to be 1. So this is the point wherein you will find chi A 0 and chi B 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. If you go in the right direction, chi A will decrease and chi A, chi B will increase. Okay. Look at this particular point. Chi A is 0. That means in the container you do not have A. You have got only B. And B is present in the pure state. If B is present in the pure state, whatever will be the vapor pressure right now, that will be due to pure B. 
and vapor pressure due to pure B is what? That is P naught B. Let's say this point represents P naught B. Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this? These two points are absolutely clear. Now, my dear students, understand and analyze things. Understand and analyze things. Look here. When you are moving from left to right, chi B is increasing. Chi B is increasing. What is chi B? Chi B is increasing. That means mole fraction of B in the liquid phase is increasing. If mole fraction of B in the liquid phase is increasing, that means mole fraction of B in the liquid phase is increasing. That means contribution made by B towards the total vapor pressure. That will be increasing. So basically, basically partial vapor pressure of B is increasing. So if I want to make the curve for B, if you move from left to right, mole fraction of B in the solution phase is increasing. Is increasing. Mole fraction of B in the solution phase is increasing. What does that mean? What does that mean? Contribution made by B towards the total vapor pressure. That will be also increasing. So basically, partial vapor pressure of B is increasing. Right? Partial vapor pressure of B is increasing. Perfect. So, so how it looks like? You start from here. And you will reach here. Perfect. This line represents what? This represents your partial vapor pressure of B. Right? Which is equal to P naught B multiplied by chi B. P naught B multiplied by chi B. You can check it out. See, at this point, chi B is 1. If you put chi B as 1, your PB, your vapor pressure of B is equal to P naught B. Over here, chi B is 0. If you put chi B 0, PB becomes 0. Right? Over here, PB is 0. It is starting from origin. Right? Am I clear? Right, people? Now, some intellectual person has come in the chats. You are wasting time by teaching again and again. When will the students give mock papers? You give the mock papers if you have completed the syllabus. Why you are becoming the leader here? You, you give the mock test. Why are you coming, becoming the leader here? Yeah? Do you like politics? I belong to a political family, by the way. I can give you a seat if you want. Go and go to some other channel. <coughs> I hope this particular point is clear. Right? <laughs> I hope this particular point is clear. Yeah? Now, there will be a lot of these leaders coming in. Uh, wait. Harini, do you know who you are talking about? You are talking about HSP sir, right? HSP sir, you have no idea who you are talking about. You have no idea who you are talking about. Yeah, we call him the trainer of the trainers, the teacher of the teachers. So please and please mind your language when you say something about HSP sir. Okay. You have no idea who you are talking to. You have seriously no idea whom you are talking about. You are talking about your HSP sir. When teachers get the doubts, they call HSP sir. Do you know that? You are a student. So please, if you are a paid spammer, go to that channel only, which has sent you here. Yeah? Go to that, that channel itself. Okay? Is the... I would... <laughs> yeah. My age is 28. He has been teaching from 28 years. So no, you, I, won't, I won't let you speak a word about him. I'm blocking you right away. I'm sorry. <coughs> Perfect. Let's move on now. Let's move on to some other things. My dear students, look at this particular curve again. Chi A here is 1. What does that mean? Chi A is 1, Chi B is 0. Chi A is 1, that means there is only pure A in the container. There is no B. If there is only pure A in the container, if there is pure A in the container, that means whatever will be the vapors, that will be 
that will be of a so can i say a is present in the pure form at this point a is present in the pure form and vapor pressure when a is present in the pure form is p not a perfect when you move from left to right what is happening to chi a one zero when you move from left to right chi a is decreasing and my dear students when chi a is decreasing the contribution made by a towards the total vapor pressure that will be also decreasing right right people right people when you move from left to right chi a is decreasing if chi a is decreasing what does that mean that means if chi is decreasing what does that mean that means liquid a in the container is decreasing if liquid a in the container is decreasing what does that mean that means the vapors due to a will be decreasing if vapors due to a are decreasing that means the partial vapor pressure due to a that will be also decreasing so on moving from left to right the graph will come from top to bottom it will come from top to bottom like this perfect this is for a so p a is equal to p not a multiplied by chi a you can check it out chi a here is one if chi a is one if chi a is one p a is equal to p not a right here chi a is zero here chi a is zero if chi a is zero p a is zero right p a here is zero perfect now my dear students if you join these two lines if you join this point with this point this particular line will give you the total vapor pressure of the solution which is going to be equal to pa plus pb you can write it as p not a chi a plus p not b chi b let me know in the charts if this particular graph is absolutely clear to everyone or not <clears throat> let me know in the charts quickly quickly people let me know in the charts Let me know quickly in the chats if this graph got clear to you, like amazingly. <clears throat> perfect, guys. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Now, there is something again very important. What is that? That is calculation of mole fraction of components in the vapor phase what it means try to understand what it means let me first of all erase these equations and let's derive them because their derivation will be is important okay let me show you what exactly i'm talking about imagine this is the solution imagine in this particular container what do we have we have got a solution imagine in this container we have got a solution it is a solution containing two volatile liquids a and b a and b right it is a solution of a and b it is a solution of a and b over here there will be vapors of a as well as b over here there will be vapors of a as well as b and you know total vapor pressure of the solution is nothing it is p a plus p b partial vapor pressure sum right or you can write it as you know you know your p a your p a is nothing but P not a chi a and your PB is nothing but P not B chi B. It is P not B chi B. You know you should know this by now. You should know this by now. You should know it by now. Now, my dear students, try to understand. Over here, you have got vapors of A as well as B. Okay. Let's say mole fraction of A in the vapor phase is chi A dash. Let's say mole fraction of B in the vapor phase is chi B dash. Let's say mole fraction of A in the liquid phase is chi A. Mole fraction of B in the mole fraction of B in the liquid phase is chi B. Be careful with these four terminologies. I'm writing it over here. One is your chi A dash, right? What is chi A dash? It is the mole fraction. It is the mole fraction of A in which phase? In vapor phase. In vapor phase. What is chi A? Chi A is the mole fraction. It is a mole fraction of A. In which phase? In liquid phase. In liquid phase. It is a mole fraction of A in liquid phase, right? Now, guys, try to understand one thing. Try to understand one thing. If I use the Rolds law, Rolds law says that P A, P A is the partial vapor pressure of A. As per Rolls law, it is equal to P not A chi A. Right? This is as per Rolls law. This is as per Rolls law. 
if you ever have studied dalton's law if you ever have studied dalton's law uh sir p a is equal to p not a ka a where did, did i write somewhere something different oh okay here you here you're saying p not a ka a yes yes understood guys it's okay if you ever have studied dalton's law dalton's law what it says what dalton's law says what dalton's law says if i use dalton's law here in this part of the chamber in this part of the if i use dalton's law here in this part of the container can i say in this part of the container you have got mixture of two gases a and b right as per dalton's law is concerned as per dalton's law is concerned the total pressure of the mixture is the sum of their individual contributions pa plus pb and as per dalton's law is concerned the contribution made by vapors of a is equal to total vapor pressure total pressure of the mixture multiplied by multiplied by mole fraction of a in the vapor phase this is dalton's law this is dalton's law whenever you have got a mixture of gases in the container mixture of gas in the container right contribution made by each gas which you call as partial pressure of the individual gas partial pressure of the gas that's always equal total pressure of the mixture multiplied by mole fraction of the individual gas that multiplied by mole fraction of the individual gas right this is partial vapor pressure of a partial vapor pressure of a is equal to total vapor pressure multiplied by mole fraction of a mole fraction of a which a in the vapor phase which is chi a dash right Now, oh, my dear students, as per your Rolle's law, sorry, as per your Dalton's law, P A is nothing but total vapor pressure of the solution multiplied by chi A dash. This is your Dalton's law. This is your Dalton's law. If you look at both equations, P A is equal to this. P A is equal to this. Can I say from here, I got to know P S multiplied by chi A dash is equal to P not A multiplied by chi A. So from this particular equation, I can say chi A dash is equal to P not A chi A. divided by ps this is how you calculate mole fraction of a in the vapor phase in the vapor phase similarly if i ask you how do we calculate mole fraction of b in the vapor phase it will be equal to instead of p not a i'll write p not b instead of chi a i'll write chi b right divided by total vapor pressure of the solution that is ps let me know in the chats if both these equations are clear let me know in the chats quickly if these two equations are absolutely clear to you quickly in the chats quickly say yes or no quick <clears throat> got them got them people now are you still finding them difficult are you still finding them difficult you are not supposed to find them difficult do the first question it is it must be simple The vapor pressure of the pure liquid A, P not A, is equal to seventy torr. Right? It forms an ideal solution with other liquid B. The mole fraction of B in the solution, chi B is given zero point two. If chi B is zero point two, that means chi A is equal to one minus zero point two, zero point eight. The total vapor pressure of the solution, P S, is equal to eighty four torr. What do we have to calculate? We have to calculate P not B. We have to calculate P not B. Right? Now, people, try to understand. Use the Rolle's law. P S is equal to P not A k A plus P not B k B. Perfect. A simple equation. P S is given. How much? That is eighty four. Is equal to P not A is seventy. What is k A? K A is zero point eight. K A is zero point eight plus P not B is given. How much? Okay, P not B we have to calculate. K B we already know. That is zero point two. Don't you see one equation, one unknown? From this particular equation, you can calculate P not B, which is something you were supposed to calculate. Is it simple? Is it simple? Moving on to one more question. <clears throat> Moving on to one more question. A solution has one is to four molar ratio of pentane and hexane. Pentane I'm representing with pentane I'm representing with A, hexane I'm representing with B. Okay, so that it becomes clear to you. Pentane I am representing with A, hexane I am representing with B. Now look at all the parameters which are given to us. A solution has one is to four molar ratio of pentane to hexane. So basically, as per the question, one is to four molar ratio. One is to four molar ratio. 
solution has one is to four molar ratio. Quick. Quick. Can you solve this question on your own? Can you solve this question on your own? Quick, 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 everyone. Quick, guys. Can't you give it a try? Molar ratio means ratio of moles. Can you do it? <laughs> Guys, this, this you are supposed to do here. See, look at the question. I'll make you understand the question. So you have got a solution which contains pentane and hexane. This is the solution containing pe pentane and hexane. So A is your pentane and B is your hexane, right? Okay, this is the solution of pentane and hexane. Now, as per the question, the solution has 1 is to 4 molar ratio. That means in this particular liquid, in this particular solution phase, Na, number of moles of A divided by number of moles of B is equal to 1 divided by 4. Is equal to 1 divided by 4. Is equal to 1 divided by 4, right? Is equal to 1 divided by 4. So that means if Na is equal to x, Nb has to be equal to 4x. If Na is equal to x, Nb has to be equal to 4x, right? Now, my dear students, if I ask you what is the mole fraction of A in the solution phase, mole fraction of A in the solution phase will be equal to number of moles of A in the solution phase divided by total moles, right? Which will come out be how much? This is your x, this is your x plus 4x, which makes it 5x, so 1 by 5. So 1 by 5 is the mole fraction of A in the solution phase, right? What is chi B? Chi B will be equal to 1 minus chi A, which will be 1 minus 1 by 5, which will be equal to 5 minus 1, 4 by 5. Perfect, you got this. I believe you got this. Right? What are we supposed to calculate? Calculate the mole fraction of pentane in the vapor phase. First of all, can't we calculate total vapor pressure of the solution? Which is equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Are we given with all the terms? P naught A. P naught A is 440 multiplied by chi A. Chi A is 1 by 5. P naught B. P naught B is 120 and chi B is how much? 4 divided by 5. Can you solve this particular equation? Let me know the exact value which you are getting from here. Quick, quick, quick. Be quick. Can you let me know the total vapor pressure of the solution quickly in the chats? I'm asking about the total vapor pressure. I'm not asking about the answer. Tell me the value of this term. Tell me the value of this term only. 184 people are saying. So 184 tor, right? Or mm of Hg. This is the total vapor pressure of the solution. What am I supposed to calculate? What am I supposed to calculate? I'm supposed to calculate mole fraction of pentane in the vapor phase. Mole fraction of pentane. Pentane I'm representing with A. So chi dash A we have to calculate. Which has to be P naught A multiplied by chi A divided by PS. Correct? I told you few minutes back. How do we get the mole fraction in the vapor phase? Perfect. So chi A dash has to be equal to P naught A is given. How much? 440. Chi A is given. How much? 1 by 5 divided by PS. PS is nothing but 184. Solve this particular term and get the mole fraction of A in the vapor phase. Similarly, if you want to calculate mole fraction of B in the vapor phase, then you have to write this equation, chi A dash plus chi B dash. This will be also 1, right? So from here, you can calculate chi B dash as well, right? If this is coming out to be 0 0.2, so this is 1 minus 0 0.2, which comes out to be 0 0.8. So these sort of questions you are supposed to do. These sort of questions you are supposed to do, right? On your own. I believe you are... This part is clear, right? Okay, now people, let me tell you one more important thing. Let me tell you one more important thing. That is something very important, right? What is that? That is vapor pressure of the solution, of the solution containing non-volatile solute. Containing non-volatile solute. Vapor pressure of the solution containing non-volatile solute. Okay? Containing non-volatile solute. Non-volatile solute is the one which cannot form its vapors. Practical chemistry will be also there, right? But not in today's session. <clears throat> See guys, what exactly we are going to do here? Again, again, 
we have got a volatile liquid A in the container. We have got a volatile liquid A in the container. This is volatile liquid A which is there in the container. Right? These are the vapors of it. Since A is present in its pure state, so its vapor pressure right now will be P0A. Perfect. Now my dear students, just to make you understand, actual reason is basically your thermodynamic reason. But I'm not going towards the thermodynamics of it. I'll just tell you something which you will remember by means of which you will remember things. Okay? If you look at this particular layer, what do we have? What do you see at this layer? You have got A particles everywhere. Right? On the top of the liquid layer A, what do we have? You have got only A particles. All the A particles, what do we have? All the A particles are volatile. These are volatile. They can form the vapors. They can form the vapors. It's not just only the top layer particles can form the vapors. From bulk also, particles can go up and form the vapors. Right? Now people, in this particular container, if I introduce a non-volatile solute B, non-volatile solute B, something which cannot form its vapors, right? Which can form the, not, not form the vapors. If I introduce non-volatile solute B, what is going to happen? Try to understand. Try to understand what's going to happen. Try to understand what's going to happen. I'll be getting a solution of A and B. This is the solution of A and B. Out of which A is volatile. Out of which B is non-volatile, non-volatile. So basically, if I ask you on this layer, will there be only A particles? If I ask you, will there be only A particles? There'll be with A particles, there'll be B particles as well. <laughs> Even in the bulk, there'll be B particles as well. B particles are non-volatile. A particles are volatile. A particles are volatile. B particles are non-volatile. Now you tell me, you tell me, you tell me. The amount of vapors generated here, are they going to be less or more? Amount of vapors which are generated over here, are they going to be less or more? Quick. Now in this particular solution, you have got B as well, non-volatile, which cannot form vapors. So amount of vapor generated here is going to be less. Right? Let's assume the vapor pressure of this solution is PS. Vapor pressure of this solution is PS. PS was supposed to be equal to PA plus PB. But B is non-volatile. It does not form vapors. It has got no contribution towards the vapor pressure of the solution. Perfect. So PS is nothing but PA. PS is nothing but PA. And already you know what is PA. PA is P not A chi. PA is P not A chi. Now you understand one thing. You understand one thing. Over here I had pure liquid A. Right. And right here I've got a solution containing non-volatile. When I added the non-volatile solute, what happened to the vapor pressure? Did vapor pressure increase or decrease? When I added the non-volatile solute, so on adding, on adding non-volatile solute, vapor pressure, does it increase or decrease? It, vapor pressure decreases. Vapor pressure decreases. And let me tell you, this decrease in the vapor pressure, this decrease in the vapor pressure is something which you call as lowering in vapor pressure. This is called as lowering in vapor pressure. Now, if I ask you how much this vapor pressure has lowered, initially the vapor pressure was P0A. Now, finally, the vapor pressure is PS. So, initial minus final. This much amount has decreased. This is decrease in vapor pressure of A. Initially, it was P0A. Now, it's PS. Right? This is how you will calculate decrease in vapor pressure of A, which will be equal. P0A, you are writing as such. PS is equal to P not A multiplied by chi A. So if you take P not A common, if you take P not A common, it's going to be 1 minus chi A. And you should be knowing it is going to be P not A. 1 minus chi A is nothing, that's chi B. Perfect. Perfect. So what exactly you are going to remember from here? What exactly you are going to remember from here? What exactly you are going to remember from here? In the volatile component, if you add the non-volatile solute, what happens to the vapor pressure? It decreases. That decrease in the vapor pressure is something which you call as lowering in vapor pressure. Right? That's called as lowering in vapor pressure. Perfect. And this is how you calculate lowering in vapor pressure. Yeah? Am I clear? Let me know quickly in the chats. This is not related to lowering in vapor pressure. It is just lowering in vapor pressure. It is just lowering in vapor pressure. I hope this particular point is also clear. 
right i hope this particular point is also clear now now you have got ideal non ideal solution you have got ideal non ideal solutions <coughs> my dear students before talking about ideal non ideal solutions i have some things to say by means of which you will understand all of this right just a second <clears throat> before you understand what are ideal and non ideal solutions i have few things to tell you here yes we'll complete before 10 i'll try to because i'm going to shrink all this i'm not going to explain you things i'll tell you only those things which are like needed which are needed irrelevant things i'm not going to do otherwise whatever i'm teaching you right now if i talk in terms of thermodynamics point of view it will take me like 4 or 5 hours it will take me 4 or 5 hours if i start teaching you in terms of thermodynamics but that is not needed for your neat exam that's not needed in your neat neat exam okay my dear students i'll just give you one table which you will remember which you will remember okay i'll just give you one table which you'll remember and nothing will be asked out of that table related to ideal non ideal we have got nothing to do with anything else one table i'm going to give you over here right here i'm writing ideal solutions over here i'm writing non ideal solutions non ideal solutions showing positive deviation over here i'm writing non ideal solutions showing negative deviation showing negative deviations just remember this table it is more than sufficient for you when it comes to the neat examination okay now oh, just a second perfect <clears throat> in case of your ideal solutions first of all let me tell you one thing if you want to calculate vapor pressure of the solution if you want to calculate vapor pressure of the solution you have got two ways one you can use rolt's law you can use rolt's law or you can take the solution in the lab you will do certain experiments and calculate its vapor pressure right so two ways are there by means of which you can calculate vapor pressure one with the help of rolt's law with the help of Rolle's law, one experimentally, which is the actual vapor pressure of the solution, which is the actual vapor pressure of the solution. You get it? There are two ways by means of which I can calculate vapor pressures of the solutions. One with the help of Rolle's law, which is theoretical vapor pressure. Theoretically, we are calculating by doing some calculations. Other way, take the same solution into the lab, carry out certain experiments, and get the actual vapor pressure of the solution. Correct? Right? There are some solutions, there are some solutions in which vapor pressure, which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law, which is called as theoretical vapor pressure, it is equal to the observed vapor pressure. It comes out to be same as that of actual vapor pressure. Right? Or let me directly write it as actual vapor pressure. What is the difference between the two? Pt. Pt is the vapor pressure of the solution which is theoretical with the help of a Rolle's law. This is the actual one which we have calculated experimentally. Perfect. Those solutions which follow this particular statement, those solutions wherein the theoretical vapor pressure and actual vapor pressure comes out to be equal, you call those solutions as, you call those solutions as your ideal solutions. Okay. So I can write it like this. I can write it like this. Over here, P actual, P actual has to be equal to P theoretical. P theoretical is nothing that is PA chi A plus PB chi B. Right? Perfect. Right, people? That means, that means this P actual, this was basically PA, this was basically PB, right? What was PA? PA used to call as partial vapor pressure of A. Okay? I'll say PA actual, PA actual will be equal to P naught A chi A. And PA actual, PB actual, sorry, 
पी बी एक्चुअल विल बी इक्वल टू पी नॉट बी का बी नंबर वन नंबर टू माइडियर स्टूडेंट इन केस ऑफ आइडियल सोल्यूशन इन केस ऑफ आइडियल सोल्यूशन वॉट यूल ऑब्जर्व यू विल ऑब्जर्व ऑल द इंट्रैक्शन सेम लेट्स यू हेड लिक्विड इन द कंटेनर देर वेर ए इंट्रैक्शन इन द लिक्विड बी देर वेर बी बी इंट्रैक्शन वेन यू मिक्स दम अप यू गॉट अ सोल्यूशन ऑफ ए एंड बी नाउ देर आर ए बी इंट्रैक्शन राइट सो डू रिमेंबर ए ए इंट्रैक्शन आर सेम एज दर ऑफ बी बी इंट्रैक्शन विच इज सेम एज दर ऑफ ए बी इंट्रैक्शन ओके third point if they ask you about delta h mixing for ideal solutions delta h mixing is zero for ideal solutions delta v mixing is also zero for ideal solutions delta s mixing it is greater than zero for ideal solutions delta g mixing is less than zero anything can be asked from this anything can be asked from this any anything anything out of these things out of these things Now, what are non-ideal solutions? Non-ideal solutions are the ones in which theoretical vapor pressure and actual vapor pressure they are different. They are different, right? They are different. They are different, right? Now, guys, <coughs> two cases can arise. Two cases can arise here. Two cases can arise. Actual vapor pressure can be greater than. The theoretical vapor pressure. Or actual vapor pressure can be less than the theoretical vapor pressure. Those solutions wherein those solutions wherein theoretical and actual vapor pressure comes out be different. You call them as non-ideal solution. Those non-ideal solutions in which. the actual vapor pressure comes out to be greater than the theoretical vapor pressure those are something which you call as non ideal solutions showing positive deviation if actual vapor pressure is coming out to be greater than this that means your pa actual your p actual will be greater than p not a ki and your pb actual will be also greater than p not b ki b perfect right So actual vapor pressure is more. Actual vapor pressure is more. If actual vapor pressure is more, that means A B interactions, A B interactions would be less than that of A A and B B interactions. In reality, in reality, A B interactions will be less than than that of A A B B interactions. Perfect. In reality, they'll be less than expected. Right. perfect now guys what about delta h mixing positive deviation greater than 0 delta v mixing positive deviation greater than 0 right delta s mixing right delta s mixing delta s mixing is always positive delta g mixing here will be less than 0 right and one more thing do remember those solutions those non ideal solutions which show positive deviation those non ideal solutions which show positive division do remember they form minimum boiling azeotropes they form minimum boiling azeotropes okay they form minimum boiling azeotropes anything can be asked from this particular slide anything similarly if you have non ideal solution showing negative deviation that means actual vapor pressure is less than the expected is less than theoretical is less than theoretical which is possible only if pa actual would be coming out to be less than p not a ka a and pb actual is coming out to be less than p not b ka b perfect when is that possible when is this particular thing possible it is possible only p actual can be less than p actual p actual is less than less than the expected this is possible only if ab interactions are more than expected if ab interactions are more than expected right if more than expected perfect now now since we are talking about negative deviation delta h mixing is less than 0 delta v mixing is less than 0 delta s mixing 
greater than zero delta g mixing less than zero what do they form negative deviation ones they form the maximum boiling gas drop they form the maximum boiling gas drops right okay guys this is something which will be asked this is something which will be asked now one thing one thing in case of your ideal solutions p actual is this right p a is this p a p b is this in your ideal solutions in your ideal solutions if you look at the graph which we made few minutes back if we talk about the graph which we made few minutes back this particular graph this particular graph if you look carefully if you look carefully right this particular graph right now is valid for ideal solution it is valid for ideal solution now the non ideal solution showing positive deviation non ideal solution showing positive deviation non ideal solution showing positive deviation positive deviation the actual vapor pressure is more than expected the actual vapor pressure is more than expected this is the expected total vapor pressure this is the expected total vapor pressure or the actual one in case of non ideal showing positive deviation will be more so the graph will be like this right over here you can say your actual vapor pressure your actual vapor pressure of the solution is greater than this particular term or should i make it on a different curve just a second it will create a confusion just a second just a second people i'll make it on a different slide so that it won't be like you won't mix all these things up so that you won't mix all these things up uh, my board is not working properly now it has also got tired right if chi a here is 1 for example chi b here is 0 over here your chi a was 0 and chi b was 1 right this was your vapor pressure this was your mole fraction in the solution phase perfect this was your p not a right and for example this was your p not b in case of ideal situation 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 these were the graphs right this was for ideal one this was for ideal one which told you that if you remember pb is equal to p not b chi b right now now this also for ideal one but this is valid for pb now just a second pb is no this is valid for pa pa is decreasing p not b chi b and this was your one more curve which represents ps which represented ps which represented ps and ps as per this was p not a chi a plus p not b chi b so this these particular graphs were there for ideal solutions but if i talk about non ideal solutions showing positive deviation the so vapor pressures will be more than expected this is the expected vapor pressure of the solution but positive deviation ones positive deviation positive deviation the actual vapor pressure will be more than the expected so this is going to be the graph for that right perfect this graph is telling you your actual vapor pressure of the solution is greater than that of p not a chi a plus p not b chi b okay similarly this was your partial wave pressure of A, the expected one. The actual one is saying that it will be more than expected. So over here, the actual vapor pressure of B, PB actual, PB actual will be greater than P naught B chi B. And similarly, 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 over here again, it will be the same. It will be more, right? And this is telling you this graph that your actual vapor pressure of B, PB actual is more than that of P naught B chi B. So these curves are valid for those non-ideal solutions which are showing, those non-ideal solutions which are showing positive deviation. Can you let me know what about negative deviation ones? What about negative deviation ones? What about negative deviation ones? The actual vapor pressure will be less than expected. So all those graphs, for example, this is the expected one. Now for negative deviation, it will be like this. For the negative deviation, it will be like this. For the negative deviation, it will go downwards. Right? Lower than expected. I hope you can make those curves on your own. Perfect? Am I clear, people? 
Am I clear? Now, I'm moving on to something which is what you would have studied in your real class as well. What is that? That is colligative properties. Colligative properties. Guys, just like one and a half hour more, we are done. One and a half hour more, we are done. Okay? I'll be quick here. I'll be quick. Colligative properties. Well, I believe you know the definition of the colligative properties. Colligative properties are the ones which depend on the number of particles of solute. Colligative properties are the ones which are dependent on number of particles of the solute. Irrespective of the nature of solute. Colligative properties, they depend on the number of particles of solute. Right? Irrespective of the nature of solute. Irrespective of the nature of solute. Right? Thank you, thank you, Venkat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay? Now, here we have to discuss four colligative properties, basically. One is what you call as a relative lowering in vapor pressure. Second is called as, one is a relative lowering in vapor pressure. A relative lowering in vapor pressure. One is called as elevation in boiling point. Elevation in boiling point. One is called as depression in freezing point. And one is called as osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure. These are the four colligative properties which we have to discuss. Right? Relate to lowering on vapor pressure. In short, we write it as RLVP. Relate to lowering in vapor pressure. Elevation in boiling point, we represent it with delta Tb. Depression in freezing point, we represent it with delta Tf. Osmotic pressure, we represent it with pi. Now, one by one, we shall be discussing. One by one, we shall be discussing things, right? Now, first of all, let's talk about the relative to lowering in vapor pressure. Let's talk about the relative to lowering in vapor pressure. My dear students, look at this particular slide directly. Look at this particular slide directly. Understand what I'm going to say. You know, I have told you on adding non-volatile solute, on adding non-volatile solute into a volatile component, vapor pressure decreases. Vapor pressure decreases. Decrease in the vapor pressure is what you call as lowering in vapor pressure. Decrease in the vapor pressure is something which you call as lowering in vapor pressure. And this is what your lowering in vapor pressure is all about. We have discussed this. This is your lowering in vapor pressure. Now, when you divide this lowering in vapor pressure, when you divide this lowering in vapor pressure with the initial vapor pressure of the volatile component, this term now is called as a relative lowering in vapor pressure, which is a colligative property. This is something which you call as a relative lowering in vapor pressure. Now the point is, P naught A I am writing as such. What is PS? If you remember, if you remember few time, few minutes back, I told you PS is PA. PA is P naught A ka A. So this is P naught A ka A. Divided by what? Divided by P naught A. If I take P naught A as common, right? P naught A, P naught A gets cancelled out. It's 1 minus chi A. 1 minus chi A is nothing but chi B. What is chi B? Mole fraction of non-volatile solute. Number of moles of B divided by total moles. Correct? Divided by total moles. So I just got one equation. I just got one equation. And the equation is very much simple. Equation is very much simple. Let me write it over here. Equation is very much simple. It is P naught A minus P S divided by P naught A is equal to mole fraction of non-volatile solute, which is number of moles of non-volatile solute divided by total moles. Right? This particular result gives you a relative lowering in vapor pressure. And this result is valid for all the dilute as well as concentrated solutions. If I do one simple thing over here, if I do one simple thing over here, if I have got a dilute solution, if I have got a dilute solution, dilute solution means, dilute solution means number of moles of non-volatile solute is far less than that of number of moles of volatile solvent, right? For dilute solutions, this particular result gets converted in this format. It becomes NB divided by, instead of NA plus NB, I'll only write NA. This particular result is only valid for what? This particular result is only valid for dilute solutions. Do remember it. Now, my, my dear students, one more thing. In order to make your calculations easy, I'll give you one result, 
which is not the qualitative property, but still you'll remember that. And you'll use those in the questions. What is that? Have a look. If I do something like this, P naught A minus P S, if I divide with this P S, I'm not dividing with P naught A, I'm dividing with P S. This term is colligative. This is not the colligative property. It is equal to P naught A, P S is P naught A chi A, right? Divide by P S is P naught A chi A. So what I'll be doing? P naught A common, P naught A, P naught A cancel. 1 minus chi A is your chi B, chi B divided by chi A, which can be. Chi B is NB divided by NA plus NB. Chi A is NA plus NA divided by NA plus NB. NA plus NB, NA plus NB cancel. It becomes NB divided by NA. So I got one very, very, very important result, which I'll frequently use in the questions. And this particular result, I did not mention anywhere, right? Whether it's for dilute or concentrated, it is, it is valid for everyone, for everything. Right? For everything. Okay? It is valid for everything. It is valid for everything. Perfect? Am I clear? Am I clear, guys? Quick? Quickly. <clears throat> Quickly, everyone. Just these two results you have to remember. If you remember these results, you're sorted. Okay, let's see what kind of questions can be asked. Let's see what kind of questions can be asked. One very simple and basic question. Calculate the relative lowering in vapor pressure if 100 grams of non-volatile solute, 100 grams of non-volatile solute, whose molecular mass, molecular mass of the non-volatile solute is 100 grams per mole. As per the question, molecular mass is also 100. Dissolved in 432 grams of water. So mass of your volatile solvent, it is equal to 432 grams. It's equal to 432 grams. What do we have to calculate? Relative to lowering in wave pressure. Right? Relative to lowering in wave pressure. So basically we have to calculate P0A minus PS divided by P0A. Divided by P0A. And you know it is mole fraction of solute, number of moles of solute, divided by total moles present in the solution. Right? Perfect. And you can do the calculation part. <coughs> you can do the calculation part. My dear students, if you look carefully, when you see it, when you see it, when you see it, you'll get the relative lowering in vapor pressure exactly as how much? 0 0.04. Right? It is simply NB divided by NA we have used. And we have got the things done. Okay? Let me see one more good question. These are some basic, basic questions. Okay. All right. Look at this question. Look at this particular question. The vapor pressure of an aqueous solution of glucose. We have got an aqueous solution of glucose. So how you would have made that aqueous solution of glucose? First of all, you would have taken water in the container. This is the pure water. This is the pure water. Right? This is the pure water in the container. And in this container, you have you would have added non-volatile solute, your glucose. Perfect. And after the addition of non-volatile solute glucose, you would have got the solution here, which is the aqueous solution of glucose. Which is the aqueous, aqueous solution of glucose. And as per the question, the total vapor pressure of this particular solution is 750 m of Hg. 750 m of Hg. Right? What do we have to calculate? What do we have to calculate? Uh, the vapor pressure of the aqueous solution of this is this, the molality of the solution. We have to calculate molality of this particular solution. See how exactly I'm going to solve this question. As per the question, first of all, the temperature is kept as 373 Kelvin. 373 Kelvin means 100 degree. Do you know 100 degree is the boiling point of water? 100 degree is the boiling point of water. If 100 degree is the boiling point of water, add boiling point, vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. So if this water is at 100 degree, its vapor pressure would be equal to the atmospheric pressure. How much is atmospheric pressure? 760 m of Hg. So I'll say P naught A is equal to 760 m of Hg right now. This is clear? This is clear, right? 
This is clear? Because temperature is how much? Temperature is given as temperature is given as 100 degree centigrade. At 100 degree, its vapor pressure will be equal to external pressure, atmospheric pressure, which is 760. Okay. Now, what do we have to do? We have to calculate molality of the solution. We have to calculate molality of the solution. How do we do it exactly? How do you do it exactly? How do you do it exactly? How do you do it exactly? Guys, let me give you one more result here. Let me make that result so that it will be easy for you. So that it will be easy for you. If you look at this particular expression, I'll give you the direct result. If I write it like this, P0A minus PS divided by PS is equal to NB I'm writing as such. NB I'm writing as such. What is NA? Or let me write it like this. Instead of NB, I'll write mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute. Mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute. What is NA? Mass of solvent divided by molar mass of solvent. Correct? If I multiply as well as divide with 1000, will it make a difference? No, it won't make a difference. So here, can we do one thing? Can we do one thing? If you look at this particular part, if you look at this particular part, I can write it like this. P0A minus PS divided by PS is equal to, this term is what you call as molality of the solution. Mass of solute in grams multiplied with 1000, molar mass of solute, mass of solvent in grams. This is what you call as molality. So molality, multiplied by molar mass of solvent divided, divided by 1000, right? This is one more result, which is directly in terms of molality. So you do not have to think about anything else. You do not have to think about anything else. So we can use the same result in the question. Will be done, right? Will be done. Am I clear? So, I think we are done. It is, the question is solved. So, I'll be using this particular equation here. It is P0A minus PS divided by PS is equal to M multiplied by MA divided by 1000. Perfect. P0A is 760 minus 750 divided by 750 is equal to M. We have to calculate molar mass of solvent that's water 18 divided by 1000. Right? One equation, one unknown. Can't you calculate molality from here? You can do that. You can calculate molality from here. Right? I hope you can solve this sort of equation as well. Okay, look at this one. What weight of non-volatile solute? What weight of non-volatile solute urea needs to be dissolved in 100 grams of water? So basically, as per the equation, you are taking 100 grams of water. Imagine this is the container. In this container, what do we have? We have taken 100 grams of water, right? So, WA, mass of volatile liquid, that's water, that's 100 grams, right? Perfect. Let's assume its vapor pressure right now is P0A. Now, what exactly you are doing? You are adding a non-volatile solute urea over here. Non-volatile solute urea, which I'm representing with B, okay? Urea is basically NH2, COnH2. This is your non-volatile solute, perfect? Let's say I'm, I'm adding WB grams of non-volatile solute here. When I'm adding WB grams of non-volatile solute, WB stands for Vaseem, but yes, you'll be getting a solution, right? There's a solution. And my dear students, vapor pressure of this solution, how much it's going to be? What weight of non-volatile solute urea needs to be dissolved in 100 grams of water in order to decrease its vapor pressure by 20%? So vapor pressure has to decrease by 20%. It has to decrease by 20%. Right? By 20%. Initially, the vapor pressure was P0. Now, the vapor pressure will be P0A minus 20% of P0A. Right? Because we have, because upon the addition of non-volatile solute, vapor pressure decreases. And how much vapor pressure has to decrease? By 20%. So, PS will be equal to 0.8 P0. Correct? 0.8 P0. Now, guys, I think we are done. 
So I'll be using the equation P naught A minus PS divided by PS is equal to 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 NB divided by any NB divided by any now P naught A minus PS P naught A I'm writing as such minus PS is 0 0.8 P naught divided by PS is 0 0.8 P naught is equal to NB NB number of moles of volatile solute mass of solute which is which we have to calculate divided by molar mass of solute molar mass of urea is 60 grams per mole divided by divided by Na Na is moles of solvent mass of solvent divided by molar mass of solvent guys do you see one thing over here everywhere we have got P naught A P naught A P naught A cancelled so this will be 1 minus 0 0.8 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.8 1 by 4 right so 1 by 4 is equal to WB divided by 60 multiplied by 18 divided by 100. So from this particular equation, can't you calculate the mass of non-volatile solute? So first part of the equation is done. First, first part of the equation is done. Right? First part of the equation is done. Okay? Mass of non-volatile solute you calculated. Now, what do we have to calculate? Molality of the solution. Either you use the same result which I gave you or you can directly calculate molality. Mass of solute multiplied by 1000 divided by molar mass of solute multiplied by mass of solvent in grams. This term you calculated, this term you know already, right? This term molar mass of solute you know, multiplied by 1000 from here, you can calculate molality of the solution. I believe it's clear. Second one, elevation and boiling point. Elevation and boiling point. What is boiling point first of all? <clears throat> what is boiling point first of all? What is boiling point first of all? In the, in the question, I was supposed to decrease the vapor pressure by 20%. For that purpose, how much solute was to be added, right? Okay. Perfect. Now, what is boiling point? I have already told you boiling point is the temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to, equal to external pressure, which is your atmospheric pressure basically. Okay. Now, imagine. Now imagine, now imagine, this is a pure volatile liquid, for example, A, its vapor pressure, I'm representing with P naught A, right? Imagine it's equal to 100 mm of Hg, 100 mm of Hg. Imagine the external pressure is 760 mm of Hg. The external pressure is 760 mm of Hg. For example, I want to increase the vapor pressure of this liquid. I have to raise the temperature. I have to raise the temperature, vapor pressure of the liquid will increase. There will be a temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to external pressure. That temperature is what you call as boiling point. Perfect. Let's say when its vapor pressure was 100 mm at that point of time, let's say its temperature was 25 degrees centigrade. Now I started increasing the temperature. Vapor pressure started increasing, increasing. At one temperature, vapor pressure of this liquid became equal to atmospheric pressure. That temperature I'm calling as boiling point. So boiling point of this solvent. For example, it is 100 degree. So at 100 degree, let's say the vapor pressure became equal to atmospheric pressure. Perfect. Now what I'm doing, I'm adding non-volatile solute here. I'm adding non-volatile solute B here. After addition of non-volatile solute, what's going to happen? I'll be getting a solution. This is a solution here. This is a solution here. This is a solution here. Imagine this solution initially was at 25 degrees centigrade. So at 25 degrees centigrade, will the vapor pressure at 25 degrees centigrade, will the vapor pressure be 100 or less than that? It will be less than that. Imagine it's 50 because you have added a non-volatile solute. Atmospheric pressure still is 760 mOfG. Atmospheric pressure still is 760 mOfG. Now I want to boil this particular solution as well. I want to increase this temperature. When you increase this temperature, its vapor pressure will start increasing. Okay. And there will be a temperature when its vapor pressure becomes equal to external pressure, atmospheric pressure. That's what you call as boiling point. If you look carefully, here you were supposed to increase the vapor pressure from 100 to 760. So the gap was 660 mm of edge. This much amount of vapor pressure you have to increase. But here, you have to increase the vapor pressure from 50 to 760. 50 to 760. So you have to increase the vapor pressure by 710 mm of edge. So here the vapor pressure has to be increased more. Here the temperature has to be raised more. Right? Here the temperature has to be raised, raised more. So what do you think? What do you think? Is its boiling point going to be more or less? Is its boiling point going to be more or less? 
its boiling point is going to be more because here you have to increase the vapor pressure more right boiling point of the solution here i'm representing by tb solution right which will be for example more than this let's say it will be 105 degree 105 degree now you tell me one thing you tell me one thing on addition of non volatile solute what happens to vapor pressure vapor pressure decreases what happens to boiling point boiling point increases initially it was 100 now it's 105 boiling point increases this increase in the boiling point is something which you call as elevation in boiling point this increase in the boiling point is something which you call as elevation in boiling point and that elevation in boiling point is represented by that elevation in boiling point is represented by delta tb that elevation in boiling point is represented by delta tb which is basically boiling point of solution which is more minus boiling point of pure solvent which is less so it will always give you how much boiling point has elevated if you have a look on the graphical representation also have a look exactly let's say on this side i'm representing pressure on this side i'm representing temperature perfect on increasing temperature vapor pressure increases let's say this is the curve this is the curve for the solvent right for the pure solvent when you increase the temperature its vapor pressure increases okay let's say this point represents atmospheric pressure which is 1 atm which is 1 atm perfect so i'll say this is the temperature this is the temperature at which vapor pressure of the solvent became equal to atmospheric pressure this is something which i call as boiling point of what boiling point of solvent which is what i call as boiling point of solvent okay boiling point of solvent now what about solution what about the solution curve you know vapor pressure of solution will be less than vapor pressure of solution containing non volatile solute that will be less than that of solvent right so that curve will be like this downwards perfect if you extend it if you extend it if you extend it this is first of all solution containing non volatile solute can i say this is the temperature at which vapor pressure of solution is becoming equal to atmospheric pressure so this temperature i'm calling as boiling point of solution so think carefully boiling point of solvent boiling point of solution which is more boiling point of solution is more than what than the boiling point of solvent right so has the boiling point elevated yes how much is the boiling point elevated this is the elevation in boiling point delta tb this is the elevation in boiling point delta tb right now guys one result you have to remember here that's more than sufficient <clears throat> One result you have to remember here delta tb is directly proportional to molality of the solution delta tb is directly proportional to molality of the solution and this kb is what you call us this kb is what you call us kb is a constant see delta tb actually is directly proportional to molality of the solution when you remove the proportionality it becomes kb multiplied by m perfect kb is what you call as molal elevation constant molal elevation constant or you call it as you call it as the ebullioscopic constant as well. Ebullioscopic constant as well. Right? Ebullioscopic constant as well. Am I clear with this? Am I clear with this, people? Say it in the chats quickly. Okay. Perfect. And its units are Kelvin, Kg per mole. Frequently we use this. So delta Tb is Kb multiplied by M where M is the molality of the solution. Molality of the solution is mass of solute multiplied with 1000 motor mass of solute Wa. So from this particular result, you can calculate motor mass of solute. If a question is asked, you can calculate motor mass of solute. And this is the expression by means of which you can calculate Kb as well. Kb as well. It is Ma motor mass of solvent. R is the constant 8.314. Pb is the boiling point of solvent. 1000 delta H vaporization, enthalpy of vaporization, right? Enthalpy of vaporization. This is one direct result by means of which you can calculate Kb as well. I hope this is clear and let's try to solve one of the questions based on it so that it becomes properly clear, right? Find the weight of sucrose. Find the weight of sucrose that must be added to 100 grams of water. To have the boiling point of solution as 100.5 degree centigrade. So basically, as per the question, what do we have? What do we have? We have got water in the container. 
and how many grams of water do we have how many grams of water do we have 100 grams so mass of water here is 100 grams right mass of water here is 100 grams boiling point of water you know how much is that that's 100 degree centigrade 100 degree centigrade now people you have added sucrose here you have added sucrose here right let's say wb grams of sucrose you have added perfect upon the addition of sucrose what has happened you have got a solution you have got a solution and boiling point of this solution boiling point of this, this solution is equal to how much 100.5 degree centigrade perfect we have to calculate this wb so this is the case of again elevation and boiling point so i'll say delta tb is equal to ab multiplied by molality delta tb is elevation and boiling point how much boiling point is elevated this to this so 0 0.5 is equal to kb value is given 0 0.52 molality of the solution is mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 molar mass of sucrose is 342 multiplied by mass of solvent in grams which is 100 so again one equation one unknown from this particular equation you can calculate wb which is the mass of non volatile solute am i clear am i clear people perfect similarly there is depression in freezing point my dear students the way i told you on adding the non volatile solute on adding non volatile solute let me write it directly on adding non volatile solute in a volatile component in a volatile solvent first thing which i told you vapor pressure decreases boiling point increases and freezing point also decreases freezing point also decreases and that decrease in the freezing point is what you call as depression in freezing point i'm not explaining these things i'll give you the result and we'll solve the questions okay which will be asked so basically imagine that this is the container which we have okay imagine that this is the container which we have and my dear students in this container you have got a solvent volatile solvent a okay its freezing point is tf solvent now what will happen when you add a non volatile solute over here non volatile solute over here what you will be getting you will be getting a solution you will be getting a solution of a and b perfect freezing point of this particular solution will be less than that of freezing point of solvent freezing point decreases upon the addition of non volatile solute okay freezing point decreases freezing point decreases freezing point decreases freezing point decreases and that decrease in the freezing point is represented by delta tf and delta tf is nothing but higher one is solvent here so tf solvent minus tf solution minus tf solution this delta tf also is directly proportional to molality of the solution right and this delta tf if you remove the proportionality it becomes kf multiplied by molality kf multiplied by molality this kf is what you call as molal depression constant or you can call it as cryoscopic constant you can call it as cryoscopic constant okay so delta tf here will be equal to kf molality is nothing mass of non volatile solute in grams multiplied by 1000 molar mass of solute and mass of solvent in grams right from this particular result you can calculate molar mass of solute which is asked frequently molar mass of solute which will be af multiplied by wb multiplied by 1000 divided by delta tf multiplied by wa this is how you calculate molar mass of solute with the help of the colligative property depression freezing point right and this kf the units of kf if you ask me Units of Kf again are going to be Calvin kg per mole. Right? Calvin kg per mole. These are again going to be its units. These are again going to be its units. Right? Now, similarly, similarly, how do we calculate this Kf? Kf again has got one result by means of which you can calculate it. It is Ma molar mass of solvent or Tf of solvent, freezing point of solvent ka square, enthalpy of fusion, enthalpy of fusion. Right? multiplied with 1000 if all these terms are given you can calculate kf from here directly you can remember this particular result i'll solve one question let's see i'll solve one question look at this 
The question says find the freezing point. <clears throat> yes, I'll share the handwritten notes. You need not to worry, okay? I'll share the handwritten notes on my telegram. So again, I'm repeating, if you're not adding to my telegram, join that. It is t.me slash w-a-s-s-i-m-s-i-r-c-h-a-m. Okay? Find the freezing point of the solution obtained by mixing 18 grams of glucose with 90 grams of water. It is simple guys. I'll write freezing point of solvent minus freezing point of solution which is delta Tf is equal to Kf multiplied by molality mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 molar mass of solute mass of solvent in grams. Right? Solvent you are using as water. So freezing point of water you know that's 0 degree minus. Freezing point of solution we have to calculate, I believe. Yes, freezing point of solution we have to calculate. Kf value is given as 1.86. Mass of solute. Solute is your glucose. It's 18 grams you are using. Multiplied by 1000. Molar mass of solute. Molar mass of glucose is 180. Mass of solvent is 90. So one equation, one unknown. Get the freezing point of solution. Right? One equation, one unknown. Get, get the freezing point of the solution. It is a simple basic question. Well, this is one more question of the similar pattern. I believe this can be done on your own. This you can do on your own, right? Right, people? Okay. So people are saying it's minus 2.06. Okay, let me write the answer as well. You're saying it's minus 2 point. Freezing point of the solution here, when you solve it, it is minus 2.06, right? Perfect. Minus 2.06 degree centigrade. You can convert this into Kelvin as well if you want. If you want. Exactly. Board is tired. It's lagging, right? It needs rest. But the rest uh, is going to be for a very lesser time. All right. Guys, do you know what is osmotic pressure? Osmotic pressure. In the osmotic pressure, this is... This is the result which you have to remember. Pi is equal to CRT, right? Where C is the concentration of solution. Concentration of solution means molarity of the solution. And eventually, you can calculate molar mass of solute from here. Right? It is basically CRT. C is concentration, molarity. Molarity means number of moles divided by volume of solution. Right? Number of moles of solute divided by volume of solution. Number of moles of solute can be written as mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute. Correct? So I'm trying to say pi is equal to CRT, right? Osmotic pressure. Your pi is equal to C means M, MRT. So I can say your pi here is equal to molarity is number of moles of solute, right? Divided by volume of solution in liters, multiplied by R, multiplied by T. So pi will be nothing but number of moles of solute is mass of solute, divided by this is molar mass of solute. And here you have got volume of solution in liters. This is R, this is T. From this particular equation, molar mass of solute can be calculated. Right? Molar mass of solute can be calculated. I'm not going into the details of it. You know it. Right? You would have studied this in your... I mean, this, this is not something which is to be given in the detailed format. This equation, question will be asked from this particular equation as well. Only. Question will be asked from this particular equation only. Perfect. And if you want to have the look at the definition, the minimum excess pressure the minimum excess pressure that has to be given on solution side. That has to be given on higher concentrated side. So stop. So stop the moment of osmos. Stop the moment of solvent molecules. From solvent side to solution side. Right? Let me give you the quick idea of what this osmotic pressure is. My dear students, imagine this is a container and you have got a semi-permeable membrane over here. And I'm assuming this semi-permeable membrane allows the moment of only solvent molecules. It allows the moment of only what? Only solvent molecules. On this side, for example, this is solution side. Let's say I have kept a solution here. Over here, on this side, I have kept solvent. I have kept pure solvent. Or I can say this side is more concentrated size side. This, this side is less concentrated side. Right? Let's say this is the piston over here. What you'll observe, when less concentrated and more concentrated are coming in contact with the help of semi-permeable membrane. What you'll observe? You'll observe 
you will observe moment of solvent molecules from less concentrated side to more concentrated side you will observe the moment of solvent molecules through this spm from less concentrated side to more concentrated side due to which this piston will start going up this piston will start going up in order to make sure that piston does not go up do i have to apply external pressure over here you have to apply some pressure such that such that piston won't get go up such that solvent molecules will stop their movement the minimum excess pressure the minimum excess pressure which has to be given the minimum excess pressure the minimum excess pressure which has to be given on the solution side so as to stop the movement of solvent molecules from solvent side to solution side that minimum excess pressure is what you call as osmotic pressure simple that's what you call as osmotic pressure which is equal to pi crt okay pi crt tell me one more thing let's say the value of osmotic pressure is equal to 100 mm of hg here for example 100 mm of hg let's say so this much minimum excess pressure has to be applied on the solution side then only the moment of solvent molecules will stop imagine i'm applying pressure more than this i'm applying pressure more than this i'm applying imagine 150 mm of hg what will happen what will happen solvent molecules will start moving from solvent molecules will start going from solution side to solvent side right and that phenomenon is what you call as a reverse osmosis which is used in desalination of seawater which is used in desalination of water right if 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 just a second if the applied pressure is more than osmotic pressure if the applied pressure is more than of osmotic pressure solvent molecules will start moving from solution side to solvent side and that phenomenon is what you call as reverse osmosis perfect that that is something which you call as reverse osmosis okay reverse osmosis do remember its application in desalination of seawater is used okay one more thing one more thing one more thing these things i believe these three things you would have studied in your biology as well isotonic right hypotonic and hypertonic solutions what are isotonic solutions isotonic solutions are the ones if they have got same osmotic pressure if pi 1 is equal to pi 2 two solutions having same osmotic pressure right at same temperatures perfect at same temperatures they are isotonic what is high what are hyper which solution i call as the hypertonic a solution is called as sorry which solution i call as hypotonic a solution is called as hypotonic if it is osmotic pressure is lower than that of the other solution for example i have got two solutions one is having osmotic pressure pi 1 one is having osmotic pressure pi 2 let's say pi 1 is less than pi 2 solution one is having osmotic pressure less than that of second i'll say solution one is hypotonic to that of second solution one is hypotonic to that of second right hypertonic a solution is called as hypertonic if it is osmotic pressure is higher than that of solution from which it is separated by means of semi permeable membrane right perfect so here it has to be lower it, it has to be higher in this side correct people now the actual stuff actual stuff actual stuff this was something which is easy guys you know it you know it you know it and i believe you can solve this question on your own now the actual stuff that is van t hoff factor right that is something where i have seen students getting problems that is where i have seen getting students problems but before that if you look at this question calculate the osmotic pressure at 273 of a solution of urea in atm i think it's complete there should be concentration given as well it should be of a 0.1 molar solution of urea something like that this is incomplete this one is in incomplete there should be concentration given there should be concentration given so that you can calculate the osmotic pressure right because you know pi is nothing but crt c means m mrt something has to be given perfect for example i'm writing it as 0.1 mole to solution of urea then the question has to be solved like this pi is equal to 0.1 which value of r you will be using since i have to calculate in atm r value is 0.0821 atm liter per kelvin per mole and temperature here is 273 when you solve this you will get the answer in atm it's a simple question you can do this on your own right now the actual thing is 
introduction towards Van Hoff factor. That is important, guys. Okay. People are saying Van Hoff factor is simple. Okay, that's great. If you are finding it simple, I'm saying a lot of students have got doubts in Van Hoff factor. So I'm writing the heading as introduction. So what? This is the last topic. Introduction to the Van Hoff factor. introduction to the van hoff factor try to understand what this van hoff factor exactly is all about before talking about the van hoff factor let me let me know first what's the colligative property what is the colligative property colligative property is the one which depends on the number of particles of solute which depends on number of particles of solute right? how many colligative properties we have we have four colligative properties rlvp elevation and boiling point depression and freezing point osmotic pressure these are the four colligative properties which we have Correct. Right? My dear students, <clears throat> my dear students, try to understand. Try to understand. <clears throat> try to understand. For example, I'm taking two containers here. Let's say I'm taking two containers. Over here, you have got water. Over here again, you have got water. For example, in this container, I am going to drop one mole of glucose or urea. Urea can neither dissociate nor associate in water. But over here, I am going to introduce one mole of NaCl. And you know, when NaCl goes into the water, what will happen? It will break down into any positives and Cl negatives. Right? It will break down into any positives and Cl negatives. Now, let me tell you one thing. Colligative property, any colligative property, be it related to lowering, be it osmotic pressure, be it your elevation and boiling point, be it is depression, freezing point. Colligative property, we have got two ways to calculate colligative property. One is, one is with the help of formulas, which I gave you, for elevation, for depression, for this, that. That is called as calculated value of colligative property. One is, I'll take the solution, I'll do some certain experiments, and experimentally I'll calculate that colligative property, which is called as observed colligative property. So there are two ways to calculate the colligative properties. One is called as observed, right, which is calculated experimentally. Experimentally, one is calculated colligative property, which is calculated theoretically with the help of all the formulas which I gave you. Perfect, which I gave you. Now guys, there will be, there will be some solutions there will be some solution wherein colligative property observed, I mean the actual value of colligative property and calculated value of colligative property, they'll come out to be equal. They'll come out to be equal. But there will be some solutions for which actual value of colligative property and theoretical and calculated, they'll come out to be different. What is the reason for that? What is the logic for that? Try to understand. You're putting one mole of urea over here in the water. Now over here for this particular solution, let's say I'm calculating colligative property with the help of formula, right? And then, and then, first what I did, I calculated colligative property with the help of formula, any colligative property, which I call as calculated. Then I calculated the value of same colligative property experimentally, which I call as observed, which I call as observed. Perfect. And over here in this case, what I'll observe, I'll observe both the things coming out to be same. In the first case, in the first case, I realized both the things are coming out to be same. But in the second case, but in the second case, in the second case, I calculated the colligative, pro any colligative property I calculated, right, experimentally. Then I used a formula to calculate the colligative property, which I call as calculated. And in this case, I found it, it's not equal. It's not equal. Now, why is it not equal in the second case? In the first case, it was equal. In the second case, it's not equal. Colligative property is something which depends on the number of particles of solute. When urea is introduced here, right? When urea is introduced here, it does not dissociate nor associate. It neither dissociates nor, associ nor associates. It neither dissociates nor associates. Perfect. So whatever urea you have introduced, one mole. So that means in the solution, there is one mole only. There is one mole. There are one mole particles here in this in the solution there is one mole particles of solute in the solution right perfect but if you look at the second case when you put any cell here 
You introduce one mole of NaCl. What has happened in reality? I have introduced one mole of NaCl. So I was expecting, I was expecting with the help of formula, I was expecting whatever will be the colligative property value that will be due to one mole of solute. But it got dissociated. It got dissociated into two moles. Into two moles. What I was expecting as per the formulas, I was expecting the value of colligative property to be coming with respect to one mole of solute with respect to one more particles. But what happened in reality? This one mole got converted into two moles. My expectation was, I'm introducing one mole of solute. Colligative property value will come due to one mole of solute. Due to one mole of solute particles. But in reality, that one mole got converted into two moles. Right? In reality, colligative property value is coming due to two moles of particles. Correct? That is the reason. That is the reason why your experimentally actual colligative property value is coming out to be different than what you have expected as per the formula. Right? Here there is neither dissociation nor association. So experimentally if you calculate any colligative property, right, that will be same as what you would have calculated with the help of formulas. Right? But here in this particular case, here in this particular case, what did we see? What did we see my dear students? I was expecting the value of colligative property coming out I was expecting the value of colligative property coming out due to one mole of particle. But in reality, there are two moles. I was expecting the value of colligative property from the formula as per one mole of the solute particles. But in reality, it is coming out due to two moles. Perfect. So these two, will they be equal? They won't be equal. Now, these two are not equal. Which two are not equal? Actual value of, of colligative property and the one which we calculate with the help of formula. They are not coming out to be equal. So in order to make LHS and RHS equal, on this side, I'll be multiplying by a factor. I'll be multiplying by a factor. By multiplying this factor, LHS RHS becomes equal. And this factor which I'm multiplying over here, this is something which I call as Van't Hoff factor. Which I call as Van't Hoff factor. So how do I define Van't Hoff factor? Colligative property observed. Divide by the calculated value of colligative property with the help of formulas. Is this clear? Is this clear? Is this clear, guys? Do you want me to repeat? Do you want me to repeat over here something? See, in case of any seal, I have got two ways to calculate the colligative property. One with the help of formula, which is this one. One experimentally, which is actual colligative property. Over here, in this case, both are coming out to be different. Why is that? Because I expected I'm dropping one mole of particle. And I use the formula and calculated the colligative property. As per my expectation, which was I'm dropping one mole. But in reality, what happened? This one mole got converted into two moles. Experimentally, the colligative property value comes out to be due to two moles. So these two are coming out to be different. So we are not, we were not thinking about if any particle, if any solute on dissolving in a solvent, we were not thinking about its dissociation or association. We were avoiding that. We were avoiding that. Right? You're, we were avoiding that. So CP observed and CP calculated, it won't be equal in all the cases. In some cases, it will be equal, wherein solute does not dissociate or associate. But in some cases, where solute dissociates or, or associates, it will not come out to be equal. So in order to make LHS and RHS side equal, over here, I'm multiplying with one factor, which will make sure LHS and RHS comes out to be equal. So, right, that factor with which I'm multiplying over here, that's something which I call as Van't Hoff factor, which is CP observed, divided by CP calculated. So I got to know my Van't Hoff factor here is equal to CP observed divided by Colligative property calculated. Calculated value of colligative property divided by observed observed value of colligative property divided by calculated value of colligative property, right? Yes. Perfect. Now, guys, if you look at all the if you if you look at all the colligative properties, in every colligative property, be it relative lowering in wave pressure, be it elevation in boiling point, be it depression in freezing point, be it osmotic pressure, be it osmotic pressure, everywhere you would have seen colligative property, be it every anyone. It is inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. You check any of the formula, you'll find the same. Check any one of the formula. Molar mass of the solute will come in the denominator. Right? So, if colligative property is inversely proportional to molar mass of solute, can I say 
CP observed divided by CP calculated will be equal to calculated molar mass divided by observed molar mass of solute because they are inversely proportional. Perfect. This is one way of this is one more way of calculating the Van't Hoff factor. One more way of calculating the Van't Hoff factor. <coughs> One more way of calculating the Vantor factor. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? And guys, one more thing. One more thing. That salute whose calculated and observed molecular weights comes out to be different. We say that salute has got abnormal molecular weights. That salute for which M calculated will not be equal to M observed, right? We say that salute has got abnormal molecular weight. Abnormal molecular weight. Now there are few things which I need to discuss. That's it. Few things which I need to discuss. That's it. I hope you got to know what I said. Let's say you have got a salute. You have got a salute which neither dissociates nor associates. Which neither dissociates nor associates. You have got a salute which neither dissociates nor associates. What do you think for that? Can I say whatever colligative property we calculated with the help of formula? Same will be the value of colligative property when you do the experimental things. When you calculate that experimentally, it will be same. Right? So that salute which neither dissociates nor associates, what will be the I value? If these two are same, if these two are same, I value is going to be one. I value is going to be one. I value is going to be 1, right? Clear? Now tell me one more thing. If you have got any salute which dissociates, if you have got any salute which dissociates, right? Right? The observed, the actual value of colligative property, will it be less or more than uh, calculated? What do you think? Actual value of colligative property, will it be less or more than calculated? Will it be less or more than calculated? I'm asking this question to you. Will it be less or more than calculated? The actual, the observed, actual, observed, will it be less or more? It'll be more. It'll be more. Why? Why? What is the logic? What is the logic? What is the logic? Colligative property is the one which depends on number of particles of solute. More the particles of solute, more the colligative property. Right? Perfect. If we have got a solute which dissociates, this is the colligative property which we get from the formula. So, in this value, we did not consider the dissociation or association. Right? But the actual colligative property value will be more because of more particles, because of the solute which would have got dissociated. Yes, right, because of more moles, this is greater, so I, I value, will I value be less than 1 or greater than 1, if CP observed is more, if CP observed is more, if CP observed is more, then CP calculated, I value will be greater than 1, so for that particular solute which undergoes dissociation, for that, I value of factor I is greater than 1, now, Talk about that particular salute which associates, which undergoes association, which undergoes association. For example, I introduce two particles, but in reality, those two particles have become one particle. So whatever colligative property I was expecting through formula, but in reality, the value of colligative property will be different. That will be less than expected. That will be less than expected because I was expecting I have introduced two particles, but in reality, the value of colligative property came because of one particle. So I'll say in this particular case, colligative property observed, observed will be less than that of colligative property calculated. So in this particular case, I value will be less than one. I value will be less than one. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Now tell me one thing. Whatever formulas we have discussed, <clears throat> the first formula, P naught minus P S divided by P naught is equal to mole fraction of solute, right? Second was delta TB is equal to KB multiplied by M. Third was delta TF is equal to KF multiplied by M. And fourth one was pi is equal to CRT. Tell me one thing. 
whether all these formulas are giving the correct, correct results? Whether you get correct results from all these formulas? You do not get correct results from all these formulas. This is a qualitative property. Which one? Calculated one. Calculated one. Calculated one. Calculated one. Right? With the help of formula. Perfect? With the help of formula. You do not get the correct one. Because there might be some solutes. Because when you use these formulas, you do not take into consideration whether solute can dissociate or associate. Right? You neglect that. You neglect that. Perfect? So these formulas will not give you the correct value always. It will give you the correct value of colligative property only if solute neither dissociates nor associates. But if solute dissociates or associates, the actual value of colligative properties will be different. Now, I can categorically say these formulas are wrong. They are not absolutely correct. In order to make them correct, I'll have to multiply them with Van't Hoff factor. I'll have to multiply them with Van't Hoff factor. So this Van't Hoff factor will take into consideration dissociation as well as association. This Van't Hoff factor will take into consideration the dissociation part and the association part. Right? Yes? Perfect? Right, people? One more thing. One more thing. In case of dissociation, there is one result which I'm going to give you. Two results, basically. Direct results, I'm not going to derive them. Let's say I've got a solute which dissociates. Let's say I've got a solute which dissociates. Which dissociates. Right? Its I value will be greater than 1. That's something which we already know. Let's say I've got a solute like this. A2 gives 2 times A. Or in general, I'll write An gives N times A. An gives N times A. Perfect. Over here the coefficient is 1. Here is N. I'm, I'm assuming that n value is greater than 1. It can be 2, it can be 3, whatever. So one particle is giving either 2 particles, one particle giving 3 particles, one particle giving 4 particles. So this is the case of dissociation. This is the case of dissociation. Let's say its degree of dissociation is alpha. How do I calculate its Van't Hoff factor? One result you are going to remember, 1 plus n minus 1 into alpha. 1 plus n minus 1 into alpha. Do you remember this particular result directly? 1 plus n minus 1 into alpha. Right? Similarly, if you have any solute which undergoes association, which undergoes association, solute undergoing association. For example, you have got n times a, this is the solute which undergoes association. I'm assuming n value is greater than 1. So look here, n particles are giving one particle. n is greater than 1, so it can be 2. So 2 particles are giving one particle, or 3 particles giving one particle, 4 particles combining giving one particle. So this is the case of association. Degree of association here is alpha, right? How do I calculate i? i is equal to 1 plus 1 divided by n minus 1 multiplied by alpha. Perfect, right? This is how you calculate the diso uh, I mean, this Van't Hoff factors in case of dissociation and association. Okay, let's try to do a few questions. Let's try to do a few questions. Why is there only one question added? Let me find more questions. Till then, you give it a try. Let me find some questions from uh, this part. <clears throat> You, you give it a try till then. Let me find few questions. Hmm. Done? Is it done? See guys, first of all, you are taking what? You are taking K3, FEC and 6. K3 FEC and 6. First of all, you have to analyze whether this K3 FEC and 6 undergoes dissociation or not. It will dissociate for sure, right? It will dissociate into 3 times K positive plus FEC and 6 tri negative. Now, one particle is giving 3 plus 1, 4 particles. One particle is giving 4 particles. So n value is 4. This is the case of dissociation, right? You have got a millimolar solution. The molarity of the solution is 10 raised power minus 3, right? What do we have to calculate? The solute is undergoing 70% dissociation. So alpha value is 0 0.7. Alpha value is 0 0.7. Find the osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure pi will be nothing but I CRT. Matlab I MRT. Let's say we have to calculate osmotic pressure in ATM. So first thing I'll be calculating I. I in terms of dissociation is 1 plus N minus 1 multiplied by alpha. So I will be equal to 1 plus N value is 4 minus 1 multiplied by alpha value is 0 0.7. Right? So I is equal to 1 plus 2.1 2 
the value comes out to be 3.1. So this is the I value. So pi here will be equal to I is 3.1. Molarity is 10 raised per minus 3. R value I'll be using as 1 by 12 or you can say 0 0.0821, right? And temperature is given to us as 27 degrees centigrade. That means 300, 300 Kelvin. After solving this, you'll be getting the answer exactly in ATM. Perfect. So you have to introduce here the Vanto factor, guys. You have to introduce the Vanto factor here. Perfect. Let me write one more question. Uh, let's say the question is like this. Let's say the question is like this. The values of the values of observed and calculated molecular weights. The value of observed and calculated molecular weights of AgNO3 of AgNO3 are are 92.64 and 170 grams per mole respectively. Calculate the degree of dissociation of AgNO3. Can we do it? Calculate the degree of dissociation of AgNO3. Can we solve this? If you look at the question carefully, we have to calculate the degree of dissociation of AgNO3. Tell me how AgNO3 would have undergone dissociation. It would have undergone dissociation as Ag positive plus NO3 negative. I would want you guys to let me know the N value first of all. One particle is giving 1 plus 1, 2 particles. So N value is 2. N value is 2 here, right? Uh, what do we have to calculate? I have to calculate alpha, all right? You know, one factor is equal to calculate molecular weight divided by observed molecular weight. I told you already MC by M0, right? What is MC? Calculated one. Calculated one. That's 170 divided by 92.64. What is the value which you'll be getting after solving? I believe it will be around 1.8. Around 1.8. If I is equal to 1.8, in case of dissociation, what is I? I is nothing but 1 plus N minus 1 into alpha. That's equal to 1.8, right? So N minus 1. N is your 2, so 2 minus 1 is 1, right? Alpha comes out to be 0 0.8. Degree of dissociation came out to be 0 0.8. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Should I give you one homework or not? By the way, tomorrow's session, everyone has to join, guys, okay? 10 a.m. tomorrow, we are going to do some extra 500 questions of physical chemistry, which we did today. So I'll be expecting every one of you in the tomorrow session as well. And with this, with this, with this, uh, what Henry's law, Henry's law, do that on your own now. I'm gone, I'm done. Henry's law, partial Partial pressure of the gas over the liquid is directly proportional to mole fraction of gas in the liquid. So day one is successful. What do you have to write in the comments afterwards? Day one successful. Waiting for day two to be killed. Right? Day one successful. Waiting for day two to be killed. That's something which I want in the comment section, not here in the chats, in the comment section. Day one successful, day two, going to be killed, right? Should I be taking a leave with this? No need to do your NCRT intakes or exercise questions now. See, join the tomorrow session, that is more than sufficient. I've introduced every single type of question in the tomorrow session. You don't worry about it. Okay. Right. And right after this session, do smash the like on the tomorrow session as well. Okay. Uh, notes I'll send on my telegram, right? I have told you already my telegram. Perfect, people. Hello, I'll take a leave with this then. I'll see you in the tomorrow session. See you in the tomorrow. Take care. Okay. Let me know in the comments how exactly you
Go figure. God bless you.